Hmm, a six hour compilation of demonic stories. That can't be a coincidence. Welcome back to Unexplained Encounters. I'm your host, Darkness Prevails, here to share allegedly true stories of the unexplained with you. Today, I've got a hauntingly long compilation of stories about demons and other evil spirits that want nothing more than to see you either slightly annoyed or dead, maybe sometimes somewhere in between. Enjoy, and don't forget to send me your encounters with the unexplained at darkstories.org so I can narrate them on this show. By the way, did you know you can support what I do here, get 20% discounts on my merch store, listen to all my podcasts without ads, and unlock access to a 9.5 hour horror fantasy audiobook called Drakenblood, narrated by Nature's Temper, simply by signing up for EerieCast Plus. That's a whole heap of goodies, and it's less than three bucks a month. Just go to EerieCast.com slash plus. Thank you. Now, let's begin. Unexplained Creatures in the Middle East from Anonymous. Mar does ma. It's a monster that feeds on one thing. Fear. I'm very happy to say that I personally have had no encounters with it, but the stories that you might hear about it are usually told by people who are not liars. Allow me to explain what it is, first with some history. I live in Iran, specifically the province of eastern Azerbaijan. If you look up what is called the Iranian Plateau, or the Iranian Cultural Continent, or Greater Iran, you'll find Iran and a bunch of her neighboring countries. In this area, different branches of Iranian languages are spoken, and with similar cultures comes similar mythology, and with that comes shared monsters. Originally, we believed in monsters called Deves. They are creations of Ahriman, the devil. Deves are a mortal enemy to the human race, like demons in Western culture. Imagine ghouls with the strength to lift a mountain, with claws and teeth like daggers, and impenetrable skin. If that's not overpowered enough, they're also said to be very smart, capable of using black magic to do things like taking different forms. There are famous Deves, such as Cheshmuk, who is responsible for earthquakes and hurricanes. Some appear in Shah Nameh, the Book of Ancient Iranian Legends, such as the White Deev, who imprisoned the Shah of Iran and was defeated by a warrior from Sistan. After the Muslim conquest and conversion to Islam, people kept their culture, but the Deves were now called by an Islamic name, Jinn. Mar Desma is a Deev. Of course, that means some might call it Jinn. The word Mar Dasma in Persian and other Iranian languages means man-tester or man-challenger. It may be pronounced a bit differently in various parts. Mar Desma, Mart Asma, some might call it Javan Asma, meaning young tester or even jinn, but they all refer to the same thing, a div which can take different forms, even the forms of your loved ones. It can mimic the sounds of your loved ones and do anything it can to draw you into graveyards or forests or dark alleys and dark corners at night. When it takes the form of an animal or human, it looks completely natural. It feeds on fear and, oddly enough, never attacks timid people. It likes to scare brave souls. That's why it is called Challenger. Mar does Ma uses various ways and tactics. Sometimes it takes the forms of innocent-looking farm animals, such as sheep, goats, or dogs, and approaches lone people in the dark. Then it suddenly speaks or changes forms. Sometimes it might approach a lonely traveler or stranger. Sometimes you hear someone that you know calling you, trying to draw you into the woods or dark caves or something of the sort. If you go in, though, it will scare you to death. You might have a heart attack, so yeah, it can kill people. There are times it might appear as a thin and skinny looking creature, but as you want to investigate what it is exactly, it will start to rapidly grow taller and taller into a gigantic monster right from your nightmares. 
Maybe one night you're getting home late. A head comes out of a dark corner. Maybe the face looks like your neighbor. But as you want to say hello, the face begins to change. The more you look, the uglier and scarier it becomes, until either you look away and run or continue watching the show and die of sheer terror. The Challenger always invents new ways to scare people, and usually it doesn't want to kill you, it just wants you to be scared. But there is one thing that will make it angry, so angry, in fact, that it will not hesitate to tear you apart. Never tell Mar does Ma that you are not scared of it. Never challenge the Challenger. Some believe that if you become friends with a Mar does Ma, it can tell you the places of lost objects, or give you life advice or tell you something from the future. But I wouldn't risk it. My apologies for the long introduction. Just keep in mind that Mar does Ma only challenges the brave. So if you're a scaredy cat like me, there is no need to worry. Here are the stories. The first two I heard from people that I trust, and the last one is a famous story told around here, so take it with a grain of salt. Number one, the floating man. This story is from an old man in my village in Eastern Azerbaijan, Iran. Our main product is apples. It happened in a trail around our village. During the day, it's gorgeous, but at night, it can be a very scary place. I will share the story from his point of view. I was younger, you see. Our watering schedule at the apple farm was set up so that each garden would have a few hours of water. My shift at the gardens began in the middle of the night, so I would have to wake up, pick up my shovel, then go to the gardens to water the apple trees. It was an hour-long walk, and it went right through the graveyard, then along through other people's gardens. I know what you're thinking, but no, it didn't happen in the graveyard. The night in question, I was able to pass through the graveyard without any trouble. I then entered the part of the path that was surrounded by trees. These trees formed a thick wall along the shoulders of the road. Here, all you can see are the stars above and the road lit by the moonlight below you. I soon arrived at the spot where there are some big rocks on the ground. I was looking down to watch my steps so that I didn't trip over one. It was then that I felt a presence above me. It was like I felt a shadow of fear lay over me. Hesitantly, I looked up. Between two of the trees, I saw this tall man floating above me. He had his hands completely open. Imagine someone floating in a pool with their front side and face in the water. And imagine you're under the water below them, sitting at the bottom, and they're staring right at you. That's what it was like. I was terrified when I saw his face. His eyes were big and wide open, almost popping out of their sockets. And his teeth. I wasn't sure if he was smiling or baring his teeth at me, or if he just didn't have lips at all. But I knew those teeth did not look natural for a human. I whimpered, What are you? And it spoke to me. I am. But I didn't really want to stay there and hear what else it had to say. I quickly dropped my shovel and began to run with all the power I could summon in my legs. I'm not sure if it followed me or not, because I never did look back. I stopped only when I was back in the village on my doorstep. Even in the morning, I didn't dare go retrieve my shovel. I'm not sure what it was, and I was not going to stay there to hear the answer to my question. Number 2. The Sheep This story was told to me by a friend of mine. It happened to his great uncle in their village in Luristan. This story will be told from his point of view. I was in my twenties. One late, dark evening, I was on my way home, casually passing through the empty alleys when I saw this sheep at a small dead end. 
It was too late for sheep to be outside, unaccompanied and awake, so I thought it was a runaway. As I was watching it, I got a clearer look at it. It was a beautiful and healthy sheep. It looked to be a good breed, and I was very tempted to take it home myself. I was young and strong, so I just lifted it up and put it on my shoulders, and I kept walking. After a couple of steps, I remembered to check if it was a male or female, so I felt over between its legs. Now, as I'm just about to find out, the sheep brings its mouth closer to my left ear, and I hear it speak to me. You know, I'm way older than your grandfather. Freaking out, I dropped the sheep, but when I looked back, it disappeared. It had just vanished like it was never there. When I arrived home, I told the story to my family, who said it was probably a djinn. Number 3. The Story of Palavan Abbas Palavan Abbas was a man in a small village named Tarmistan in Zagros Mountains. Palavan means champion, because he was a wrestler, and Abbas was his name. Aside from wrestling, his main occupation was pottery. He had a student named Kasim, who was going to learn his art. Kasim's father had passed away and he lived with his old mother. So Palavan Abbas had told Kasim that if there was any problem, he could ask him for help. One night, there was a knocking at Palavan's door. It was Kasim saying, Please hurry, Palavan. My mother is sick and I need your help to get her to a doctor. Now, Kasim seemed to be speaking with a different tone and accent than usual. But Palavan immediately got dressed and told Kasim to lead the way. After a while, it became clear that they were not on the right path to Kasim's house. Kasim was leading him outside of town. Kasim, where are we going? asked Palavan. Kasim just turned and smiled at him with yellow teeth. Weird, he thought. They climbed a hill and Kasim said, We're here. So where's your mom, Kasim? As Kasim turned, Palavan saw that it wasn't Kasim at all. What he was now looking at was a hideous, three meter high creature with a humanoid body and the face of a dog. What are you? said Palavan. The creature replied, I am Mardasma. Are you scared? No, a champion fears nothing, replied Palavan. Well, then you must wrestle with me. If you lose, I will take your life, said the creature. And so they wrestled, fighting for hours. And near the morning, Palavan managed to win. As the monster's back touched the ground, it turned into dust and smoke. With many bruises and a lot of pain, Palavan went back to the village, to the real Kasim, where he told the others what had happened to him before dying from exhaustion. This is an update to the original set of stories about Mar Dasma. Since writing that previous post, I spoke to a distant cousin of mine who recalled an adventure we had as kids, something I had forgotten about. Although this is technically one story, I think it would be best to break it into two. Number four, Behind the Window. I was staying at my parents' house. They told me I could sleep in the room upstairs. That room was pretty big, it had a lot of stuff and junk in it, kind of like the old attics in movies. There was a window in there, maybe about two meters by two meters, with thick curtains, and right under it was my bed. From the very start, I got a bad feeling about that window, but I just shrugged it off. At about 9 p.m., it started. Bang! It was like a muscular man had punched the glass as hard as he could. It was even more terrifying because I couldn't see outside. The curtains were too thick. Quickly, I ran downstairs in a panic 
telling my grandmother, Oh, don't worry. We didn't hear anything. It probably was just some bird or bat attracted to the light of your room. Just turn the light off and go to bed, honey. So I did. Around midnight, though, I was awakened by, you guessed it, another bang. This time I was in the bed, so it was only inches from my face. I tried to calm myself down, to go back to sleep, but around 3 a.m. it came again, this time much harder. It felt as if something was hiding on the other side of that window, just about to break through and take me away. I couldn't see anything, and I was way too scared to open the curtain and peek outside. The pure silence was killing me now, not a single cricket or dog barking. Slowly, I crawled out of bed, quietly making my way downstairs to my grandparents. All the while, I felt hunted by something. Once I got down there, I just slept on a blanket on the floor. It wasn't comfy at all, but at least it felt safe. The following night, I tried once again to sleep in that very same room in the very same bed. But the large window with the thick curtains never did have that haunting feeling again. I would even go on to sleep there many times throughout the years, and I never had any more supposed bats or birds banging on the window. Nowadays, I think it may have been Mar Desma trying to scare me. I don't think bats would all of a sudden feel like going kamikaze on me like that. Number 5. The Brog This always gave me the goosebumps. Back when we were kids, Kay, my cousin, and I would play together, going on adventures, discovering things, and so on. One summer, we were entrusted with the responsibility to herd a dozen cattle. We would gather them in the morning, take them out into the fields, start a fire, and cook lunch as they ate. We would take them then to a river or somewhere with water to drink. Then we would take them back to the village in the evening. Now keep in mind, this happened in the exact same trail as the story, The Floating Man, that I told before. The night before, we had read a made-up story, a creepypasta, if you will, about a monster called Brog, who haunted a road in another country. I've forgotten which country that was. Now, we knew it wasn't real, and even if it was, it was in some other part of the world and could never get us. In this story, the Brog kind of looked like a werewolf. It was said that he would first feel hunted or stalked, then suddenly all the birds in the area would flee away. You would then begin to hear footsteps behind you, and they would get closer as if they are walking inches behind you. Then you would hear the breathing. Not long after that, you would hear a massive, terrifying roar. By the time you turned around to see your stalker, you would see nothing more than a pair of red eyes, and the following morning, they would find your cold, dead body. Your skin turned black as coal, and that was when we got too spooked to read the rest. The next morning, we decided to make our way through, you guessed it, the trail. In the morning, it was truly beautiful. As the evening approached, it took a bit longer than we liked to gather our things and the cows. In the dark, we were walking along the trail with the cows in front of us. Now, at the time, we had not heard the story of the floating man, so we weren't scared at all of the trail ahead. But that was about to change. One by one, the signs of Brog started to come to life for us. First, that sudden and ominous feeling of being stalked. Second, the birds all around the valley suddenly getting spooked all at once and flying away. Third, the footsteps getting closer and closer to us. We tried to walk, not run, faster and faster. Suddenly, the bushes behind us began to make noises, as if something was running through them and shaking them. I said to my cousin, Hey, why don't you take a look to see what's behind us? Dude, I I'm as scared as you are. 
I'm not looking back, he said. We were sure that this was it, that we wouldn't see the light of tomorrow. But as we made it to the graveyard, suddenly things changed as if something heavy was lifted from our hearts. We found the courage to look back. What was following us was just a dog, and it just turned back and ran into the wilderness. Later that night, we decided to read the rest of the Brog story. A certain part made our hearts churn in our chest. Brog can show itself as a dog. All these years later, I would shrug off the Brog adventure as us being kids, but now I think that something knew exactly and specifically what we were scared of, then presented itself in that way. There are other stories about that trail. I once heard someone say they saw something that would be best described as a mix between Yoda from Star Wars and a monkey along that same trail at night. I found a big similarity in all of them. The graveyard is safe, and the Mar Dosma will not follow you there. My cousin believes that may be because there are good people buried there. Demonic Creature Encounter from Schaefer 9RX This did not happen to me. It happened to my younger brother a few years ago in 2020. To begin, I come from a very large family. My mother and a couple of my siblings have had very strange encounters with the paranormal, specifically a demonic presence. Personally, I have never had anything crazy happen to me. The odd things that have happened to me I can easily rationalize. It's important to note that my family and I are Christian. We believe the spiritual realm is real, and it sometimes allows itself to be seen by people at certain times. You may find this interesting, but I believe there is a difference between fallen angels and demons. Genesis 6 and the Book of Enoch give detailed and interesting depictions and origin stories beginning with when Satan fell from heaven and took a third of the angels with him, going on to create Nephilim through mankind. I believe demons are the spirits of the Nephilim because their souls are half angelic beings and half man. They must roam the earth until their appointed judgment from God. At times, demons can manifest themselves in many different ways, often for the purpose of influence. However, that is a whole other conversation and story of its own. Here is my brother's experience. This encounter took place across the street from where we live. My family and I live in the woods, way out in the country on the far outskirts of a small town in rural southwest Michigan. My brother used to do yard work and odd jobs for our neighbors across the street. One day in the late afternoon, my brother was doing some cleaning on our neighbor's pool. Our neighbor's pool is directly behind their house and it's surrounded by forest. Encompassing the pool except where it connects to the house is about a four to five foot embankment. My brother was diligently working when he noticed something very strange. It was the middle of the summer. The sun was setting and the forest was alive with birds, insects, and spring peepers, creating that beautiful summer melody. All of a sudden, everything abruptly went silent, like someone turned off a switch, shutting off all the noise. My brother said it fell so quiet that his ears began to ring. Being frightened by this sudden change in the atmosphere, he stopped working and began to look around, trying to make sense of it all. That's when he saw it. My brother turned and looked towards the far end of the pool, and standing on the other side of the embankment was this creature staring at him. My brother said it was not much more than 20 feet from him. Upon seeing this creature, my brother panicked so hard he fell backward to the ground. He began to crawl for cover. He then picked himself up and ran home as fast as he could and hid in his room. I recall arriving home shortly after the encounter. My mother told me, you need to check on your brother. He doesn't seem to be doing too well. I did as she said. I found my brother in his bed and I asked if he was okay. That's when he told me this story. He then described the creature he saw. He said the creature was dark gray in color 
and the most memorable attribute was its large, piercing yellow eyes. My brother didn't get every detail of the creature because he didn't waste any time hightailing it out of there. He said the thing must have stood eight or nine feet tall because it was almost eye level with him despite it standing on the other side of the four-foot embankment. My brother went on, saying the facial features of it were animalistic, but also somehow resembled a man. The countenance of the thing can best be described as demonic. I believe my brother's encounter to be very real. His actions speak far louder than his words. When he told me this story, I could tell that his heart began to race, and he became visibly afraid. My brother is a very straightforward, no bullcrap kind of guy. He's also generally very skeptical, especially when it comes to the paranormal and when hearing about my mother and other siblings' experiences. For him to just tell a story like this, it goes way against his nature and character. My brother struggled to sleep after this encounter and suffered from severe nightmares, which would continue on for a few weeks. One night, my brother woke up out of a dead sleep in a panic. He had heard deep growling coming from his closet. I checked the closet for him, and of course there was nothing there. But I prayed over him, and I tried to comfort him as best I could. The day after the encounter, my brother acted very paranoid. He went back to the neighbor's house with a rifle, grabbed his tools, and never worked over there again. I don't know why my brother encountered this being, but after his experience, we had some horrible family tragedies take place. My brother told me his beliefs and perception of reality have forever been changed due to this experience. Watchers in the Park from Up North Goon. This happened about 10 years ago in my hometown in Northern Michigan. It stands as one of my few unexplainable encounters in life. I grew up in a small town, spent time in the Upper Peninsula my whole childhood, and I'm very familiar with many of the ghost stories in Michigan. But it never occurred to me that I would ever experience anything significant in my life. You see, I didn't really believe in ghosts, but I did enjoy the stories. I had few friends as I was a weird kid, so the few I had were very special to me. My childhood best friend, Jay, moved to my town in first grade, and we quickly made off as good friends. We played on the playground together, messed around in class to annoy the teacher together. We were basically inseparable. Fast forward to the end of fourth grade, Jay's family moved to Kansas, which naturally upset me. But he would come to visit his grandparents who lived in town every summer after that. The summer of my seventh grade year, he would continue to come visit his grandparents. He did the very same that summer. So, come June, I went to visit for the first week of my summer vacation. His grandparents lived on the south end of town, a block behind the only other traffic light we had. Just across the road from them was the town park, and next to that, of course, was the cemetery. The park was decent-sized with a long driveway and decent-sized dirt parking lot. At the back edge of the lot, there's a hill that leads down to the two baseball diamonds, and to the right of the lot was the play area and public bathrooms. A chain-link fence separated the park from the cemetery. There were only two lights on at the park at night, one at the bathrooms and one in the parking lot. On the first night staying at Jay's grandparents, it was like any other summer. We were very excited to see each other. Dinner was on the stove, dessert in the oven. We were just enjoying our evening. Usually, we liked to play in the park, set up baseball games, mess around in the woods directly behind the fields. At night, we would go over to the playground side and tell ghost stories, since after the air cooled down at night, a thick fog would roll off the cemetery and make things creepy. It really set the stage for these stories. That night would be no different. Around 1 a.m., we set out for the park. 
As usual, the fog started rolling over the playground, and it was rather quiet, and it was a bit chilly heading into the park. Me, Jay, and his older brother E got halfway down the driveway when E noticed his older sisters on the back end of the baseball fields. He said, hey, let's go scare the girls. He started to walk over that way, but then we saw him stop dead in his tracks. He glanced over into the tall grass field next to the driveway. I stopped too, watching E. His face went pale, as if he had just seen a ghost. That worried me. E did not scare easily. When I followed his gaze, I saw what he was looking at, and apparently so did Jay. By then, all of us had frozen in fear. In the middle of the field, standing about seven feet tall, were these three shadowy figures. Looking closer at them, I noticed they weren't simply shadowy. They were just big shadows. They stood in the field, looking at Jay and Dee's sisters and their friends. They appeared to be wearing long trench coats with brimmed hats, but they were darker than the night itself. E snapped out of the daze and shakily said, Hey, what are you doing here? They didn't answer, of course, so he spoke louder. Hey, what are you doing? At this point, I was terrified, and after E had yelled that last time, those three figures turned their attention to us. Whatever in the world they were, they definitely weren't human, and they did not look nice either. When they turned, it was the most unnatural looking thing I'd ever seen, and their eyes looked straight through our souls. Beady small yellow dots on an otherwise blank face. E screamed as loud as he could at his sisters to run, then turned, grabbing me and Jay. Together, we sprinted back to the house, hiding in the living room the rest of the night, not sleeping at all. Once the sun came up, we decided we'd go over to the park and check the field for footprints or any clues as to what we saw the night before. Once we were over there, we found large, flattened spots in the grass, but no tracks leading out to it. The spot was just big enough to hold those three figures. To this day, I have no good explanation for it all. That park isn't even known to be haunted. But I've never been back there at night ever since. Warning. The following story contains violence against pets. Something killed my dogs. From Gray. I share these stories as I've gotten over the terror they've given me. I'm sure they can give you a nice scare. My first story starts with a warning. Please be careful who your family dates. My older brother used to date a woman who had warned that her family was cursed. I didn't really care what she said, but strange things began to happen when she moved in with us. My cousin and I used to play outside after dark with my little brothers, playing hide and seek. I would soon start getting these creepy feelings, like I was being watched and judged. I listened to my gut feelings, and I began to watch my little brothers and cousins more closely. On one occasion, I noticed a strange dog was watching them as they played. Now, my family has quite a few dogs, five at the time. Two pit bull hybrids, one albino, the other brown, a German shepherd, a mixed sheepdog, and finally a dog I didn't know the breed of, but it looked like the other two pit hybrids we had. It was colored a mix of brown and black. However, the dog I saw watching us was a mess of fur and colored a dark brownish color. Its jaw had this overbite. I could see ribs on it, and its back legs looked wrong, like they mismatched. I should mention here that I am Native American. My tribe says if a skinwalker shapeshifts into something, sometimes a part of it comes out wrong. After seeing this dog, I got everyone to go back inside. We would not be playing after dark for as long as I had that feeling. 
If the feeling went away by the next day, I was going to let my little brothers and cousins play. That night, our dogs got into a fight with something. I listened to them fight it all night. The dogs were vicious. After the fight, I waited until the sun was up. I went right out to investigate. The whole yard was a mess. I could see where the fight started and where it went. The sand and bushes where the fight started looked like a dog fight. But as I followed where it progressed, I started to see whatever my dogs were fighting getting bigger and bigger. The aftermath of where the fight ended, it looked like a horse and another horse had fought. The bushes were uprooted and there was a hole about five inches deep and seven feet wide. I got pale, and I ran to check on my dogs. My dogs only had some scratches and bruises. This is where it gets creepy. Three to four months after this, the two pets died from fighting some cougar, a cougar that decided to come up to our house. The dog that looked like a pit had to be put down, too. It had gotten attacked by a porcupine, and the quills went too deep into the dog's face. The German Shepherd got hit by a car and broke both back legs. My family and I tried to nurse it back to health. We even made some splits and wrapped both legs. Sadly, its legs still got infected, and she passed away. Our sheepdog disappeared, and we later found it dead. It had choked on something it was eating a good 130 yards away from my house. They all fought that skinwalker and later died in odd ways. My older brother and I buried the dogs where we bury our pets. We placed stones on them to prevent scavengers from digging them up. As we were walking back from burying the last dog, something weird happened to me. I got really tired all of a sudden and my vision began to go black. I let my brother know what was going on, and he made me sit down in the direction of the dog's graveyard. My vision went black like I was blind, and I couldn't see at all. My other senses were fine, but my vision was affected. As I waited with my brother, I swear I could hear the dogs we buried barking loudly. As I listened to the dogs, my vision returned to me. We then walked back to the house together. As time passed, my vision deteriorated. I now wear glasses, but I'm glad everything's all over. That thing, whatever it was, I believe it took part of my vision and it took our dogs, but it did not take my family. I would do anything to protect my family. A warning to you all, keep good and strong dogs if you live near skinwalkers and know a good medicine man if you can. Bad Ouija Board Experience From Jack When I was around 10 or 11 years old, I was in primary 7 in school, it was a tradition that all the pupils go to Edinburgh for an end-of-year trip. I had only joined the school about a year prior and I found it hard to make friends as everyone else had already been friends for years. So I would spend my break time and lunch time on my own. The teachers who were organizing the trip noticed this. They decided to put me into a room with six other boys, probably hoping that I would bond with them. One of the days we were there, we went to a place called the Edinburgh Dungeons. It was basically like a ghost train, but without the train. It was pretty cool. At the end of it, there was a gift shop, and they had this basket of wrapped up items behind the counter that were only one pound. We didn't know what was inside it, but everyone was lining up to get a gift since one pound was such a deal. On the way back to where we were staying, everyone was opening them up, and we all soon realized what we had purchased. A do-it-yourself Ouija board kit. It had candles, essential oils, a spell to summon spirits, and directions on how to use everything. On the last night, I had the idea to make the Ouija board. Only two of the boys were up for it, though. The rest were too scared and superstitious, despite acting like they were brave. 
We went and got what we needed to make our Ouija board, and we began to play. We moved the glass a few times, pretending we didn't do it, but after about 15 minutes, we were almost ready to call it a night, when the glass moved again. This time, we all swore that we hadn't done it. Being young and stupid, we didn't believe each other, as we accused one another of moving the glass. I said we should try it each on our own, just to prove it. I was the second person to have only my fingers on the glass. I felt it move on its own, I swear I did. Some other force was moving it. It felt very strange. After we all confirmed that it was none of us pushing the glass, we all put our fingers back on together. One of my friends began to ask questions, such as, Who are you? And how did you die? The spirit told us that he and many other spirits heard us calling out to them. At this point, we were all getting very freaked out, so we decided to stop playing. Around an hour had gone by since we stopped playing with the Ouija board. Everyone in the room had gone to sleep, except for me. I began to hear strange noises around the room, and I thought I kept seeing strange shadowy figures in the corner of the room. I didn't want to stay there, so I went next door into the girls' room, as they were all still awake, and I sat with them. I still don't believe it. From Anonymous. I was maybe 12 years old when I saw it. We had just moved to a new town. I was happy, being able to make new friends and all. I remember sitting at the park, only half a block from my home. It was a bright day, not a cloud in the sky. I was shocked when a kid came up to me. I'd only lived here a few days at that point. The kid's name was Joe. Joe was tall, maybe the age of 16. I asked him what was up, but he just smiled at me. I thought that was weird until he finally spoke. Do you know what happened in your house? I felt uncomfortable then, but I shook my head to answer. He smiled again. Just don't try to be brave. He left after that. I asked around at school about him and the house I was at. Turns out there is a legend, so to speak, that the house I live in was used by a man who summoned a supposed monster. I told my parents, but they laughed and said I was just being silly. I made up my mind that day. I wish I hadn't. That night I decided to climb into the attic. The attic was dark and smelled of death and dust filled my nose. I turned on the flashlight that I'd brought with me. I scanned the room, but I didn't find anything out of the ordinary. I'd been looking for signs of this man who summoned a monster. I felt rather relieved having not found anything. I was thinking all of this was just silly. Still, I wanted to know what else was up here. I began to move things around, pushing items aside. I wish I'd just left. A soft hissing sound came from behind me. I thought that one of our cats, which we had two of, had climbed up after me. Still, I felt uneasy. I sighed and told the cat to go back downstairs. In return, I heard a deep laugh, unlike anything that might come from a human. I felt my heart sink for a few moments. I was shaking, too scared then to move, to make a sound. I got the feeling that something wanted me out of there. My breath caught in my throat. A hard, cold hand grabbed onto my shoulder. I wanted to scream, but no sound would leave my lips. A voice, something that sounded more akin to a vampire than a person, spoke in my ear. You don't belong here. I somehow managed to speak but all I could whimper was, I'm sorry, I didn't know. Leave now. Whatever it was threw me down from the attic. I missed the stand I'd used to climb up, 
landing instead on the floor. Thankfully, it wasn't that much of a fall. I looked up and I saw something looking down at me, something with a head that had a sickly gray color to it, eyes cold and full of hate, teeth a sickening yellow, all of this just peeking out from the lip of the attic entrance. In some places, there was no skin, just bone. Thin black hair hung from the top of its head. I shook uncontrollably looking at it. This thing looked like it was right out of a horror show. I ran to my room, and I didn't sleep a wink that night. I sat up in my bed all night, rocking back and forth, sitting close to my nightlight. I was too scared to move much more than that. After morning came, I busied myself downstairs, not wanting to be on the second floor, not wanting to be near the attic. I told my parents, but they got mad at me that I went up there alone, not believing my story at all. For the next two days, I barely slept at all. Finally, when I did fall asleep, I was awakened by that voice. I told you you don't belong. I froze, slowly opening my eyes. Eventually, I got out of bed to peer out of my room. I could see the attic door open. Something was hanging out of it, a claw-like hand holding a bloody, dripping bird. I don't recall much after that. I must have screamed or fainted. When I woke up, I was on the couch downstairs. We ended up moving my room downstairs too. And I never told anyone else about this beyond my parents. Until now. My Experience Owning a Demonic Doll From Anonymous Over the summer, I came into contact with a very nice lady online named Mary. Mary had a very interesting item up for sale. A doll. A doll that was supposedly very haunted. I asked about it, and she gave me all the details on it. I was very curious about it still, and also very skeptical. I asked if she knew the original owner. She did, and the original owner's name was apparently Michael. Through her, I was able to contact Michael and have a conversation on Charlie. I'd like to share the doll's story and my own personal experiences with owning a demonic doll. When the original owner, Michael, was three, his parents began to foster children, and usually they'd keep them for six months until they found them a good home. But on Michael's ninth birthday, his parents decided to foster Charlie. This was Michael's ninth birthday present. Charlie had AML, which stands for acute myeloid leukemia. Because of this, he was very sick. Michael hated Charlie. He saw Charlie as the reason he didn't get anything else for his birthday. With Charlie having AML, he was not cheap to take care of, and a lot of money had to come out of Michael's parents' pockets in order to keep Charlie healthy. AML affects the bone marrow and white blood cells. It's a form of cancer and affects about 200,000 people every year. The life expectancy of someone with AML is two to five years, sometimes longer with treatment. It can be quite painful causing pain in the bones and extreme back and leg pain. Again, Michael didn't dislike Charlie. He hated him. Michael always said there was something wrong with Charlie. Charlie loved attention. He loved seeing Michael get teed off. Seeing Michael get ignored by his family made Charlie happy. Michael said he always thought Charlie was evil, but no one saw through his charade. They simply thought of him as a poor, sick boy. Weirdly enough, whenever Michael came down with an illness, Charlie seemed to be more energetic and feeling better. And as Charlie stayed with them, Michael seemed to get more and more sick more frequently. When Michael was feeling good and getting attention from his parents, suddenly Charlie would have a flare-up and need attention all day. Other strange things would happen as well. During the time Charlie was with them, they tried buying pets for him. 
but all of his pets would soon mysteriously die. Charlie never seemed to care about his pets dying. He also didn't care about his AML. According to Michael, Charlie behaved as if his disease was more of a nuisance. Well, something strange did happen. Michael woke up one morning, feeling a dark energy. He asked Charlie if he could feel it too, but Charlie said no. It was around then that Michael said that he knew when Charlie was going to die. During Charlie's final months, Charlie began to act happier. During his flare-ups, he would get excited and have energy that he shouldn't have. Everyone put it off as a delusion from his weakened blood flow. The day Charlie died, he and Michael had a talk. He referred to it as the talk because it was the last private conversation he and Charlie had. The day he died, he said everything felt off before it happened. Michael knew it was going to happen and so did Charlie. They discussed if he was scared of dying. They discussed their beliefs about the afterlife and about what Charlie was going to do when he was on the other side. As the conversation came to a close, he told Michael not to worry, stating that he would be back in a few days. Michael was very confused. Later that night, Charlie became very ill. There were doctors rushing in and out with medical equipment. They decided he should pass in his home peacefully. A few hours later, Charlie was gone. After Charlie's passing, Michael said it was like a cloud had cleared and the sun had finally risen. The dark energy that surrounded the house was gone. One night, Michael felt that dark energy again. He followed the sensation to Charlie's room. This had become a sort of storage area now. He said he could feel evil coming from the room. He opened the door and walked in. He went to the shelf of porcelain dolls his mom had collected. He picked up a doll and swears he heard something. Told you I'd be back. It was Charlie's voice. Michael was shocked, throwing the doll across the room. He blacked out then, having terrible dreams until he woke up. After that, he asked if he could go stay with his aunt and uncle for the rest of the summer. He believes that Charlie chose this doll as a vessel because it always creeped Michael out. He'd always been scared of the doll and Charlie knew it. In fact, Charlie would always sneak it into his room at night or he would tell Michael all about the doll and how it talked to him and moved around the room on its own. This is what led him to believe this is why Charlie would choose the doll. Years later, Michael's mother passed away, leaving him in possession of three of her dolls. All the foster kids received three porcelain dolls. It just so happened Michael received Charlie as one of the dolls. Nothing happened until a week later. Michael began to have the terrible dreams and began to feel drained. He got sick, and no matter what he did, he wouldn't get better. No matter how much sleep he got, he would still feel tired. That was when he decided that Charlie needed a new home, and eventually, Charlie came into my possession. Michael sold the doll to a collector who gladly took Charlie in. The collector began to experience the same exact things and decided she had taken on too much and had the doll relocated. I soon came across Charlie while scrolling through eBay one night. I decided to message the owner. She tried to convince me not to buy it and explained what I was getting myself into. I didn't believe a word of it, so without hesitation, I purchased Charlie. A week later, I received him. If I could go back in time and undo this, I would in a heartbeat. The moment I opened that box, I felt it. It's hard to explain, but I could feel a change in the air. I picked up the doll and got chills immediately. I put it off as a coincidence, and I brought Charlie into my room. Setting it up, I told it that it was just a stupid doll. How could it possibly be evil? I had to go to work then, so I closed my door and left. When I got home later that night, I walked in and I could feel it. That weird feeling again. 
I brushed it away once more as a coincidence. I walked into my room and found Charlie still there, but that feeling was still in the air. The energy it gave off was so powerful. I got in the shower, then I went to bed. That night, I had horrible dreams. I would be somewhere peaceful with family or friends, and all of a sudden, they would go away, and this thing would chase me up and down, ripping me apart. I call it thing because no words could describe it. I've never seen anything like it before, and I hope I never do again. Other weird things began happening as well. Lights would flicker or die. Phones would die all of a sudden. My TV and game consoles all of a sudden didn't work anymore. Finally, after three weeks of hell, I had enough. I was dead set on getting Charlie a permanent home away from mine. I did research and found a place to keep Charlie out of harm's way. In my time with Charlie, I can tell you there are some things none of us can explain in this world. I can tell you that demonic and possessed items are not something you ever want to mess with, and they're very real. Whatever Charlie was, I can tell you he sure as heck wasn't normal. And I kind of believe Michael now when he said that he didn't think Charlie was human. I just hope whatever or whoever Charlie is finds peace at last. Superstition or Reality From Returner 0173 I'd recently turned 28 years old and felt a sudden urge to look back on my life. There are people, friends, and teachers I wanted to see again. At least, it felt like that. But oddly enough, I don't remember their full names or their faces. Instead, I decided to look up family I hadn't seen in a long time, since immigrating to the United States. That's when I started to feel unease as certain memories flooded back. My dad's family immigrated to the US a long time ago, which leaves my mother's side back in the Philippines. When I was younger, I would visit them during times when school was out of session. They live on the northern part of the archipelago in a very rural area called Agoo La Union. The area is surrounded by rice paddies and tree lines that housed fish ponds that also transitioned to more rice paddies and the home itself is two hours away by foot from the beach if you cut through the rice paddies. The exact memories causing me unease occurred during the only and last full year I'd spent there. It was right before our family immigrated to the US. Due to how the school system worked, despite having completed more advanced subjects, the K-12 through system in the US would force me a year back. So the family decided I would go ahead and spend a full year with my mother's family in La Union while they finalized the paperwork and while my mother settled things with her company. All my other visits prior to this had been great. The Spanish colonial style of home was made almost entirely out of some red colored hardwood and the furniture looked as though it had been made specifically to match the house. It felt scenic and more relaxing than the modern city life I'd been accustomed to. That made me curious. However, my grandparents and the family that lived there had one rule. Do not try to open a specific room on the second floor, and if you somehow find it open, do not remove the cover of the mirror inside. I never questioned this rule before, but this time around I had a full year, and I was 10 years old. I spent about six months, curious but no unusual goings on. When I would pass that room, I would end up staring at the door. I'd ask my grandparents about it, but they'd just smile at me and tell me to ignore it. My grandparents are a mix of Spanish, Japanese, and Filipino. I shrugged the rules off as just superstition. The rest of the family told me to ignore it as well, but emphasized to avoid the room. Three months before our flight to the United States, things would begin to change. One July afternoon, I had spent the day with the local kids climbing trees and getting bit by large red ants while trying to get at the sweet fruits called duat or java plums, since everyone else was away doing errands and business. I believe it was around 4 p.m. or maybe 5 p.m. that I went back to the house as my grandparents and cousins were coming home. I ran upstairs to grab a change of clothes and a towel since I spent most of the day sweaty and dirty. I turned right at the top of the stairs to go to this open area. It's kind of like another living room. There are sofas lining the three walls, 
and the windows right by them were open. I don't remember opening them myself before I left the house to play. There were two doors in there too. If you continue straight from the doorway after turning right from the top of the stairs, those doors would be to your left. The farthest door from the stairs is a room where I kept my clothes. The closer door to the stairs is the one we're supposed to keep locked. Well, when I went through the doorway, that door was wide open. It was the smallest room I've ever seen. It's almost like a closet, maybe slightly wider to fit a twin XL bed on the left side, but there wasn't anything in that room except at the very back was a mirror. I'm 5'11 right now, and that thing would have been at least 6'4", with the wooden frame and all. The mirror itself was shaped like an oval, but at this moment I didn't know that because there was a thick white cloth covering the whole thing. I felt drawn to it, but I remembered that I was not supposed to go in there. The longer I stared, the more unease I felt. I told myself to see if there was anyone else home, but my body wouldn't move. I was standing a few feet away from the entrance of that room, but my mind was racing. I knew I hadn't seen anyone on my way to the house and on my way up. I had to be alone. The more I realized this, the more the hair on the back of my neck stood up. Suddenly, I felt something grab onto my arm. I yelled, freaking out, but it was my grandmother looking at me scared and worried. I think I may have seen some anger in her expression too. She moved her body so that the view of the mirror was obscured, and she asked me in a very stern voice, Did you look into the mirror? I looked around a bit confused. It was already dark out, but I had only come up here a few minutes ago, when there was still light out. I told her I, I don't know, that I had just got back in from playing outside. As she escorted me downstairs, she apologized that they came home a bit late because the place that hauls the rice we harvest had a problem. When I looked at the clock downstairs, it was nearly 8 p.m. Where had the time gone? I think she may have told my grandfather and my cousins because they all went up together while I was eating dinner. I didn't do anything after that as I was still confused. By the time I went to bed, it was around 12 p.m., when I went back upstairs, that door was closed again. They'd attached something by the doorknob, and a chain was looped through it. This was to prevent the door from swinging inward and opening. That confused me even more, since that still meant someone from the outside could just undo the chains if they wanted to. But I guess they didn't think I was the one who opened the door in the first place. Aside from my grandparents' room and the room I keep my clothes in, which only had one bed for my female cousin... The rest of us slept on bamboo mats with a futon on top that we roll out on the floor of the living room-like area upstairs. There are four of us, ranging from 10 to 15 years old, and I was the youngest. My mind was occupied that night, and unable to sleep until sunrise, I only slept like an hour or two at that point before my cousins woke me up for good. But nothing creepy had occurred. For an entire week, it was peaceful, and I'd forgotten all about it. Then things picked up. Exactly a week later, during an event just after dinner, we were watching a show while relaxing, and I had to use the bathroom. The problem was that the house itself had no bathroom built in it. The house had a gazebo or an extended roof to the side. In a way, the front door is a side door, since the front that faces the gate and the road to enter the property has no door, just windows. Once you exit the front door, you turn left for a few feet and right next to the house is a cemented staircase leading up to a door. This is where the toilet was. The height is about midway between the second and first floor. It's like walking up to a throne, which I always enjoyed as a kid. Above the toilet on the wall is a rectangular hole that opens to the backyard, where there was a large mango tree. Beyond that, it opens to a field of rice paddies. While I was on the toilet, I felt a chill. There was something primal inside me that made me sweat, despite the night being cold. That feeling of being watched coming from all over was prickling at my senses. I knew there was no way this was possible, as there's only one opening and it was right above me. I tried my best to act like nothing was happening, telling myself not to turn around or look up. I sat there, my nerves causing my body to shiver. I heard a sound that forced me to bite my lip until it bled to stop myself from screaming. 
This sound was unmistakably like someone's tongue clicking, and it sounded deliberate. Each sound clicked in threes, separated by two seconds apart, and they grew harder each time. I was trying to finish as fast as I could, pushing the bidet multiple times. When I was finally completely done, I ran out as fast as I could. I'd forgotten to pull my pants up too. It was a miracle I didn't trip. My eldest male cousin, Eugene, looked at me worried. Everyone had gone up to bed while I was in the toilet. Apparently, I'd been taking too long. He was asked to wait for me downstairs. I couldn't explain it to him, but it must have spooked him because he looked out the windows before shutting them. The windows there were made of small rectangular sheets that are lined up horizontally, like those horizontal blinds, and they close much in the same way. He urged me upstairs after shutting them, and did the same to the windows up there before we lay down to sleep. I don't know what time it was, but it was extremely dark. I woke up from this sound, like creaking. I was the second to the last spot closest to the doorway that leads to the stairs. Eugene was the last. I could tell the creaking was coming from the door, because in the entire darkness a light was coming off from there, and it grew more and more before the creaking transitioned to the floorboards. I felt a pinch on my arm then. It was Eugene facing me. I could barely see his face in the dark, but the moonlight coming through the now-opened room made some of his features more visible. He looked afraid. His head shook side to side as though telling me not to look. He didn't speak, but the finger on his lips told me not to make a sound. He closed his eyes for several seconds, then opened them, telling me to do the same by nodding. No words were exchanged, but the way his eyes widened when the creak of the floorboard sounded louder and closer made it obvious. I began to sweat, my chest heaving, but I forced myself not to make a sound, and I closed my eyes tightly. The creak continued moving around the room. Eugene held my arm tightly to make sure I was still there, since he had closed his eyes as well. I kept mine closed, but the anxiety of hearing the creaking sounds moving closer made me tense up. My eyelids were beginning to hurt. I do not know how long it took. It felt eternal. There were no footsteps on the floors each time it creaked, but sometime later, clear taps, almost like a footstep but distorted, came from the ceiling, replacing the creaking on the floorboard. A loud metallic creak filled the room coming from the farthest wall. My eyes were closed, but my back was pointing against the source of the metallic creak. The cool breeze let me know that the window had been opened. The taps on the ceiling were right above me. Eugene's hand tightened even more, and I got a feeling that my other cousins were also awake now. They were normally messy sleepers, but they were dead steady. The footsteps on the ceiling stopped right above me, but I could feel that if I opened my eyes, something would be staring right at me, and it made me want to scream. I could feel the breeze from the now open window against my back, and there was a cold brush against my cheek. Then the The tongue clicks returned, and they were loud, as though whoever or whatever was making them knew we were awake. It came from behind me, and the sound of something hollow tapping on the glass pane came too. As I mentioned, the walls were lined with the sofa, so right by our head a sofa separated us from the wall. The two windows lining that wall right above us creaked. The smell of tobacco hit my nose, followed by sulfur and ammonia. From that same window, I could hear heavy breathing each time the tobacco smell surged. The leaves of the mango tree by that window shook like something was moving the branches. The tongue clicks behind me, the tobacco, ammonia, sulfur smells, and heavy breathing right by my head seemed to go on forever. I was not in the right mind to keep track of time, but I know for sure that it would be a while before the floorboard creaked again. I heard cackling from both directions out the window, then felt an unmistakable cold hand grasping my right ankle. Eugene squeezed my arm then. I guess he could feel me become more tense, and I tried to remain calm, but I soiled myself then. After that, I'm not sure what happened. 
I know that I spent the entire night awake. When the neighbor's chickens crowed, Eugene sat up, followed by the rest of my cousins. They were all drenched in sweat, and so was I. Being boys, they would have surely made fun of me for soiling myself, but they didn't. It was still just before sunrise, but there was enough light for us to move around now. We turned on the lights and ran downstairs as a group, all scared but relieved. The locked room was wide open, and the mirror had no covers on it. When I came around to look sometime later that day, the window panes had scratch marks that weren't there before. The ceiling had scratch marks on it too. My uncle and Eugene were trying to fix the door. Apparently, the knob had been completely wrecked, so I was able to see inside while they were trying to fix it. The floor by the mirror, when I first looked in the room, there weren't any scratch marks, but now that floor was covered in them. This experience would continue on, deferring intensity for the rest of the time I was there, especially the feeling of being watched. It stopped feeling like that for a long while, since moving to the US, until I remembered it all recently. Since then, I feel creeped out at night, especially when there's a large mirror and an open window. But it's summer here now, and it feels extremely hot. Now and again, dreams that feel too real about something coming out of a mirror when I'm alone plagues me. I don't know anymore. Is it just suggestive superstition, or was it all real? Nine Months of Torment From Anonymous Let me begin by saying it's out of my element to write about personal experiences of any kind. I tend to avoid thinking about them for the most part. Now, I grew up hearing voices, seeing or being followed by things that I couldn't put into words, and so as I got older, I would self-medicate with certain substances, as one tends to do when they don't want to face their reality. I say this because it all ties together for this story. I've made many mistakes and I've paid dearly for them. One of these grave errors led to me being sentenced to a federal prison. If you saw me in person, you'd never think of me as a felon or criminal, but many people that find themselves in a similar position rarely look like what you think they would. I went to a federal women's prison camp in Kentucky, which was adjacent to a high security men's prison. When you think of prison, you think of cell blocks and barred doors but in reality, a camp offers you a lot more freedom. We weren't behind a barbed wire fence or barred doors that automatically close you in. There were communal bathrooms, and for the most part, you had free range of the camp, although there were set hours you had to be in your room for counts, etc. A count is when a guard goes through the entire facility and counts you, so they can make sure there are no inmates escaping, missing, out of bounds, etc. I came in during the height of the Rona, so a lot of the programs were shut down, and there wasn't much to do but sleep and hope for a good work assignment, which would help you pass the time. My first experience wasn't as horrifying as my others, but it was still very unsettling. At the time, I was of course on edge. I was entering a prison with other women, forced to live in a tiny room with 12 other people that you don't know, and who was to say what they were there for or what they were capable of to begin with? I was sleeping on the top bunk, which was next to the wall, with my back facing the room. One night, I felt a tap on my shoulder. I assumed it was someone asking me something, or trying to offer me something, as some people there would offer to try to peddle smuggled cigarettes or pills in exchange for commissary items, so I pretended to be asleep and ignored it. Something tapped me again. I groaned and turned around, waiting for my eyes to adjust, but no one was there. I swung my head down to look below at the inmate sleeping under me, expecting to find them giggling and being childish. I assumed someone was trying to haze me, as I was the new inmate in the room. But she was sleeping softly, snoring along with everyone else in the room. As you can imagine, it's not a quiet place, even in the middle of the night, with everyone sleeping around you. I turned back over, trying to fall asleep. Right as I felt myself fading out of consciousness, Something which felt very much like a hand forcefully placed its palm on my shoulder instead of the light taps I felt before. This jolted me awake, and I turned to nothing again. 
After that, I never slept with my back facing the room again. It was always strategically placed against the wall, so I wouldn't be tapped or grabbed anymore. Now, although there was access to substances at this facility, I was sober and very clear-minded. I'd finally made the decision to get my life together, but I'd almost forgotten what sobriety also brought back into my life. After gaining some bearings and observing my fellow inmates, I felt comfortable enough to ask someone what they may have experienced in this facility. I was told the camp used to be an old drug farm back in the 1920s, where people that maybe smoked up a little would be admitted involuntarily and subjected to torture-like experiments, such as getting them addicted to other substances and then taking it away to see how they would react. Many people died in the basement of the facility which now housed the gym and the library used to be the morgue. My next experience was a shared one. I was growing restless, and with my newfound sobriety I wanted to get healthier in different ways. I wanted to start going to the gym. I found someone closer in age to me and we started to work out together. The basement was sort of separated in different wings with the main common area for the library. Pretty much anywhere you went, you could find a group of inmates playing cards somewhere. There was a group in the common area, and the gym was down the wing. We would close the doors to the hallway as the women playing cards were usually loud and excited about spades or rummy or whatever they may have been playing. Another girl and I were lying on the floor on a yoga mat, waiting for our next set to begin, when the lights started to flicker on and off. This was an old building. When lights flicker, I don't assume it's something supernatural or paranormal, I assume the place is falling apart, and they refuse to fix anything, so we ignore it. We keep working out, then again the lights flicker while we're resting in between sets. We certainly heard a D-man's cackle. It sounded sinister, and the lights went completely dark while we were lying on our backs on the floor. It was so dark, in fact, you couldn't see two inches in front of your face. That's when we began to get scared. We froze there for a moment not saying anything because we both didn't want to acknowledge the man's voice. There were guards in the facility, male guards as well as female, but they were serious and not to be spoken to or messed with. They wouldn't play pranks on inmates. The lights finally came back on after what felt like hours, but it was probably only about two minutes, and we ran out of the gym then into the common area where the women were still playing cards, like nothing creepy had just happened. We asked them if they flickered the lights on and off, or if they lost power in this room too. But they just looked at us confused, slightly annoyed too that we were interrupting their game. Time passed and more small incidents kept occurring, but it almost reminded me of my childhood, how I just kind of had to get used to it. One night I woke up having to go to the bathroom. It was probably close to 3am. I got my toilet paper and walked to the communal bathrooms which had some stall doors on them. Some only had shower curtains to block them. Some stalls had nothing, and people used them anyways. Prison takes away lots of things, but one of the most treasured that you don't even think about would be privacy. While I'm using the restroom, I hear footsteps enter the bathroom, and the rustle of the shower curtain being moved. I'm not concerned at this point, more so curious, because it's rare for people to be up and moving around at this time, especially so close to count but I just assumed they have to use the bathroom just like me. My curiosity led me to bend down to peek at the feet of my neighbor, but when I do, I see almost blackened feet, crusted with a dark brown gooey substance that looks like blood. The toenails were cracked and bleeding, the heels were scarred and hardened. This was not normal. It was common sense to make sure no matter where you go within the prison, you wear shoes as you could get athlete's foot, especially in the bathrooms. And even so, why did this person's feet look like this? They must have been in agony. It took me a minute to register what I was seeing. I looked up, kind of confused. Then this deep sense of dread washed over me, and I felt extremely heavy. I looked back again, at my neighbor's feet, but I didn't see anything. No one was there anymore. I quickly ran back to my room, silently praying the thing with the mangled and bloody feet did not follow me into my cell. Things kept happening to other women. You would hear the stories that were passed down to one inmate to another, which were always embellished, and you could tell when someone was adding something or flat out lying, just to tell a story, as a woman's prison is a very gossipy place, for the most part. 
I met this one girl who was fairly new. She had been designated in this area known as the bus stop to sleep and essentially live with about 40 other women in a common area on the other side of the camp. She looked ragged, like she hadn't slept in years, but she was so young. She told me one day that every time she fell asleep, she felt something hold her down by the throat, and it wouldn't let go. That's why she never slept. Although this isn't part of my story, I could tell something was tormenting her. She looked broken. Someone so young. Obviously, she had made a mistake or two to be here, but still she had a life left to live and a chance to change. But she looked just absolutely broken. After some time at this facility, I got a good work assignment that allowed me to be moved to a more private two-man cell that was very coveted, but only available for early morning outdoor workers. I was happy to gain more privacy and only have to deal with one other inmate as a roommate at the time. She was an older woman that, from what I understood, had been sentenced to prison for murder for hire as she tried to hire someone to get rid of her abusive husband. She was kind, but a little odd. She, for the most part, could be found playing cards with her group of friends. At one point, she got the Rona and had to be moved to a different wing to quarantine. Now, it sounds horrible, but I was so excited to have a room to myself for two weeks. She was in good health and not in any danger of getting sicker, but the idea of just being able to change freely and sleep without being awakened by someone else was awesome. This sliver of freedom made me feel so happy but I probably slept six hours total in those two weeks. Anytime I tried to sleep, my bed would start to vibrate. The entire bed just shook uncontrollably. It was so scary because it wouldn't stop even after I woke up. I would see shadow figures on the wall from the hallway. I felt like I was constantly being watched and I just couldn't fall asleep for fear of being shaken awake. Towards the end of my sentence, I had been there for about eight months and I was due to be released in a month for good behavior. I had a light sentence and was feeling very excited for my newfound sobriety and fresh start once I got home. I had a dream. I've always had dreams that one could say are almost like a fever dream and somehow end up coming to fruition or like a feeling of deja vu for me. In this case, I had a dream that I was home, the best kind of dream. I was home and I was sleeping in my big comfy bed when I heard a gunshot. I woke up in the dream and I looked around. My partner, who I was still with while imprisoned, was gone from my side. I went frantic in the dream, looking all over the house for him and then the garage. When I got to the garage, I saw a body lying in a puddle of blood, but it was behind the car so I couldn't see anything but the knees down. I woke up in real life, crying uncontrollably, which is not common for me as being in prison kind of made me very unemotional. I didn't feel comfortable crying or showing any sort of weakness there. But I couldn't stop. I was horrified. I had to call my significant other. I had this horrible feeling in my gut that something bad happened. We have specific phone times. We can only use the phone within our specific wings or blocks time, because of Rona mostly. But it wasn't yet our time to use the phone. I begged one of the counselors to use the phone and for the most part, they would normally say no, but I think he could see something was wrong in my eyes. He could tell I needed to use the phone, and he allowed me to. I quickly called and confirmed my partner's safety. I promised I'd call later during my phone times, and just hearing their voice and knowing they were okay was all I needed. I went to talk to a group of girls that I had befriended during my stay, to just get this off my chest and move on with the day. One of the girls that I was friends with was in the office, which is usually serious. We found out it was a family emergency, so we waited for her to come back, then we could be supportive. Nothing is worse than seeing someone lose a family member in prison, not being able to be there for them. I've seen women lose children, and the wailing cries and screams you can hear throughout the camp is one of the worst sounds I will ever hear in my life. We were waiting for this friend when she comes out and just bursts into tears. She said her brother had shot himself in his garage. When I eventually told the women about my dream, they turned and looked at me, shocked. Apparently, what I had just described to them was apparently what had happened. We all went into overdrive, trying to comfort our friend while thinking about the dream at the same time. Prisons have a lot of history, and I think it's safe to assume there's something nefarious going on in most of them beyond the realm of the living. 
I've been out for over a year now and my life is completely turned around. I'm sober and occasionally I have instances where the hairs on the back of my neck stand up, but I take it as a warning and I follow my instincts instead of trying to drown them in substances now. Although all of these experiences were horrifying, I didn't feel like I was ever in grave danger. For the most part, it felt like something or someone wanted to be heard or acknowledged, but there was something else there that was more malevolent. Something that seemed to feed off the sorrow and pain of the inmates. Something lurking and watching. Always watching. Demonic Lady From Rosie Gone Rosie I was around eight years old when this happened. I had been living temporarily with my aunt, uncle, and their children, or my cousins, at the time, for reasons I will not go into. I remembered I had been sitting on the bottom bunk. I was reading one of my favorite books at the time. I never really felt comfortable being in a room by myself when I was younger. I always felt there were these presences in the same room as me. My parents had always chalked it up to me being clingy or having a bad dream. But on this occasion, the air went still, and I had this weird feeling that something or someone was watching me. So I shut the book and looked up. My heart began to pound like a drum when I saw who had been watching me. It wasn't a who, though. It was more like a what. A demon-like pale white figure was staring at me from the top bunk. Chills filled my body, and I was paralyzed with fear. I shivered, not from being cold. It was from the huge amount of fear I was feeling at the moment. This woman had pale white skin that was the color of fresh snow. She had raven black hair, and her entire eye was black, like a demon's, from one of those supernatural TV shows. She opened her mouth wide and showed off her sharp teeth, which resembled what a carnivore's teeth would look like. Our staring contest we had seemed to go on for a minute or two before the demonic-like creature began to speak. Do you want to play a game? The creature asked in a distorted voice, I shook my head, terrified. The creature growled, and it seemed to lunge at me. I closed my eyes, and when I opened them again, that demonic woman, more like creature, had vanished into seemingly thin air. It should be impossible that someone or something could just disappear that quickly. I shoved my book to the side and raced out of the room. I told my cousins and siblings what I witnessed. They assumed it was just my overactive imagination. I'm 18 years old now, and I still think about it every now and then. I tried to research what the creature was, but I had little to no success. Hopefully it was just my mind playing tricks on me. Whatever it was, I certainly don't want another encounter with whatever the heck it was. If it hadn't disappeared, well, it would have eaten me, I guess. And that makes me feel rather unnerved. Demon at Old Gun Church My fiancé is from a little coastal town in South Carolina. One summer we went to visit his mother and our friends for about three weeks. It was a fun time, with lots of sun, sand, and great memories. I'm from up north, so spending time in the south is a treat for me, and being a big history buff, having friends who knew the area was like having my own living history book. One thing that's important to know about the South is that every nook and cranny of every town is haunted. Whether by dark secrets, history, or religion, the South has it all. The one particular big draw in this area was an abandoned church known as Old Gun. It's an old Civil War era church with a trauma-rich history. It had been burned down twice, rebuilt once, and the preacher is said to have fallen from the bell tower to his death. Now it sits a husk of its former self, decrepit and decaying, with untended sunken graves in the back of it. Did I mention this church sits in the middle of the Carolina swamps? Anyway, it was a late summer evening and my fiancé, Silas, our friend Tara, and I were driving out to pick up our friend, Lapis. Lapis lives in the boonies of Silas's hometown, and of course we had to drive to go get her in the pitch dark. Once we arrived at Lapis's house, we began to make our way back, 
when the four of us got the idea to visit Old Gun. It was a new moon night, and well, three of the four of us were witches, so it seemed like a fun idea at the time. Hey May, take a ride at this gas station to Exodus Road, Lapis said to me as we made our way down the country road. Exodus Road? Jeez, that doesn't help with the spooky aspect. I laughed. As soon as we took the turn down Exodus Road, a wave of anxiety rippled through the car. Our boisterous laughter was changed to nervous chuckles. We began poking fun at the idea of any of this creepy lore being true. We all believed it, of course, but we wanted to pretend to be strong, just a little longer. It seemed the longer we drove into the night, the louder we all got, hoping our false sense of joy would press back out on the encroaching fear and darkness. A few more bends and winds in the road, and a rough left turn, we finally arrived at our destination. The facade of the church loomed high into the dark night sky, behind an old chain-link fence and sign posted in the nearby pine tree. The sign read, Warning, trespassers will be prosecuted. Smile, you're on camera. We're here, I said cheerfully, hiding the unease I felt as I peered into the illuminated front door, then to the blown-out stained-glass window. The only light around were the headlights of the car and the few stars illuminating the sky. We all sat there in the car for a moment, unsure of what to do, what to expect, or how to proceed. I turned off the car, forcing us all to make a decision. Lapis and I were the first ones out of the car. We stood nearby, just looking around. Did you guys see that? Silas asked, pointing to the doorway. I think I saw like a black mass slink from one side of the door to the other. He informed us, and we all turned to look. Then a loud grunt came from nearby and right behind us. Nope, Lapis and I exclaimed. My heart picked up. That's a wild boar, Lapis continued. It's mad and it's close. Don't know about you guys, but I don't feel like getting gored tonight. I replied. Same, said Silas. So we all climbed back into the car. I turned the car back on, put the headlights on the church, and we rolled down our windows. There was another grunt, and one shortly after that that didn't seem quite right. Suddenly, I get this sensation that something just isn't right, and I began to feel as if my left arm had electricity coursing through it. My heart sank into my stomach, because I knew that there's something here with us, and whatever it was, it wasn't good. To further my fear, the night had grown unbearably still and quiet. I've always seemed to be a magnet for the paranormal. It started when I was six and I saw the spirit of my recently deceased grandfather in broad daylight. I think I am sensitive to others' emotions and energies, and in the past year or so I've been harnessing this as a way to connect with my craft. So I know when a spirit or things are bad or good, by which side of my body feels it first. If the right side of my body feels it first, it's usually a benevolent entity. But if my left side feels it first... It always means whatever it is, is bad. Another grunt, and the rest of our party mentions that they heard the boar. By then, my head is beginning to swim, and I'm too afraid to look to the left of me. I knew Lapis was already looking in that direction, but I felt as though if I looked over there, I'd see something I did not want to see. That's not a boar. That's something pretending to be a boar, Lapis said. That's all the confirmation I needed to know my feeling was right. My arm began to feel stiff now, and my mouth went dry. Silas jokingly tried to guess what it was. But Lapis was staring intently out the window. I could see her in the rearview mirror. I waited, staring into the doorway of the church, hoping and praying that I wouldn't see whatever Lapis saw. The silence became deafening, and ringing filled my left ear. My grip on the steering wheel tightened, we have to leave now. Don't turn left, Lapis spoke with intensity. I threw the car into reverse. A sense of urgency and panic coursed through my body at her words. Sure thing. We're leaving right now, and I'm not turning right, I said to her to let her know I got the message. Whatever you do, do not look back, 
She spoke with an authority that I knew wasn't false. I locked all the doors, rolled up the windows, and I hit the gas. Against my better judgment, I took a moment to look into the backup camera, and I wish I hadn't. In the dim light of the brake lights, I saw something I'll never forget. About six feet back was a large rolling mass of what seemed to be thick black smoke with the occasional glint of red eyes. It seemed to move towards the car. Without hesitation, I slammed my foot on the gas. We threw gravel from our tires as the complete and utter sense of terror and dread filled me. We then sped off into the night. When the church was out of sight, I slowed down only a bit as the area was crawling with deer. I didn't feel like totaling my fiancé's mother's car in the process of getting away from this thing. What did you see? Silas and Tara clamored. I didn't want to answer. My focus was on the road. I'll tell you when we get somewhere inside without any windows. It doesn't want me to talk about it right now. Lapis said in monotone. She was trying not to frighten the group, but I could feel it. Without looking, I knew that I would have to keep my eyes forward and keep driving, otherwise it was going to get us. Looking behind me would let it in, then we'd all be doomed. The car grew silent after a while, and Silas insisted on playing music that added to the mood. Of course, my lovable idiot of a fiancé didn't see a thing, so he thought everything was fine, but it wasn't. It really wasn't but I didn't want to alarm anyone. I could feel it, though, creeping through the third row to the middle row where Lapis sat, and a chill ran down my spine. Lapis was unusually quiet, and I knew something was terribly wrong. A flash outside my window in the ditch of the shoulder drew my attention, and my blood ran cold. In the darkness, I could see skulls, hundreds of them shimmering and rolling in the dark, like they were being carried by the mass I'd seen before. Lapis would later tell me she saw this too. I felt it again, the stiffness in my left arm, now a shock running up my left leg as the skulls seemed to multiply and fill more of the darkness. I get this sense of pure anger, just unbridled malevolence coming from these skulls. Get out. It urged with its presence. Get out. You do not belong here. I wanted to tell it that we were leaving to please leave us alone. I felt the need to speed up and put my eyes back on the road to be ever vigilant for a renegade deer. Even my line of sight in the front of the car wasn't safe. As I drove, I saw a swirling black mist on the inside roof of the car. I felt the ice form in my veins and I knew we had to book it out of there. It was at this point Lapis would inform me she felt two sets of hands on her pulling her into the seat and keeping her from being able to speak. Babe, slow down. The ten-mile curve is coming up. Silas warned. I slowed up, just in time to take the narrowest, sharpest curve I have ever taken in my life. And of course, whatever this was, wasn't done with us. Sitting in the shoulder of the right-hand side of the road, my headlights illuminated my final straw for the night, a thin male deer with glowing blue eyes and an abnormally large mouth stood there looking into the car. It felt as if time stopped as I made eye contact with this creature, and every hair on my body stood on end. Get out, or I will get you, was the phrase that crossed my mind as I stared into its glowing blue eyes. I let out a scream and floored the accelerator so hard I almost redlined it. For the rest of the ride, I kept my foot on that accelerator, praying that it wouldn't catch us, knowing it could have gotten us if it wanted to. That nothing we did, no matter how fast we drove, it could have gotten its hands, if it had any, on us. Eventually, we crossed the river that separated the boonies from the more populated part of town, and it seemed after we crossed the water, that oppressive presence was gone. The air felt lighter and my body didn't hurt anymore. As we pulled into the driveway, Lapis said, Silas, when you turned around to look at me, I tried to warn you not to look behind, but I couldn't. It was like I couldn't control my own body to warn you. Later, after we all settled down, we did a major Arcana tarot reading, and this is what it told us. 
you encountered chaos, be thankful you are still alive. Do not return. After the message of that reading, we properly cleansed ourselves. Lapis and I made a pact. We would never go back to Old Gun. To those of you reading, I know this sounds fantastical, but I promise it's true. I swear it's true. To the demon or spirit of chaos living in the swamps of Old Gun Church, I got your message, and I promise we will not be back. I Fought a Demon and Won From Visigoth In July of 2000, I was forced to confront the fact that all the stories and myths I'd ever heard about demons were true. They are real, they are evil, and they want and are able to kill the living. I grew up in a Catholic household in the Midwest. My home life was very chaotic, mostly as a result of my veteran father dealing with his shell shock by drinking excessively and getting in fights at poker games. My father had a hard time keeping a job, and we never seemed to have any money. My mom and dad argued constantly, and we moved frequently, so I never really felt any sense of comfort or stability at home. Just when I made some neighborhood friends or got into a rhythm at school, we would pack up and move, and I would be the new kid all over again. Years and years of living like this made me grow to resent my family, my community, and even my faith, which I decided at one point was just a scam to scare gullible people and line the pockets of the clergy. I never had any friends, so I put all my effort into my schoolwork. I got a scholarship to a university hours away from home. I studied psychology and criminal justice with the intent of becoming an FBI agent or a lawyer. I graduated with honors. After that, I immediately moved to California, leaving my former life and dysfunctional family behind. Everything changed for me in California. I got a great job working for a private investigation firm. I met a free-spirited, exotic young woman, and after dating for six months, we moved in together. My girlfriend, Salem, had a dark sense of humor. She liked much heavier music than I did and was into spiritualism, which I considered total bunk at the time. However, she did contrast my rather stoic and staid personality perfectly, so we got along really well. She was very attractive to me, and that may have clouded my judgment somewhat. Salem was always going on and on about crystals, psychics, and other esoteric topics, which I thought were just harmless hobbies of hers. She would go to psychic fairs every other week or so, and always wanted me to go with her, but I never would. Finally, after months and months of pestering me to go with her, I agreed to attend one for her. It was not what I imagined it to be. For some reason, I thought it would be more like a renaissance fair or something, with gothic decorations and candles everywhere, everyone wearing robes and pointy hats. Instead, it was held in a cramped little bland outlet in a strip mall. There were a dozen or so psychics giving different types of readings, from tea leaves to tarot cards, and all manner of retail items for sale, primarily books, crystals, and herbs. Salem had a reading, then another from a different person, then another. Eventually, I was very bored and a little weirded out by some of the people there. But I just stayed by her side and kept my opinions to myself. Before we left, she bought a small purple crystal sphere that looked exactly like I always pictured a crystal ball to look, as well as a small pedestal for it to rest on. After that, we went home. That very same night, for the first time in my life, I stopped breathing in my sleep. I woke straight up, gasping for air. Sure, I know, there are numerous explanations for this to happen, but I was in my early 20s at the time and in great physical shape. I'd been studying martial arts for years, and I'd even taken up surfing once moving to California. 
My sudden case of breathlessness scared Salem, but I just blew it off as some sort of weird fluke. The next night, it happened again. Only this time, I opened my eyes, and I was awake when I realized I wasn't breathing. I could hear myself making a gurgling, choking sound. I then bolted up in bed and began gasping for air again. Now, I was scared too. Being a logical person, I got on the internet and began searching for possible reasons for what had happened to me. Sleep apnea seemed to be the most likely explanation, but I'd never had it before in my life, and it wasn't supposed to continue happening to you after you wake up. Keep in mind, the second occurrence I was wide awake. While still at my computer, I turned around. I was just kind of ruminating on things when my gaze fell upon the crystal sphere that Salem had placed on the entertainment center above our television. I then turned back to my computer, typing in dangers of crystals into the search engine. The top two results were about the spiritual dangers of the uninitiated using crystals. The third and fourth results were about what the Bible says about crystals. I dove down an internet rabbit hole that lasted hours and consumed my thoughts. I didn't believe in spirituality, witches, demons, angels, or any of that stuff. But for some reason, I could not stop digging deeper and deeper into the topic. I read website after website about sacred stones in the occult, about how some believe crystals can be used to communicate with spiritual entities or even open a gateway to other dimensions. After every article or blog, I would shake my head and basically tell myself, yeah, right. But I just kept on searching and reading until I began to fixate on the crystal being the root of my problems. Still, it was just a hunk of rock, wasn't it? How could it possibly affect my sleep? There's no logical way that it could, right? One day, Salem came home from her sister's house. The two of us had a nice evening together. I didn't mention anything about the crystal or spending my days searching the dark corners of the internet for solutions to my sleep problem. We stayed up late watching a movie, and she fell asleep on the couch. I carried her to bed and went to sleep myself. She slept on the left side of the bed, me on the right. That night, it happened again. I woke up aware that I was suffocating. I tried to sit up and take a breath like I had the last time, but I could not sit up. I could not breathe. What little air that happened to go through my nose brought with it the scent of a terrible foul odor of wet earth and decay. The entire right side of my face felt frozen, like my head was being held next to an open freezer. Still gasping for air, I turned my head to the right, and there, inches from my face, was a man. Well, male in form, but it was not just a man. It was a creature, an entity, a demon. This wasn't a dream, not a hallucination, definitely not sleep paralysis, which seems to be the catch-all excuse for scientists as I was able to turn my head and look at it. It was there. It was real. The demon was, I assumed, hunched on the floor, just off the side of the bed. I could only see its head and the tops of its shoulders peeking up over the top of our bed. It leaned in toward me, jutting its narrow, pointy chin over the side of the bed in my direction. Its head was large and bulbous and hairless, its skin was a gray-brown, undulating mass of wrinkles, warts, scabs, and tumors. The eye sockets were large, angular, and hollow. It had no eyes to speak of, but deep down within its eye sockets, what seemed like a thousand feet within them, were two pinpricks of yellow light that were its eyes. The nose was bulbous and drooped down nearly to its mouth, which was another black chasm with a handful of gnarled teeth and rotten gums. It was the source of the cold that I felt on my face and the damp odor that filled my nostrils. 
Now, I grew up rough. I got in many fights as a kid, and as a young man, I hunted and fished with my dad. I'd even encountered real-life gangsters in both America and Mexico as a private investigator. But nothing had ever come close to scaring me as much as that man, thing, or demon. It was like every cell in my body vibrated in horror all at once, desperate to escape it. I could not comprehend what I was seeing, but I knew it was pure evil. It never talked, it never moved, though its mouth did quiver ever so slightly and the yellow pinpricks of lights in its eye sockets twinkled. It just stared at me or through me. When I tried to sit up, I heard my own voice in my head say, stay in bed. It was my voice, but not my thought. Finally, after I don't know how long, seconds, minutes, or hours, I tore my gaze away from it, and I sat up in bed, gasping and coughing for air. Then, I screamed so loudly, I terrified Salem and woke up our landlord across the hall, who began to pound on our front door. Salem answered the door and told him that everything was fine, but she would not come back to bed with me, instead choosing to sleep on the couch. I was so drained, so utterly exhausted, that I passed out almost immediately after that and slept through the night. When I woke up the next day, I was alone. Salem had gone to work already. My bed sheets were utterly soaked in sweat, so I gathered them up and put them in a basket to wash them. The laundry room was down the hall from our apartment, right next to an old-style metal chute for the trash. Without even thinking, I just immediately tossed my sheets and pillowcases down the garbage chute rather than taking them into the laundry room. I went back to my apartment and the first thing, the very first thing that caught my eye was the purple crystal, which had reflected the morning light and was casting a purple beam across the wall opposite the entertainment center. The thing made me feel nervous and anxious. I didn't want to look at it. In fact, I hated it. Without a thought, I walked over, picked it up, squeezed it tight, and yelled, in the name of Jesus Christ, I cast you out. I hadn't been to church in over a decade, and I'd stopped praying long before that. But in that instant, I somehow knew what to say, what to do. Maybe I'd seen too many horror movies or whatever, but that's what I did. And believe me, writing this out and reading it back to myself, I know how utterly foolish it sounds for a grown adult a well-educated private investigator, no less, to yell something like that in an empty room. Nevertheless, that's what I did, that's what I said, and the very second I uttered that last word, I heard a rather quiet pop, and I felt warmth in my hand. I opened my fist to see that the crystal had cracked from the inside out. From the very center of this extremely hard piece of purple crystal, there was a six-pointed, star-shaped crack that extended nearly to the surface of the sphere. I couldn't believe that it happened, but it did. I felt amazed, relieved, but also terrified, because that meant that the demon was real after all. I ran out into the hallway and down to the garbage chute, tossing the crystal and its pedestal down into the black abyss of the chute. When Salem got home from work, I made up some story about our cat knocking her crystal off of the entertainment center. She shrugged it off. That night, I slept soundly, and I slept soundly every night after that. I broke up with Salem shortly thereafter, and I moved on with my life. I've never once stopped breathing in my sleep since, and I've never had any other experiences like it. I found my way back to a semblance of faith, and thankfully, I never encountered anything like that creature, that demon, again, though it did seem to open up some awareness to other things. That demon was real, 
It wanted to kill me, and it very easily could have. I know that now, and I try not to think about it. And I've never told a single soul about it, because I know what people will think, and I have my reputation to protect. But when I do think about it, I can see it clear as day in my mind's eye. I can feel the cold malice of it, and almost smell it. I fought that demon, and I won. But I pray to God I never have to do something like that again. I do not judge or condemn people who consider themselves spiritual or practice divination or those who believe in psychics or witches or whatever. Nor do I believe that they're inherently bad or evil at all. What I want people to realize is that, yes, there are entities out there that are not human. We can see them, we can feel them, and we can experience them. And some of them, they want to hurt you and possibly kill you. If you're going to mess around with that sort of thing, do your research and protect yourself. Haunted Bakery from Cupcake When I was 13, I experienced a sleep paralysis demon sighting. And since then, I've never had any phobia or anxiety that could compete with the sheer terror of that event. I was floating above my bed, looking down at my sleeping body. I looked up, and I heard several sickening cracks like bones popping and dislocating. I then saw that thing that haunts me to this day, 14 years later. In the corner of my room, perched on the ceiling, was this demonic thing. It looked like a shadowy monster with spider-like appendages, an ear-to-ear -ear grin of shark-like rows of teeth, and it dripped black with ooze. Its eyes were merely black holes in its head, and as it twitched and writhed, all of its many legs cracked. I could simultaneously feel my immobile body, unable to move a single muscle. I could feel the pressure of the pillow on my cheek as I looked down at myself. I could also see it, looking down hungrily at my sleeping body. I realized it was about to make a mad dash to race my soul to it. Even though I woke up and realized it had all been a dream, I still made the assumption that I'd simply gotten to my body first. This is the reason why the events I'm about to describe did not send me noping away from the haunted bakery at light speed. To me, I'd encountered sheer terror before. So in 2018, I worked at a bakery for a man I'll be referring to as Tom. Tom was a nice enough guy. He paid me too well to do such an easy job, but as his products had become more popular, he was spending all his free time at work instead of at home with his wife. The treat we were making was just a small cake dipped in chocolate but it sold like there was no tomorrow. The bakery, as he called it, was in the back room of a warehouse which sold antiques and art. This was not a storefront. He just delivered the bags of treats to local businesses for retail sale. In my first week working there, I began to notice really strange things about the place. If not for my previously mentioned demon encounter, I likely would have gotten the feeling of being watched or having creepy vibes as some of the other customers in the antique section had mentioned. One day I was sitting in front of my melted chocolate bowl, and I turned around to get another tray of cakes from the counter behind me. When I reached to grab the dipping fork from where I'd left it on the table, I groped around at an empty space instead. Okay, I thought. I must have dropped it or something. I got up from my stool to look at the ground, thinking I had accidentally just knocked it off without noticing. I mean, I had just been using it for the previous tray, so it couldn't have gone far. Or so I thought. Hey, what you looking for? Tom asked, looking up from the mixer. I think I dropped my fork, or maybe I set it somewhere different, I'm not sure. I explained. He came over to help me search. After about two minutes of us looking all over for it, I had just about given up, grabbing a new one to start dipping again. But then, Tom came in from the packaging room, holding a fork with still melted chocolate on the tines. We stared at each other in silence for a moment, knowing that neither of us had gotten up to go into the other room for hours, let alone recently enough for that chocolate to not have cooled enough to dry, which would take about five minutes. 
Why he even checked in there for it was a mystery to me. But I think at that point, he was just wandering around aimlessly. It uh, was just on the counter, by the printer. Kind of creepy, right? He asked, tossing it into the sink. I nodded but continued dipping the cakes, not really sure how to react to something happening right under my nose like that. The next incident happened more literally under our noses. I suddenly started smelling really strong cracked peppercorns, like the fresh ones you get from a grinder. So, new ingredient in the cakes, huh? I joked, looking at him. He gazed back at me quizzically before smelling it for himself. He covered his nose in revulsion. What the heck is that smell? <laughs> Smells like a uh, black pepper to me, I said, sniffing and feeling an oncoming sneeze. Our room had nothing but cake batter and chocolate for food. There should have been nothing like that smell in here. We headed out through the door that led to the main warehouse area. Immediately, outside our door is an area that only had paintings, so it wasn't like some customer had been fiddling with an antique grinder with the remnants of old peppercorn still left over in it. I walked down the hallway a bit to check if maybe someone had been near us, someone who could have left such a strange scent. But it was empty, as the shop usually was. I then went back to dipping my chocolate, and Tom opened the back entrance to air out the pepper scent. Over the next weeks, we experienced several similar incidents, such as things disappearing and reappearing in places they should not be. Sudden freezing cold temperatures with no vents nearby. Random disembodied voices when no one else was around. The microwave door randomly swinging open. All of this I shrugged off. We actually just joked about it to the front desk worker usually always referring to it as the Haunted Bakery in jest. I finally had made enough money working for him that I was able to get a new car, as my old junker had failed me on Christmas Eve, when all the mechanics in my small town were closed on my way to a family function. The money and the ease of the job were surefire reasons for me to stay, despite the oddness. The incident that actually bothered me happened one day when I was carrying a bowl of melted chocolate over to my side of the table. Suddenly, it felt like a strong hand slapped the bowl straight down, causing it to smash into the ground. Startled, Tom whipped his head around, taking in the sights of chocolate and chunks of glass, now coating the walls and my legs. After a string of expletives about the cost of wasted product and equipment, it dawned on him that the look on my face and the sheer height the chocolate had been splattered up the wall gave him pause. It felt like someone slapped the bowl. I didn't just... I didn't drop it, I mumbled, stunned into silence by the shock. He nodded, realizing that the distance it would have fallen from my arm's height should not have been high enough to cause the Pyrex to shatter on the rubber floor mat like it had. <sighs> yeah... That really would have required way more force for that type of bowl to break like that, he said. I slowly nodded. I'd been trying to mentally chalk it up as only being a weird double arm simultaneous muscle twitch or something, but I was forced to behold the reality of how hard it had hit the ground as he said that out loud to me. As I cleaned up the mess, I pondered how this was the first physical interaction I'd felt from one of these supposed entities residing here. For the rest of the evening, I considered the history of the building as I bagged up the treats and labeled them, preparing them for their deliveries. It used to be an office building slash warehouse for Coca-Cola back in 1913, and now it rents space to a soapsmith, baker, painters, and the large open portion contains antiques. Any negative energy residue on the antiques, residual hatred of the cola workers, or passing demonic spirits could have been the result of this interaction. It was the first time in a while that I'd been genuinely shocked, but I was still able to brush it off as some muscle twitch in my arms. About a week after that incident, I began noticing a lot of changes in Tom. He'd always been a really laid-back guy, but he started getting increasingly more aggressive. He experienced very strong mood swings that nearly gave me whiplash. One day I would come to work and he would comment on how I was such a strong member of the team he was rewarding me with a dollar hourly raise randomly. And two days after that, 
He said I was useless, stupid, and a number of other words I'll leave to the profane imagination. A few days after that, he had brought me a case of root beer and Cool Ranch Doritos, which I'd mentioned in past conversations to have been my favorites of the snack world, and he said it was for his favorite and only employee. Another thing that worried me was the way he talked about one of his clients. This particular client was my previous employer at the place I'd met Tom. Although she was genuinely terrible, he would regularly talk about wanting to hurt her whenever they had to interact. He would call her even more horrible things than he called me that one time, and he would do it often. It had gotten to be so bad, I convinced him to terminate his contract with her so he didn't have to go on a whole rampage every time she failed to pay her percentage. His mood swings eventually got so bad, I suggested that we work in the kitchen at separate times. I began to wonder if he was having bouts of spiritual possession, or something along those lines, with how dark he could get. However, extremes on both ends of the happy or angry spectrum tend to disrupt a workflow, so he agreed that we would adjust our schedules. I started doing the baking, dipping, and packaging, and he would come later to package, clean the dishes and floors, and deliver the treats. This worked out for me, as I was a bit of a night owl anyway, and if I worked 12am to 8am, the treats would be fresh when the customers got them as the store opened. At first, all was going well with our new schedule, thanks to not having to deal with his mania, then negativity, cycles and I thought I could just peacefully listen to music and dip my cakes since I was alone. As it turned out, these spooks were about to get exponentially worse with the darkness. Walking down the hall to the bathroom one night, I heard whispering. Thinking how strange it was since it was like 2am and there would be no customers or employees in the whole facility, I thought, who could be talking? As I neared the bathroom, more and more voices started to raise the volume, speaking louder and louder until it sounded like 20 different people were all standing right in the hall with me, shouting in a horrible cacophony that made me cover my ears with my hands and run to the restroom. The walk back was a normal one, and disappointment filled me when I checked the parking lot for any other cars and found none but my own. The following days were filled with similar events, such as the faucet suddenly turning on full blast, the microwave door swinging open and closed, the lights flickering on and off, and objects being misplaced the moment my gaze was averted. I felt more annoyed than anything at this mischievous behavior and its inconveniences, but eventually I grew accustomed to my troublesome nuisance of a new co-worker that seemed to do everything in its power to make my job as bothersome as possible. I considered that someone should give this new employee a raise, assuming its job was to be as aggravating as it could. Again, it never managed to make me feel in mortal danger, except for the bowl incident. As such, I remained working there until the summer. Tom's sales became too low for him to employ me full time any longer. The potential possession situation to me seemed like negative and positive vibes floating through the ether, latching themselves onto an individual, and him being extremely receptive to them. If I had to give a definite answer to the cause of all the mischief, I felt most strongly that there was residual energy left over from the antique's previous owners, and maybe even some energy left from the previous workers, when it was a Coca-Cola office. It felt like some sort of childish ghost simply wanted attention and enjoyed throwing tantrums, rather than some sort of nightmare monster trying to kill me. Restless Entity in the Theater From Victor J. My entire life I've been involved in stage theater, in some capacity or another. My parents were both professors of theater education, so it was a family business, which I was brought into from as early as I can remember. I have a lot of good memories growing up of when I tried my hand as an actor and stage combatant, but no matter what I was doing or what theater I was working with, there was always a lingering feeling of eeriness within those walls. 
The cliché of haunted theaters or ghosts backstage is only as common as it is because of the very real experiences and accounts that stand as its foundation. I can personally attest to the validity of these kinds of hauntings from the very theater I work at now. The past four years I've been working backstage as a show run and rigging technician, and I've compiled all of the experiences I've had in that time with something unknown. I'll be the first to fully admit that your eyes will play tricks on you when working in the dark, but as my accounts go on, I find it harder and harder to explain why. My first memory of something strange happening was during the first show I worked here. I primarily worked on our rigging level, the top floor of the building where we could access our system to rig and fly set pieces and actors from a large opening over the stage. This level has one main entrance, as well as a tucked away back entrance, and there are only three technicians at most up there during the run of a show. All of this to say it's hard to miss if someone enters or leaves. During the day hours, we will have some traffic from other departments who have offices up there. But when a show is going on, there's only us techs up there. We also have a designated closet on this floor where we store our rigging equipment. The rigging room, as we call it, has a motion sensor light set up inside that we have to be very careful and aware of because accidentally turning it on during a show is insanely distracting to the audience when the bright light suddenly turns on. One of my first nights during a show, while myself and my two co-workers were busy moving a set piece on the other side of the floor, the light in the rigging room suddenly flicked on. We rushed over to turn it off, and we were surprised when no one was inside that room. None of us had seen anyone else enter or leave. It just seemingly turned on on its own. We turned the light off and left it at that. But ten minutes later, it happened again. The light came on while we were busy on the other side of the room, and no one had been upstairs with us to trigger it. I casually mentioned to the lead technician at the time it was probably just faulty wiring, but he started shaking his head at me. He'd worked for years before me at this theater and told me that with enough time, I'll begin to notice unexplained things happen. Sure enough, after some time, I did. Granted, with enough time, it became hard to ignore any strange happenings. The longer I worked there, the more intense things became, and I blame that on our lack of a ghost light. For those who may not know, it's theater superstition that you have to leave a single mounted light on stage after a show when everyone is gone for the night. The tradition may have started practically years ago to avoid accidents during midnight hours, but many in the theater industry believe in the importance of leaving a ghost light out to appease any theater spirits so they may leave the productions alone. Our main CEOs and producers, however, are very religious and refused to leave out a ghost light when the concept was brought up. So even though our theater is a nearly brand new building, theater ghosts seem to take up residence quickly and they were not happy that they weren't being catered to. It started small. One time, my coworkers and I were sitting around and talking during the downtime of a show. Out of nowhere, a stack of plastic cups by a water jug up and flew across the room as if someone had thrown them. We checked for any wayward gusts of AC, but we found nothing, and the second we stacked them all again, they were flung across the room almost immediately. We don't have cups up here anymore because of this, after about a year, I was promoted to full-time, and as a result, I had to stay after shows sometimes to help with repairs and touch-ups. I always hated this, because I would usually be one of the last people in the building, and yet I would always feel uneasy, like I was being watched while I worked. During one of our shows, there was a telegraph as part of a set piece that was flown in, Late at night when I stayed after the show to do some maintenance on props, the telegraph started tapping. The piece was not electric. It wasn't even wired to tap on its own. Instead, it only moved when it was actively being pushed by an actor. I don't know Morse code, 
so I'm not sure if the tapping was anything coherent. But regardless, I left very quickly afterward. A coworker told me a similar story about a prop phone that would ring without being plugged into anything. I asked if he ever picked it up, and he told me he'd rather die than attempt that. All of this activity started costing the theater a lot as it continued. We have a headset and comm system that we use to make show calls and talk across the building, and people started to hear things in the static. On more than one occasion, I heard my own name said when everyone else had left and I was still on the headset. It was a voice I didn't recognize either. Victor, Victor look, up, look up, was the most common one I heard. The first time I heard it, I thought it was a prank. I looked up, but nothing was there. And when I checked out at the PA desk, I was told that I was the last person in the building for the last half hour. Some of my friends and coworkers reported that they heard their names too when they were alone, and a few even said they heard screaming and threats. Our sound team blamed the comm system for being old, picking up things on other channels, but even after buying an entire new comm system and headsets, the voices continued. Only this time it was clearer to hear, since there wasn't as much static in the background. We replaced our security system a few times too, the camera in particular. Tools and sets will be moved around from day to day when no one is in the building, and every time they did, our backstage cameras would fritz out. Our camera monitors pointed on stage worked fine, but anything elsewhere would black out, often in the night. One day we came in to find every chair in the building, even from the upper floors, stacked in a pile in the pit under the stage. Our facilities manager blamed it on a nebulous group of kids breaking in to mess with us, and several times he had our cameras updated or switched to try and catch them in the act. But even those new cameras continued to have the same problems. A night watch position was even hired to guard entrances, but things would continue to move in the rooms they weren't in. And of course, no group of teens were ever caught coming near the building. Eventually, the higher-ups gave up, and we were just told to come into work early every day to put anything that moved back into place before starting. After about two years of me working there, things ramped up. There was a night after everyone else had cleared out, that me and a coworker were staying late to calibrate a light on stage level. While both of us were on stage, we heard a noise up on the catwalk above us. Our catwalk is made up of metal grating, and it sounded like someone wearing heavy boots was running up and down the walkways at a full sprint. Because of the grating, however, both of us could see through the catwalk and saw no one there. After the noise abruptly stopped, there was a laugh that began low and built up to almost a shriek from the same location. Myself and my coworker decided to calibrate the light during the day before the show tomorrow. A few nights after the running in the catwalk, while I was in a rigging harness during a show to set up one of our flying set pieces, I felt something tug at one of the ends of a strap around my leg. I was standing in an open area of our rigging level, riding on a checklist. This was a gentle tug at first, two times. Then before I could do anything, the strap pulled hard and quick. The force of it pulled me to one side, and the strap around my leg tightened so hard it started to cut off my blood circulation. Neither me nor my coworkers could loosen it by hand. Someone had to run to grab a harness key in order to relieve the pressure. Now, things reached a fever pitch when we started to see them. I saw two, and most of my coworkers had their own sightings. The first one I saw was during the after show hours. It was only me and the PA who doubled as security at the desk behind the stage door to the building. I'd finished the repairs asked of me, and I was checking out with the PA for the night. Behind the PA desk is a TV set up to live broadcast the onstage camera monitors. This is usually for run-of-show purposes so people can see what's happening at that specific point of the show. The camera itself is pointed on stage, but in order to account for the height of some set pieces, it's zoomed out enough that the first few rows of the audience are seen. That night, as I was checking out, 
I saw a figure standing in the audience. The feed was grainy enough that I couldn't make out any features besides long hair and a gray top. The figure was facing away from the camera, swaying from side to side, its arms by its sides. I pointed it out to the PA, who told me everyone else had checked out for the night. Thinking it might be a patron who had snuck past the front of house staff, the PA and I walked the entire building. All the doors and windows were locked, and there wasn't a person to be found. Granted, there are some areas we didn't check, but neither of us wanted to climb into the pit of the mannequin-riddled storage room to look. After making our rounds, we went back to the PA desk and looked at the TV. The figure had moved, this time standing and swaying center stage, now facing the camera. We decided to just leave and lock up. According to the facilities manager, nothing triggered the alarms that night. My personal final straw was when I was making my way down from the top floor to the PA desk at the end of the night. In order to move from level to level, I had to travel down a massive concrete stairwell. I was moving downstairs when I heard the laugh from the catwalk again. It echoed softly, the sound bouncing all around me in the stairwell. I hadn't heard anyone else with me before this, since footsteps carry loudly. So I leaned over the railing to see if I could see anyone on the stairs in the other levels. Seeing all the way down to the darkened stair entrance to the pit, I saw a face leaning over the railing, smiling up at me. Honestly, I get chills writing about it now. It had these big, unblinking eyes and a toothy smile that stretched farther than is natural. It had the same color hair as the figure from the PA TV. It opened its mouth, mid-smile, and laughed the same shrieking laugh I heard before. Quickly, I pulled myself back from leaning over the railing and immediately took the nearest exit out of the stairwell, regardless of what floor it spat me out at. I called the PA, and I refused to move until they came up to me and walked me down and out of the building. After that, I called my supervisor, and I took out all my PTO, which at the time was about two weeks. During my break from work, a coworker told me that one of the producers saw something in their office, the specifics of which I still haven't been told. But now we were told to set out a ghost light every night. When asked about why, the producer told us that since we were doing a historical fiction play at the time, it was out of respect for the victims of that event. But even after we closed that show, we were told to continue setting out the ghost light. Since then, neither myself nor my coworkers have really noticed anything. One friend swears one of the mannequins in storage moved its head towards him while he was down there. But we don't put much stock in it. It's even felt better to work, with a noticeable difference in feeling. I don't feel like I'm being watched anymore and I don't dread getting on the headset anymore. Reflecting on these last four years, I can only say that regardless of your thoughts or feelings on the paranormal, some superstitions are put in place for a reason. Listen to them. Be careful who you make friends with. From Anonymous. This event happened two years ago, while I was still in high school. I graduated in the year 2016, along with my best friend Monica. She used to be considered my best friend anyway. I remember when we were really close. Monica was a sweet girl, always encouraging me to try out in school events with my artistic talents and to become my best. We even shared the same beliefs, though she was Catholic and I wasn't. We were so close, I felt she would become one of those rare lifelong friends a lot of people have. I'll remember the day it happened for the rest of my life. It was supposed to be a normal shopping trip with my mom at our local Target, just to get some groceries and things that our family needed. I wasn't working at the time, I was only 15. But I earned weekly pay from my parents with chores and helping around the house, so I always looked forward to a trip to Target to spend my allowance money for whatever I wanted. 
As always, I reluctantly followed my mom to the Target store, cash in hand. We walked in, and I saw none other than Monica, working as a cashier in one of the aisles. She hadn't told me about her job, which was odd since we were the kind of friends that were very close. We told each other everything, I thought. Still, she gave me a big smile to greet me, as if she knew I was coming to the store that day. Without doing a double take, I just excitedly smiled and waved back. My mom and I walked around the store, looking at various items to decide what to buy. I picked out a favorite graphic t-shirt and some jewelry that piqued my interest. At some point during the shopping trip, the lights in the store began to flicker off. I could hear the shoppers going crazy and mumbling in confusion as to what was going on. This occurrence was the strangest ordeal to ever happen in a Target store alone, at least to me. Keep in mind, this was in the middle of the day, where the sun was still shining outside, no thunderstorms or anything of the like. At this point, my mom and I were in the back of the store, since our Target's girls' clothes and fashion section remained towards the back. Much of the light I could see when this event occurred was coming through the windows at the front of the store, where the sunshine was coming in. At that moment, I was flooded with panic. You know that eerie feeling you get when something unordinary happens amidst an ordinary day? And the last thing you think about is something even creepier happening. Anyway, this power outage seemed to last forever, when in actuality it was probably just 10 minutes. Still, it was scary not understanding why our entire surroundings went completely dark with no possible explanation, having to wait for something to happen in those surroundings. After a while, my mom and I calmed down, assuming this was just a glitch in the lighting system at the store, that their electricity was the one to blame. We were still at the back, just waiting, when suddenly I see what appeared to be Monica in the darkness, jogging at an almost steady sprint. When she passed me, however, she said in a quiet voice, I'll take care of it, don't worry almost as if she was deliberately saying it only to me. After she sprinted out of sight, the power in the entire store mysteriously came back on. My mom and I were relieved. We could continue shopping. Towards the end of the shopping trip, when we went to the cashier, I noticed something at the front that I hadn't before. They had a clearance jewelry rack featuring crystal necklaces. This was back when jewelry had that crystal phase first appearing in all stores. I saw a very vibrant and colorful blue crystal necklace hanging from that clearance rack, and I knew I had to have it. I absolutely loved crystals, and this was a must for me, especially on clearance. So I told my mom I was going out of line really quick so I could take a closer look at the necklace, possibly buy it since I had extra cash. Once I inspected the necklace closer, I noticed it had a black cross etched on the front of it, on the crystal part. I thought that was very appealing, and decided I would buy it for only $3. Once I took it off the rack, I saw none other than Monica walking towards me at full speed, almost sprinting in the same way she had before. But this time, she looked angry. The expression on her face never wore off. She looked especially teed off about something. She gave me the most menacing glare I've ever seen anyone make. This wasn't normal for Monica. It was something completely out of the twilight zone when she suddenly yelled at me, saying the exact words, What the heck do you think you're doing, you twat? She then snatched the necklace from me, breaking its crystal pendant with one swift motion onto the ground. I gasped as I watched the cheap necklace break into many blue shards on the floor. The cross design on the necklace now broken apart. At this, Monica's expression turned from a menacing glare to an almost insane grin with soulless eyes. She began to laugh hysterically out loud, but it sounded wrong, sounded unearthly. Her expression didn't look right. This wasn't the Monica I knew at all. She seemed almost demonic. The entire scenario felt demonic. After she laughed, she began to slander my personal beliefs, degrade my person with insult after insult right to my face, throwing in a slew of filthy language and profanity that I didn't even know existed. 
she said things to me like, Jesus went to hell and he's going to take you with him. And Lucifer is going to chop through your throat. She even began to call me and my family all kinds of names, telling us we were going to die of horrible diseases or of poisonous gases in our sleep, among many other filthy things. As a Christian, I was personally hurt deep down inside, not just by the religious-related comments, but by all of them. Seriously, this was so unlike Monica, so unlike any normal person. I truly believed that something had taken hold of her body, but I never could understand what. I was soon in tears. I watched her jump up and down in complete anger, her face turning red as she threw a tantrum. Suddenly, my mom grabbed hold of me, pulling me along with her as we left the store. I looked back one last time out of fear and curiosity. I watched other Target employees having to hold her back as she tried to chase after us. As they held her, she appeared to cry, threatening to murder me, specifically on the day of our graduation. My mother and I, not wanting to hear any more of that crap, rushed to our car and practically sped home. All I can say is that Monica and I never talked to each other once after this incident. It was like the best friend I once knew was dead to me and had changed into a completely different person, if she was a person at all. We would pass each other in school occasionally. She would give me a glance, but nothing other than that. The weird part about the aftermath was when she did have the chance to look at me. Once in a great while, she would give me close to the same glare that she gave me in that store. It was truly strange. And about the lights going off in the store, I feel that wasn't a mere coincidence. All in the same day, all in the same hour, there's just no way. It was like the power going out was a shift into something. I'm 19 now, still alive past my graduation, luckily. All I can say is the day of our graduation went smoothly. No dangerous happenings for Monica. Maybe the thing inside of her just wanted me to be scared. Wanted to put me down for whatever reason. It brings me to tears to mention all this again. There are crazy individuals out there in the world. Some of them might be your closest friend. The phrase, trust no one, has an entirely new level to me. Whispering Demon From It's Your Boy Todd When I was about nine, my family decided to get rid of the carpet in most of our home. So my parents had to send us to live temporarily with my aunt and uncle for a few weeks to get us out of the way. I was excited to be away from home for so long, pretending like I lived in a different house. Nothing was wrong with our home, I was just a weird kid, I guess. There lived my three cousins, the youngest, Mary, being a year older than me. I was going to stay in her room. In the other room was her two older brothers, Tim and Jake, who shared a room. My little brother Jay was still a baby, so he was staying in my aunt and uncle's room in his crib. I was excited to have a two-week-long sleepover with my favorite cousin. Little did I know, it would be one of the most prominent ghost encounters I would ever have. I've always been sensitive to the paranormal. I was raised around pagan beliefs and Wiccan practices. Nothing super crazy, just cleansing and simple candle magic kinds of things. My point is, I was aware of the supernatural even at that age. My first few days there were completely normal. I didn't sense anything. There were times in the night I would get scared of the dark, feel unease at the quietness of the room. But I was a nine-year-old with ADHD. It didn't really ring any alarm bells for me. The third night was when that thing decided to start toying with me. Anytime I was close to falling asleep, I would hear a psst from my cousin's closet. Afraid, I pulled my blanket up over my head to protect myself, and eventually I would fall asleep. The next morning, I didn't feel a presence like I did the night before, probably because I was distracted by the smell of pancakes, so I quickly forgot about the ordeal, until night fell again. 
because the same thing happened, only a little louder. Psst. This time I decided to wake my cousin up, but she refused to wake up. No matter how hard I shook her, yelled at her, nothing. I even slapped her at one point. Afraid if I tried again, she might wake up and punch me, I decided to leave her alone after that. I slumped back on the pull-out bed and brought my knees to my chest. I scanned the dark room for a sign of anything, praying that I would find nothing out of the ordinary. I then kept my eyes locked onto her closet, watching for movement. My ears rang with the silence as I focused on any tiny noise. As I mentioned before, I have ADHD, so the silence wasn't something I liked. It felt like a loud, ringing dog whistle scraping at my ears and brain. The room got darker. I know that eyes just do that sometimes, especially when the dark doesn't allow the brain to register details. But my nine-year-old brain thought I was going crazy. I don't know if it was just my eyes being weird or the spirit messing with me, but either way, I was terrified. Eventually, I would fall asleep once more. The bright protection of the sun brought me peace, but soon that wouldn't stop whatever had been messing with me. Things of mine began to go missing. At first, I thought it was my own negligence. I was a very forgetful kid, but when things like a hairbrush, which I knew I sat on the sink, went missing just a few hours after I'd done so, I started to ask my older cousins if they were messing with me. They swore they weren't, but the boys were known to mess with their sister in the same way, so my aunt got involved. After ransacking their room like a prison guard, she found nothing. She suggested I must have put it away and didn't remember. Being the airhead I was, I just accepted that as a possibility. I would also hear my name being called by my aunt and uncle, but when I asked them about this, they would tell me they never called for me. Same with my cousins. I soon became irritable. I begged my aunt to let me and my cousins sleep downstairs on the couch, maybe play a movie for background noise, but she refused my request. I held back tears as I huffed my blanket and pillow back to my cousin's room. My cousin asked why I was so upset, calling me a baby. My cousins liked to bully me for being scared of the dark, so I didn't tell her why. I simply said I don't like the quiet. Just sing a song in your head till you fall asleep, she said, trying to comfort me. We set my bed up and she crawled into hers. We talked for a little while until she stopped answering me. I peeked over at the closet. The silence enveloped the room, and the ringing was back. I put my pillow over my head, singing a Hannah Montana song in my head. The chorus repeated over and over. I couldn't sleep for what felt like hours. Tears stung my eyes as I started to hear the psst again. My back was to the rest of the room. My spine felt this intense presence around me. It was as if it was right behind me. Somehow I knew it was smiling wide and evil. Soon my quiet cries lulled me to sleep in a dehydrated exhaustion. But quickly my slumber was snatched away as I felt the blanket being slowly pulled off of me, slipping off my legs and falling onto the floor. Horrified, I yanked it back up without moving the pillow from my head. I pulled the blanket all the way up to my shoulder. This would repeat throughout the night, never pulling very hard, but just enough to wake me up so that I would notice. Eventually, I woke up in the morning, my blanket and pillow on the floor next to me. I tried to pass it off as just me moving in my sleep, but I couldn't shake the feeling that that wasn't the case. Over the next few days, the same things would happen. My things would go missing. Messes I didn't make would appear. At one point, my aunt gave my brother to me to hold while she went to the bathroom. My cousin and I had been playing in her room. My baby brother immediately began to squirm in my arms and push me away. He started to cry and say things like, don't like it, and go, go, which was his way of telling me he wanted to leave. 
I couldn't just let him go, so I decided to pick him up and leave the room. I thought his problem was being held, or my aunt no longer being with him, but the moment I left that room, he calmed down and rested his head on my shoulder. I looked back at the room, suddenly feeling the weight of unease. My face must have looked horrified because my cousin asked if I was okay. I told her, nothing's wrong, I'm just staring, sorry. Later, my aunt told my cousin and I to clean her room because of the mess we made when playing. She told my cousin that her room had better be spotless by dinner. That gave us about 40 minutes or so. We'd barely finished shoving toys in her closet when her mom called us down. Later, we were downstairs watching TV with my uncle when Tim, the middle child, told us we were so dead. Mary and I looked at each other and quickly made our way upstairs to a toy crime scene in Mary's room. Her mom had her hands on her hips with fury on her face. I told you to clean this room, she yelled. We did, right? Mary turned to me to confirm. I nodded. Then what is this? My aunt gestured with both hands all around the room. It was then I noticed what really happened. Everything from the closet had been thrown out. Toys were even broken or smashed. Jake and Tim did this. We really did clean the room. My cousins were all little monsters, so my aunt didn't know what to believe. Tired, my aunt just sighed and stepped over the mess. Just clean it, she said. My cousin sucked through her teeth and angrily threw her toys back in the closet. I stared at it. I had a sick feeling that the boys did not do any of this. I felt eyes staring at me. The dark corner the room's light didn't touch peered back at me, pulling me. We finished cleaning the room again and we got ready for bed. I dreaded the awful moment when my aunt turned off the light and shut the door. Before she left, I found the courage to ask her to close the closet. She laughed a little and slid it shut. I knew that meant nothing, but it gave nine-year-old me some peace for a little bit. She shut the door and blew kisses at us. My cousin and I did our nightly routine talking session before she knocked out for the night. Then I did my routine, which was to stare daggers at that closet until I drifted off to sleep. To my surprise, I slept pretty soundly for a few hours. Then I woke up to the sound of naked feet smacking against the wooden floor outside the door. It sounded as if a child was running up and down the hallway. Sometimes it sounded like the child stood in front of the door and just stomped in place. This would go on for a while. Mary, I'd whisper harshly. Mary, I repeated. Just like before, Mary did not wake up. Eventually, I fell asleep, until yet again I felt that presence behind me. That spidey sense you get when someone is in the room, but times ten. The hairs on my neck stood up as I heard the door handle creak, the door swinging open slowly. I was faced away from it, terrified to turn around or open my eyes. I could feel whatever it was creeping closer to me. Suddenly, I felt a small hand on my shoulder. I instantly turned, smacking the body behind me as hard as I could. Unfortunately, I had just smacked my baby brother. His face scrunched up, his mouth opened, and he began to wail. I gasped and immediately took him into my arms. I'm so sorry, I tightened my hug. I thought you were a ghost. What's happening? Mary groggily asked, waking up. Jay got out of his crib. I'm going to go put him back. Mary gave a noise of acknowledgement and I picked up Jay. I took him to the bathroom to check his face. He was fine, just dramatic. I sighed with relief. I stared at him as he sniffed. Are you okay? I asked. He nodded and opened his arms, asking to be picked up. I complied and carried him across the hallway that overlooked the living room. A few windows illuminated the house with moonlight. I tried sticking to the lighter spots of the hallway. Slowly, I opened my aunt's door, suddenly realizing it was completely closed. 
Before I opened it, I whispered, How did you get out? To my brother. Sadly, my brother had a hard time with words. He was in speech therapy. He didn't really know how to answer me. All he said was, Bed. It was too vague to try and guess what that meant, so I just entered the room, sneaking past my aunt and uncle, heading over to the crib. It was there I realized he had gathered his pillows to climb over the crib and onto my aunt and uncle's bed. At that point, I wasn't sure if anything of that night was really paranormal. My brother was known for making escape acts, and the sounds of feet could have been him. Then again, he had been wearing a onesie that night, which covered his feet. And the crib was in the corner of the room, not next to the bed, but they could have moved it closer. I don't know for sure. My last few nights were the same. Things would move in the room. I heard knocks and bumps, and of course the infamous psst. But my last night was the worst. Whatever it was, it would not let me sleep at all. Anytime I tried, things would happen. My blanket would get tugged. I would get poked. I felt as if bugs were crawling all over me at one point. The worst of it all was when nothing happened, because I knew then it was just waiting for me to fall asleep to do something. Sometimes I would see shadows pass the light under the door. One time, it looked like someone bit down to look under the door. When the sky became blue again, I thanked the gods, because that meant in a few short hours, my mom would come to save me from this horrid place. I closed my eyes, hoping this meant the thing would stop messing with me. I drifted off once more. The ringing silence enveloped my ears, the light hum of the air conditioner blowing down on us. Then in the darkest part of the room came the worst noise I will never forget. Jordan. A quick and grungy whisper in my ear, my name. It spoke my name directly to me. I kept my eyes tightly closed, my heart beating out of my chest. I could almost see what it looked like. Always that smile, that wide, skin-cracking smile. I spent my last few hours of the night under my blanket, fighting to keep it over my head as the blanket was tugged a few times. Eventually, my cousin woke up, stepping over me to go to the bathroom. It was morning enough for the sun to be above the mountains. I thanked the gods once more, and accidentally fell asleep under the blanket. I woke up to my mom in the room, smiling at me, telling me it was time to go. I launched out of the bed, hugging her. Let's go, I yelled. I grabbed my bag and stuffed my things in it. Suddenly I felt dizzy, my body jerking up. I looked around. It was my cousin's room. Dark. I was sitting on that pull-out bed. I looked over at her Hello Kitty clock. It read 12.47 a.m. I'll never forget the time. I flopped back onto the pillow and sobbed into it. None of that was real. I decided to force myself to stay awake. I got bored like any kid, and I snuck downstairs. I turned on the TV and kept it at a low volume. Of course, I ended up falling asleep on the couch. My uncle woke me up as he was leaving for work. He asked what I was doing up so early. I couldn't sleep. I got scared, I said, trying to win some sympathy points for having the TV on all night. He smiled and patted my head. All right, just keep it down. Then he left for work. I ended up pinching myself to make sure I was actually awake this time. For the remainder of the morning, it was pretty calm and normal. The family woke up one by one, grabbing their own breakfasts. My mom eventually came to come pick me up, and I couldn't leave fast enough. Honestly, I was a bit messed up for a while, thinking I was dreaming when I wasn't, that I was going to wake up in that room again. Luckily, that wasn't the case. Who knows, maybe I'm still in that room nine years old, being tormented by my cousin's closet demon. A Night in a Haunted House From Pleasant Peasant This story isn't mine, but my teacher's father's. 
He truly believes it is a demonic encounter, and I do as well. This man, who we'll call Dave, lived in California and loved baseball. On the first day of school that year, Dave noticed that there was a new and shy kid standing by himself. Dave was a 15-year-old student at the time and decided to be nice to him. He walked up and asked, Hey, you like baseball? He had noticed that the kid, named Ed, was wearing a faded Orioles cap. Dave described Ed as looking sickly, having shadows under his baggy eyes and pale skin. Ed said yes, and they went on to play baseball after school. Dave noticed that Ed was always asking him and other people if he could come over to spend the night or come over to have dinner. This intrigued him. After months of playing baseball after school with Ed, Dave asked him, Hey, why are you afraid to go home? He was thinking that maybe his dad beat him or something along those lines. Ed replied, Promise you won't laugh at me, but my house is haunted. My mom's a flight attendant and my dad is in the Marines, so they're rarely home. Dave, being a 15-year-old male who was living in the 60s watching Creature Double Features, asked, Can I come spend the night? Ed agreed to him coming over the following night, which was a Friday. After baseball the next day, Dave and Ed walked to Ed's house. It was an old and massive house that was originally a plantation house. Dave described it as looking like a house from a typical horror film. After they went inside, Dave looked in the living room, seeing lots of Bibles, crucifixes, and prayer candles next to a couch. Dave asked, Am I sleeping here? Ed said, No, I sleep here. You can sleep on the floor or in my bedroom, which is upstairs. Dave wanted to sleep upstairs in an actual bed. Now, Ed had apparently gotten to be a very good cook, and while they were eating dinner, Dave met Ed's dog, Bruno. He asked, Where does Bruno sleep? Upstairs. I wish he wouldn't. After dinner, Ed showed Dave the stairs, and Dave asked, Why don't you ever go upstairs? Ed answered, I just don't. This was the first time he seemed annoyed with Dave. As Dave began to walk up the stairs, he thought he heard Ed chanting behind him, and then realized he was praying. He didn't think too much more of it as he saw Ed's room and beyond that a second set of stairs leading to the attic behind a very old door. He remembered thinking, if there's a demon in this house, it's got to be in there. Ed's room was like an octagon with a bed in the middle and Bruno's bed was next to it. Dave went on to bed. He woke up sometime in the night to hear Bruno softly, half growling, half whining. He also noticed the bedroom door was cracked open, which he thought was strange as he had closed it. He got up to close it and looked at the attic door. It was slowly banging against the latch. He brushed it off as perhaps a draft. As Dave closed the door again, he checked to make sure it was definitely shut. It was also a little colder in the room, but that wasn't surprising as it was the start of spring and an old house, probably with poor insulation, didn't stay heated too well. Dave went to bed a second time. This time again, he woke up when Bruno jumped into the bed with him. He was surprised to feel just how cold Bruno was, as well as the room around them. Bruno was shivering. The door to the room was wide open now. Thinking that Ed might be playing a trick on him, he looked all around the room and concluded that there was nowhere to hide. As he got up to close the door once more, he could see his own breath. It had gotten that cold. He also heard the attic door swinging against its latch harder this time. Dave went to bed for a third time. Once more he woke up, not to Bruno though, but to the cold. He guessed it must have been 30 degrees Fahrenheit, when the low at the time was supposed to be about 42 degrees. He heard the attic door now slamming against its hinges, a bang, bang, bang until the door finally burst open. Dave could hear footsteps coming from the attic, and scarier, 
It sounded like chains rattling. He heard something walk past his door, then stop at the top of the stairs, not going down. It was now near 20 degrees and Dave was freezing cold. He began to look around the room, noticing a big humanoid shadow in one of the corners of the room. It wasn't there before. He threw the covers over his head as we all do, because everyone knows that demons can't get you under the blankets. He was holding Bruno into his chest now, beginning a prayer. He'd been on the fence about his faith until then. He realized that if demons were real, so was God. Dave found peace in his prayer. Even though he could feel it getting colder and colder, which meant the shadow was getting closer, for some strange reason he fell asleep then, for the fourth and final time. When Dave woke up, the sun was rising. He grabbed his things and ran downstairs to find Ed, already awake making coffee. He turned around with a sad expression on his face. You believe me now? Ed moved out of that house later that year. Afterwards, it seemed to always be up for sale and would become the house that teenagers would dare each other to touch the doorknob of. One day, Dave drove by that house with some friends and said, I slept in that house one night. His friends replied, no you didn't. Dave never argued past that because it wasn't worth it. Two years after Ed moved out, the house was torn down and a couple of apartments were built there. Dave drove by those apartments once with my teacher, who was his son, and saw a shadow person standing just outside one of them. That specific complex was being renovated at the time, so no lights were on. This scared Dave enough to never come back. I stared death in the eyes. From Anonymous. This happened 13 years ago. I was 33, living alone in Montana. I am a hunter, like my father and his father, so I've had my experiences with animals. On the morning in question, I planned to go on a camping trip by myself. The spot I'd planned to go to was deep into the woods at a remote campsite. I drank a mug of coffee, packed my bags, and grabbed my belt which had a 500 Magnum in its holster. I called my brother and asked him to come pick up my dog and take her back to his place. Then I was on my way. Nothing much happened on the drive there, although when I got to the trail, everything was silent. I assumed it was because I just pulled in, so I continued to the path. The entire hike, I never heard a bird, a bug, or even the rustling of branches. It was all just silence. After around two hours of this, I was officially on edge. I kept my hand on my gun, because honestly, I felt as if I was being stalked by some kind of predator. After three hours of my hike, I came to the campsite. As I was setting up my tent, the sounds of nature resumed, and I felt relieved. To say this campsite was beautiful would be an understatement. It was on a ridge overlooking the small town I lived in. I threw my bag in the tent, and I began to unpack. Suddenly, all at once, everything went silent again. It wasn't quiet for long. The silence was soon broken by the sounds of the trees knocking against each other in the wind. I set up my sleeping bag, and when I left the tent, I took a can of beans out of my food bag, then put the rest in a tree. That's when I heard a twig snap around 20 feet into the woods. I turned around, my hand on my gun, and watched the forest. Still and unmoving, I saw nothing. I sighed and shrugged my shoulders, trying to relieve some tension. As I tried to start a fire to cook my food, I heard rustling, followed by frantic but massive footsteps. I pulled out my gun and once again I turned around. The iron sights were aimed at the center mass of what I can only describe 
was a demon. What I was looking at had the legs and horns of a goat and stood on two feet. It had a brown, hairy body and human-looking arms, but I swear, its face was like that of a kangaroo, and its eyes emanated pure malice. It inched closer to me from the woods, and I fired a shot into the air, trying to scare it. In response to that, the creature screamed, sounding more like a fox, a deer's mating call, and the most painful, blood-curdling human scream I'd ever heard, all mixed into one. I blinked, and the thing was soon right in front of me. Its snout was nearly touching me. Those yellow, almost lizard-like eyes were stabbing right into my soul. I felt that if I moved, it would kill me. I don't know how. It was this feeling that dominated me. I slowed my breathing, and as I did, the creature pushed me to the ground. Without breaking eye contact, I jumped back up and stood there. It came up to me again and screamed. This scream seemed to shake the entire forest. In response, I threw my hands up and screamed back. It just kept staring at me, toying with me. I put my gun directly to its throat and screamed again, Back off! It still stood there, so I pulled the trigger. As my ears rang, I screamed again, and I watched the creature run back into the woods. I began to quickly pack up my things, and whenever I looked up, I saw it, staring at me, now from a distance. This terrifying thing followed me down the path all the way to my motorcycle. I sped out of there, at least going 30 miles per hour over the speed limit. I heard it scream one last time as I got onto the main road that leads to the town I live in. To be truthful with you, something in me wants me to go back. I want to see if I can kill that thing, hang its head on my mantle. But I do not think it would end well. Now I've got a wife and two kids, and I can't afford to just throw my life away hunting some forest demon. Encounter with a Demon from Conky Joe 89 I was 26 years old when this happened. This was not my first graveyard shift job, but it was the only one where I worked alone, and it will certainly be the last one I ever work. Now, I don't mind the location being shared, and honestly, I encourage the sharing of the locale, as I'm always interested in hearing stories from my home state of Texas, and I'm especially curious as to whether anyone else has experienced anything like this, whether it be the particular thing I encountered, or whether just under similar circumstances. Let me just say up front, I was not under the influence of any drugs, nor had I been drinking. If I'm going to be 100% forthcoming, the reason I wound up living and working where I did was that I just completed a detox and subsequent residential stay in a drug treatment program. So funnily enough, you could say I was as sober as possible. Definitely not one of the better times in my life, but we live and learn, right? Anyway, enough of my background and babbling. On to what I saw, whatever it was. I worked the graveyard shift as the maintenance man at a huge retirement community located in the town of Temple, Texas, near the end of 2015. I clocked in at 7 p.m. and clocked out at 6 a.m. The old folks didn't have to be out of what I'll call the community building and back into their own individual apartments until 9 p.m. So there would be about a two-hour window when I showed up where the community building would have a lot of friendly older people hanging around. They'd be playing cards, chatting, exercising, that type of stuff. Couldn't be a more warm and inviting vibe, honestly. And then, like clockwork, there would be a change in energy. I'll never forget when I first became aware of it, because every shift after that, as the clock crept closer to 9pm, an uneasy feeling of dread and anticipation would set in on me. It was so heavy and palpable. 
I knew that soon I'd be isolated in that huge and quiet building, all alone. Or at least it would appear that way. There was something going on in that building. There were windows lining the entirety of the building. They looked out onto the parking lot outside, and the building was set up in a sort of U-shape, or a horseshoe, so that from one hall you could look across the parking lot and see the other hallway that made up the other half of this U. I would constantly see someone, or something, walking along the corridors on whatever side of the building I wasn't on. It was just strange at first. I kept thinking, nah, surely it's just the blinds parted in a certain way, or no, it's just because I'm moving over here that it appears something over there is moving too. I was never successful in actually physically spotting this figure, even though on the majority of time I would see it and attempt to rush over. There was quite literally nowhere for anyone to hide or anywhere for them to go except back down the hall and past me. But I would never find anyone, only serving to further my suspicions that there was something very off going on within this place. Not necessarily anything evil or threatening, just off. Seeing as how this wasn't really a business establishment, it was more a set of communal buildings as I said before, the employees, both daytime and nights, graveyard duties, didn't really have a proper break room, as it were. So we would all use the refrigerator and the coffee prep station that was really meant for the older folks to utilize when they were having breakfast or getting snacks over the course of the day. I cannot count the number of times I'd feel like having a quick pick-me-up coffee, or maybe a complimentary carrot cake slice or three, and when rounding the corner beside the coffee and the fridge area, a nurse from the hospice wing would either already be there or would also be rounding the corner from their side of the complex, scaring the absolute crap out of me. Just imagine it's been something like five or six hours into your shift and you haven't seen or heard a single person, voice, or anything, except that sort of phantom-like figure, the one you can never seem to truly locate. And suddenly, boom, there's someone not even two feet away from you, totally unexpected. Those nurses probably thought I was a very odd dude, given that every time they saw me, it would be me rounding a corner into the break area and almost having a sheer heart attack at the sight of them. Now, I'm absolutely certain I came off as the more than capable, competent, and unshakable overnight maintenance man that the community of older folks needed to keep their homes up and running all night without fail or issues arising. But as things tend to do over the weeks and months that followed, I grew accustomed to just expecting someone to be in that break area, at least once or twice over my long, dragging shift. So it eased my tensions, if only slightly. Well, that newfound sense of being able to let my guard down, and not constantly being a walking bundle of nerves, all came to an end one night when I was in what I called the dead end. Ironic, really. It was the side of the U where the hallway ended in an office, a gym room, and a physical therapy room. The other side of the U had a door that led to still more rooms and areas, so over there it felt, I don't know, less claustrophobic and isolated. But the dead end, it had an energy about it. You would always feel like something was at your back, watching, brooding. The worst part was having to run a vacuum down there because you constantly felt the need to spin around and check your back, because you couldn't rely on sounds to alert you. Well, one day I was cleaning up the dead end. Other than that creepy feeling, it was going fairly normal. But then, something odd caught my eye. Through the window, out towards the rear parking lot, there was a dimly lit sidewalk lining the building that led around to a separate, employee-only parking lot in the back. And leaning around the corner of that wall, just barely illuminated by the lamppost, which it was gripping and almost trying to conceal itself with, was a very tall, slender, half-physical, half-apparition, and very demonic-looking figure. This figure stood about eight feet tall. Well, I say stood, but as you looked toward the feet, it just sort of faded away. It didn't become whole or solid looking until about the upper thigh, the lower waist area, where it was cloaked in a garment that was tattered and thin, open in the front, revealing emaciated looking ribs. Its arms were extremely long and thin, and it didn't seem to have five fingers on its hands. Instead, there were maybe three or four. 
but it didn't have normal human hands. They were oversized, and where the fingers should have started, the flesh of this thing's hands seemed to sort of erupt into massive bone-like claws. I use the word erupt because where the claws jutted out from the hands, it's as if that flesh was newly injured, like it had just intentionally unsheathed these claws from within its hands. Yeah, think Wolverine from the X-Men type vibes. It was disgusting, and I'm pretty sure I could definitely see trickling streams of blood cascading from these claws onto the cement below. Perched atop a skinny neck was a skull-like head, sort of like cattle, but on top of its head were massive horns like a buck's. The thing simply stood there, watching me. I could feel its gaze bore into me. I was overwhelmed with nausea and dread. It sounded kind of extreme, but the only way I could describe it was that it felt like happiness was suddenly rendered a foreign concept to me. I felt as if I could never be happy again, like I had never actually been happy before. Just sad that I was leading a wasted life, that I would one day have a death that no one would mourn or even notice. It was like while I had my eyes on this thing, there was only me and it. Almost like for those few seconds, it and I stood outside of normal time or something. When I finally snapped to my senses, I literally ran away. I'm not ashamed to admit it, I ran my rear off. My heart was leaping into my throat. As I said before, as far as I know, all that thing did was stay there, creepily observing me. I assume it was watching me, even as I fled. From that day on, I started cleaning the dead end while there were still residents hanging about, so that hopefully, I would never be put in that position again. I wouldn't last but probably a few more months at that place anyway. Then I was out of there. I'd had enough. I never did encounter that entity again, but that one time was more than enough for me. I was working in constant fear and anxiety that I would see it again, and I dreaded that the next time I saw it, it would be from a not so safe distance. What I saw there stuck with me. I definitely think that the fact that there was a hospice hallway on the opposite side of the same building, where we'd lose at least one person every couple of weeks or so, played a large part in attracting this entity to the location. Perhaps it was to feed on the negative energy associated with death or the dying, to feed off the feeling of hopelessness those poor people assuredly felt as they knew their life was slipping away from them. I often get unnerved even recanting this experience to anyone. This isn't the only paranormal experience I've had, far from it, but this was easily one of the most unsettling ones. The Demon in My Dreams From Chaotica I'll begin by saying that, for context, my family was never particularly religious when I grew up despite living smack dab in the middle of the South. Heck, I can honestly say the most religious thing we'd ever done was be forced to go to a highly televised church in my home city because my granny loved the cloud of it all and not because she actually wanted to worship respectfully, which I know now to be true, but everything involving that whole wrong situation is an entirely different story. So this took place around two years ago, as of writing this. It was pre-Rona, during a time my mental state and relationship with my parents wasn't all that great. Lots of arguments, emotional abuse, negative energy, just bad mojo all around. And to top it all off, a good friend of mine at the time and a man I'd gone out on a couple dates with had taken his own life. The entire situation was just absolutely devastating, and my soul just felt utterly dragged down with the weight of grief and pain. Eventually, I began to have these dreams, god-awful dreams, and whereas few of them I can remember everything that happened, the one thing that's universal is as follows. The room, or whatever the setting would be, would progressively turn darker. All my dreams, of course, are in first-person perspective, so it was like the weird dark haze would start to encroach my vision, but worse, the entire room would go dark, kind of like that one scene in Lord of the Rings, 
where Gandalf gets mad at Bilbo for accusing him of trying to steal the ring, and everything suddenly darkens. That's the best comparison I can really give, but in my dream it was darker and heavier. Next, I would begin to feel this gross, icy, heavy feeling welling up in my stomach along with utter terror, even if I wasn't seeing anything other than the darkness and nothing had happened yet. It was like I just knew something was about to go down, and my body was bracing itself. Third, if there were people present in my dream before, when the darkness came, they would all suddenly disappear, or all of a sudden, in the blink of an eye, they'd all be staring at me with utterly blank, dead expressions. Happening one time in a bad dream is enough, but this happened every single time without fail. If they didn't disappear, they'd be staring me down. And lastly, the feeling would come. It's really hard to describe this, so please bear with me. If you've ever had a limb fall asleep on you, and you get that weird pin and needle sensation, it's kind of like that, but worse, and it progressively gets heavier. Heavy like something is grabbing me, enveloping me into a bear hug, just crushing me, sometimes even focusing on my throat and strangling me. This feeling is accompanied by abject terror, darkness, and then often this roaring loud static in my head, like TV static and cicada song mixed together. It makes it hard to think, impossible to speak, and absolutely impossible to fight against it physically. This goes on until eventually I'm able to break free and force myself to wake up. But the terror doesn't always end there. Sometimes I'd lie awake for like an hour or two, unable to go back to sleep. Because even if I tried, the dream would pick up right where it left off, and whatever it was that was doing that to me would just do it again, rinse and repeat. Anyway, it was 2020. I ended up cutting ties with my parents, going through several bad living situations and life changes that I won't go into detail about. I ended up living with my best friend, who owns a small cabin in the middle of the country. Let's call her HC. This friend is extremely religious, and all around just a wonderful, amazing human being. I slept upstairs in the tiny loft of her cabin on a small twin-sized mattress. One night, while HC was gone babysitting overnight, as she did for another friend, I was alone in the cabin, trying to rest. It had been over a month since I'd last had one of those dreams, so not thinking anything of it, I went to bed that night pretty easily. Normally, there's something of a delay in my dreams, but this time it was like sitting down in a movie theater, suddenly a part with all the action and zero context is played in front of you at max volume. So, in the dream, I vividly remember stumbling out of the cabin, jumping inside of my jeep and driving full speed down the darkened back roads where we lived, nearly flying off the road at several points, but either way, I was hauling it while frantically calling HC on my phone. I told her nervously I was driving myself to the hospital, for whatever reason, and that I didn't feel good, and that something terrible was about to happen. She wanted to know what was wrong, but her voice started to cut out, only to be replaced with this deep, guttural, growling voice. It hissed indistinct words into my ear, and it didn't even sound like it was coming from the phone. It sounded like it was coming from behind me. I looked to the dash mirror, but then the darkness part of the dream came, along with the headlights of my jeep suddenly cutting off, and I couldn't turn them back on. It was beginning to envelop my vision. By then, I could practically feel my heart in my throat, and the terror part was in full force. But then, for the first time in any of my dreams, I felt something new. A huge hand weaved through my hair on the back of my head, easily big enough for what felt like the bottom of its palm to rest on the back of my head near the nape of my neck, but its fingers still reached my forehead. I could even feel claws lightly scraping at the skin of my forehead. This hand was suddenly grabbing a fistful of my hair at the base of my scalp, jerking my head violently back to where I was pressed hard against the seat of the car. While it held me there, the growling got louder and louder, along with this crushing feeling. It was more intense than it had ever been before, and I was so scared that I was silently screaming, my mouth wide open but no sound coming out. Whatever this was, I knew it absolutely hated me. With every fiber of its being, it wanted me to know that. Suddenly, I remembered something that H.C. had told me when I told her about these dreams. She taught me the Lord's Prayer, 
and to call out for God to send the Holy Spirit and Saint Michael down to protect me. I had never done this before that moment. I remember practically screaming in my mind for God to help me and to save me, promising that if he would help me beat this thing and make it go away, I would believe in him forever. Well, as soon as I cried out to God, the grip on my hair began to loosen. Little by little, it was like this thing was letting me go, but slowly, reluctantly, the tingling feeling in my stomach and ringing in my ears was beginning to fade. Then, at last, I was completely awake. However, the feeling was still there. I quickly sat up, looking over towards the loft stairs and window, and I saw it for the first time ever. I saw it outside my dreams. I saw that darned thing in real life. There's no light pollution in the cabin. Our nearest neighbor was at least half a mile away from us, and mind you, I'm on the second floor. So I knew that those two red eyes staring at me from the chimney window, they belonged to that thing. They were huge slashes of red, but the entire eyeball, whites and all, were red too and while I couldn't see any other defining features other than the malformed head, the fact that this was the second story window, and there were no trees, no AC unit, nothing for it to stand on, said it all. Whatever it was, it had to have been over eight feet tall to use that window to peer in at me. I called HC immediately, and I begged her to stay on the phone with me while I recounted the entire dream to her and what happened. It was 3 a.m., and thankfully her friend was home, so HC could get on her way back. She had me put her on speakerphone as she prayed loudly for me, and she even had me burn some white sage. Soon, the tense, dark feeling in the cabin was gone. By the time she got home, everything was perfectly normal. After that night, I began to go to church with HC. I would regularly pray with her, start reading the Bible, create my own personal prayer to say before bed every night. Now, as long as I say the prayer, the dreams have stopped. I haven't seen that thing or felt its presence ever since. My life has really started looking up as well, and I moved into a new apartment on my own, though I still keep in touch with HC, and I still pray every night. I know some people will probably call me crazy for this or tell me that I can't possibly believe that that thing was a demon. But all I have to say to that is that when you're actually facing something evil, something that wants you to know what it is, and that it wants nothing more than to hurt you greatly, you just know. Room with the Red Door From Lavro R. This story happened to me two years ago. I had just finished high school, and my parents insisted I go to college. I spent the whole summer looking for a suitable college, but didn't find one. Under the pressure of my parents, I enrolled in a random college in a city near my town. As I expected, I didn't find it appealing, and soon after I dropped out. Understandably, my parents were angry with me, telling me that either I go to college or I get a temporary job. My friend, Leonard, with whom I was really close, enrolled in a college that was far from our home city. Logically, with him deeply involved in his studies, we started to talk less. With Leonard gone and my parents constantly breathing down my neck, I decided to get a job. I didn't really know where to start, but my mother knew a family friend called Miles, who had a company called Certus Surveillances. It's a small company that primarily deals with the installation of video surveillance at various places. As a big tech nerd, I instantly got interested in that. I had my mom call him the very next day. Honestly, I didn't expect much, but surprisingly, the next day, my mother said that she managed to get me an interview with Miles. Miles used to live in my town, but eventually he moved to the city nearby. For business, I guess. A few days passed and I drove myself to his house. It was a short ride, maybe 30 minutes and when I arrived, he was already waiting for me in front of his house. As I was parking, I noticed a video camera on every corner of the place. A little bit ironic, I thought. I got out of my car, and he invited me into the house. Miles was a very talkative person, which can't be said for me. 
I am more of an introvert and rarely speak a lot. Personally, I love just hearing people's stories. Miles' house was pretty big, and you could easily get lost in it. So naturally, I stayed close to him, and he led me into his office. He told me to sit down and wait for him, because he had to get some papers for me to sign. His office looked very organized, clean, and it had a lot of pictures of his family members. But what really got my attention was the red door behind his desk. Naturally, I was a bit curious, but I tried not to think about it. At the moment, Miles and his wife, Rebecca, entered the room. Rebecca handed me the paperwork, then left. Miles said that he talked to my mother about me leaving college. Oh God, more judgment, I thought. But surprisingly, Miles was understanding. He explained to me that he too dropped out of college. He said he completely understood. People sometimes don't know what they want. He asked me a little bit about my previous job experience, which I didn't really have. I've worked at a local supermarket, but that was only for one summer. After our conversation, he said to me that the only thing left was for me to sign the papers, and I could start work tomorrow. That was easy, I thought, as I took the papers and signed. One last thing, he added. You see that door behind me? Under no circumstances are you allowed to enter that room. Not even peek through the keyhole. You got it? I was a bit confused, but I quickly agreed. I got home pretty late that night. I was really tired. I took a quick shower and laid down in bed. Despite my exhaustion, I couldn't fall asleep very easily. I started wondering about that red door and the room behind it. I mean, what could be in there that he doesn't want me to see? A lot of money? After a long while, sleep overtook me. The next few weeks were pretty normal. I would come to his house at 7 a.m., and he would drive us to our job locations with his little van. On the road to our job locations, we would have some time to talk. In the beginning, it was a little awkward, because I didn't know what to talk about with him. He would bring up sports, but I didn't like sports. He would also offer me his chocolate from time to time. You see, Miles was diabetic, so he could only eat sugar-free chocolate. And surprisingly, I enjoyed it. I soon even preferred it over a normal one. At one point, I was wondering, so I asked him why he named his company Certus Surveillances. And he explained to me that Certus means safe, that he wants to send people a message that with his video surveillance systems, they'll be safe. My tasks when we arrived at the job were pretty simple. I would carry the tools, the cables, and other gadgets for miles. Also, I assisted him when he was installing the cameras. After the installation, I would pick up the stuff, and we'd be done. It's not the hardest job out there. Every day after work, we would come to his office, so I could pick up my stuff and go home. And every day, I would stare at that red door. My interest in it grew. A couple of months passed, and nothing really happened. But then one day after work, Miles led me into his office, and just as we entered it, his wife called him downstairs. He left me alone in his office. I began picking up my things to leave, but then I got a strange feeling. I don't know how to explain it, but I got chills all over my body. I felt as if I was being drawn to that red door, like someone or something wanted me to open it. I let go of my stuff and walked over to the door. This time, I put my ear on the door, trying to hear movement inside. I knew I didn't have much time before Miles parked the van and came back to the office, so I was ready to let it go and leave when I felt air on my cheek coming out of the keyhole. Did he leave a window open in there? I thought. I took my ear off the door and decided to peek again. That was a decision I would regret for the rest of my life. Just as I looked through the keyhole, I saw a set of snow-white teeth smiling at me. I froze for a moment. I was so shocked, so terrified, I just couldn't move. Then I felt a rush of adrenaline. My heart started beating so fast I was sure it would pop out of my chest. I took my things and I ran as fast as I could. I nearly fell down the stairs as I ran down from the office. 
I was so creeped out, I didn't even say goodbye to Miles. When I got home, I felt like I was going to throw up and just couldn't stop shaking. It took me some time to calm down, but I couldn't stop thinking about what I saw through that keyhole. Was that really a person in there? Or maybe something else? I wondered. The next day, I didn't go to work. I called Miles and said I had the flu. Until that moment, in my eyes, Miles was a great boss and a good friend. But now I was starting to wonder, did he have some sort of dark secret? Eventually, when I came back to work, I decided to ask him more about the room behind the red door. I began the conversation with comments about his office, how I liked his organization, and I liked the pictures of his family on the wall. He didn't seem annoyed at my questions, so I continued with them. So, uh, that red door, was it there when you bought the house, or? As soon as I asked that, his smile disappeared. He looked at me dead serious and told me, We don't talk about that room, kid. I just looked down at my coffee and didn't say a word. The rest of the day was pretty uneventful. I got home a little earlier, so I decided to look into Miles. I couldn't find much about him. He seemed like a normal guy, nothing criminal, nothing shady. After that, I started looking for missing person reports in the area. I was thinking maybe he kidnapped somebody, but eventually I gave up because I couldn't find anything. A couple of days passed and nothing really happened until one day. Miles and I drove up to his home and he got a call. It was his son's trainer. His son had apparently broke his hand at football training and needed Miles to drive him to the hospital. Miles quickly explained the situation to me, saying, You know where the keys are, okay? After he left, I knew this was my one and only chance to find out what was happening behind that red door. I entered his office, carefully approaching the red door. Then I slowly started to open it, only to realize it was locked. I should have known, I thought. I spent a good ten minutes finding the key, but long story short, it was in the bottom drawer of his desk. After I unlocked the door, I tried opening it again. And it opened. As I entered the room, it was dimly lit, so I couldn't see much. So I turned the flashlight on my phone on. I started to look around the room. I saw a bunch of weird-looking symbols first. I didn't recognize any of them. They looked ancient. In the middle of the room was a stand with some kind of book. I came closer to it, starting to read it. Like the symbols, I couldn't understand a thing. So I put the book down but then I saw something behind the book stand. A bowl. I picked it up and noticed it was full of some kind of red fluid. At first, I was confused until I realized the bowl I was now holding in my hands was full of blood. My legs started to shake, and my heart began to beat very fast. Slowly, I put the bowl back down, and as I turned... I noticed a big pentagram drawn with blood on the wall next to me. At that moment, the red door through which I had entered the room suddenly closed. I quickly rushed to it and tried to open it, but I couldn't. It felt like somebody locked them up. I started to panic, hyperventilating. I even thought about calling the police. Then I felt it again. That strange feeling I felt when I first saw those white teeth. I turned my back and looked behind me. There it was, a strange shadowy figure in the corner of the room. As I looked at it, it smiled at me with those white teeth. I just froze. I didn't know what to do. I felt like I was going to pass out. I was so scared I began to hit the door, trying to get it open. As that dark figure began to approach me, I hit the door so hard it finally gave. I quickly shut the door behind me, locking it again with the key. I was covered in sweat. I couldn't believe what I saw. Was that a demon? What about the blood? The book? The freaking pentagram on the wall? Some kind of demon ritual? I put the key back in the drawer where I found it, and I quickly left Miles' house. 
When I made it back home, I was still trembling. At that moment, I heard my phone ringing. It was Miles. Maybe he noticed I was in the room, I thought. Hey, kid. You left your jacket in my office. I sighed with relief. Thanks, Miles. I'll pick it up tomorrow, I told him. As I hung up the phone, I felt instantly better. But now I was left with a new problem. I didn't know what to do. I thought about calling the police or just telling someone, but eventually, I stayed quiet. I thought people wouldn't believe me, that they would call me crazy. I worked with Miles another month, then I left. I spent my summer after that catching up with Leonard, and I even told him this story, but obviously he had his doubts about it. I don't know what I saw that day, or what's even going on in that room, but one thing is sure. I'll never forget those snow-white teeth. Don't Invite Them In from MJ Thom 1 I'm a 56-year-old woman, married with four grown children, two dogs, and five cats. I'm living a decent, comfortable life now, but when this happened to me, I was 43. My husband was 44, my daughter 23, and her boyfriend 22. We all lived in a half-double. My best friend, who was 53, and her boyfriend lived right across the street, along with six other mutual friends. Their house was a half-double too, with the wall removed to create a whole big house. I'm explaining this because I want you to know how hectic it was within our two households. We were always over at each other's houses every day, partying non-stop. Each day when the guys went to work, my friend and I would drink our coffee in the morning, then switch to beer for the remainder of the day. When the guys came home, they would join us, and we would carry on into the night. We also indulged in some other substances. This was our daily routine. One night, my husband and my daughter went to pick up a friend of hers, so I was home alone. Everyone else was across the street. I decided to take the time to clean my room and listen to some CDs on my portable DVD player. As I'm humming along, the lights dimmed, and I heard this sort of static. I noticed the static was coming from my DVD player. I went to check it out, and the static bursts from it again. Only this time, I hear something deeper in it, like a voice, a low voice. I was startled. I was all alone, buzzed, and now scared. I checked the cord, trying to find the cause, and I even put in a DVD to see if maybe it was the CD I was playing. But it made that sound again with the voice. I couldn't understand what it said, but I knew it was saying something. My dresser was sat against the wall, and my bed was about three feet from it, with a headboard against an adjacent wall. When I heard that voice in static, I jumped up and turned to run out of my room. When I noticed that stretched out from the dresser drawer to the bed, I kid you not, was one of my lingerie teddies, as if someone was standing there holding it out in front of them. I froze, trying to comprehend what I was looking at. I continued to run out of my room, hoping I didn't fall down the stairs like they do in movies. I managed to get across the street, dragging my friend to my house and into my room. She was freaking out. She wasn't sure what she was about to see. I told her I needed someone else to witness this with me, and I didn't want to be left alone with that image in my head. As I studied the look on her face, wondering if she saw it, she proceeded to lift her leg and kick the teddy to the floor. That answered my question. We were both discussing what happened. We knew something was in there. I knew it would be useless to tell my husband because he didn't believe in that kind of stuff. Over the next couple of days, I could not sleep. I kept hearing unnatural noises. I swear they were meant for my ears alone because no one else ever heard anything. There were grunts, belches, the sound of someone passing gas, rumbling, squeaks, none of which were rats or mice or pets. One night, sitting on the floor while my husband was sleeping on the couch right behind me, my name was spoken directly into my ear. My heart basically stopped. Again, no one heard it but me. Then it graduated to visual torment. Every room I walked into, 
the lights would dim. Not flicker, but dim, like a shadow would simply stop over my head. I saw movement from the corner of my eye and red glowing light behind furniture. Even the plastic grocery bags had been made into sculptures of swans sitting on the shelves. One day I was outside looking up at the second floor window when I saw the curtains twisting around over and over like someone was caught up in them. But nobody was there and no one else saw it, so I guess that was for my eyes only. I was eventually afraid to sleep. I couldn't be in the dark. I did as many drugs as I could that would keep me awake. Because of the shadows hanging over my head, I would have to have my husband stand guard at the bathroom door, with the door open so I could shower. I simply could not be alone. Then there came the flies. Cliché, right? Well, it happened. Our half-double had a dingy, dank, dark cement brick and stone basement that was the creepiest place ever. We made old hubby put a lock on that bad boy. The basement was divided weirdly into a few different rooms, creating a sort of tunnel on through to the other half of the double. One of the cubbies had some baby stuff being stored. We happened to notice there were flies, about 10 to 20 of them, flopping around that particular area. Bumble flies, that's what I called them because they were as big as bumblebees. We would kill them and there would be more every day. Soon, I had my last straw. We were cleaning out our garage and wouldn't you know it, in the rafters we found a freaking satanic bible. Another cliche, I guess. I thought, nope, not in my house. I don't mess with demons or the devil or any other cultist stuff. I was convinced that our drinking, drug use and partying had opened a door and me and all our friends unknowingly invited that evil torment. It was trying to drive me crazy. We built a fire in our fire pit out back, ripping out the pages and burning them. Now I gotta tell you, they burned, but weirdly. They sort of glowed. The embers of the ash stayed glowing, even floating in the air way too long before burning out and falling to the ground. I swear I thought it was gonna float up to the roof and burn my house down. When we threw the last page in, the cover, it burned, and it burned good. But what we saw next was enough to make us get our house blessed. The cover of that book had an outline of the devil on it, in shadow against a red background. That page floated up into the air on fire, then burned out, leaving the literal glow of that same outline of the devil. This time, not just me, but all of us were frozen and freaked out. I called my sister. She's not ordained or professional or anything like that, but she does have her faith. She's a very devout Christian and studies the Bible, so I was satisfied with having her help. We went from room to room saying specific prayers to shoo the devil or demons away. I'm not sure if it worked, but at the very least it gave me some confidence that God was here. Even if the devil was here too, God was keeping him at bay. It took me a long while to be able to turn off the lights when I slept, and still I use the TV for a nightlight. I've since quit drinking and doing drugs. I'm convinced that when you alter your mind, you weaken the walls that keep out evil, and that evil wants to destroy us. Demons in the Day From Anonymous Throughout my career as a nurse, I've had my share of frightening, intense, and even unexplainable experiences. I've worked in oncology, med surge, nursing homes, and hospice, and with each specialty comes its own unique joys and challenges. My most terrifying experience occurred at my first ever healthcare job, home health. Before I was an RN, I worked as a home health aide my agency would send me to different houses to help the elderly residents with things like bathing, dressing, toileting, food prep, cleaning, and other activities of daily living. I enjoyed it a great deal. Usually, I had good relationships with my clients and their families. But then, I met Ruth. Ruth was an elderly lady in her late 70s. She had extremely limited capability to live by herself due to her numerous lower extremity wounds and large size. She was well over 400 pounds 
and could barely walk around her small bungalow-style house, making a 12-hour home health aid a must. On top of that, she was monumentally unpleasant. When things did not go exactly the way she wanted, she had the tendency to scream and throw an angry tantrum at whoever was nearby. To give you a sense of what it was like to be in that house with her abysmal attitude, I'll tell you that once she called a refrigerator repairman because the ice cubes in her freezer stuck to each other in a large bin she kept them in. I tried to explain to her, sometimes ice cubes do that when you pop them out of their trays and put them all together. Yet she still insisted that the freezer must be broken. When the very nice repairman came by and quickly found nothing wrong, she shooed him out of the house angrily with very harsh words. I showed him out, quickly stepping outside to apologize for Ruth's behavior. He was very kind about it, telling me not to worry. As I came back inside, Ruth was standing in the living room staring daggers at me. What do you think you're doing? She demanded. I tried to explain I was just showing him out when she interrupted me to go on a tirade about how I should never talk to anyone without her nearby, that I should never let anyone else in the house. She went on and on until she violently locked the deadbolt. Eight years later, I still think about that day whenever I pop ice cubes out of an ice tray. My manager at the agency began to assign me several shifts a week at Ruth's house, then more and more until eventually I was her only aide. The agency was all out of options, since either the aides that worked with her would quit or Ruth would get angry and fire them. Being a naturally cheerful person and a bit of a pushover, I was the only one Ruth liked, and so I helped her, enduring her endless requests, and at times her verbal abuse, day to day from 7am to 7pm. Between cares, she sat in her recliner chair in the den with her cat. I would sit on the front living room couch with an earshot until she needed something. It was during one of those in-between times, in that terrible angry house, that I experienced something I will never forget. While sitting on the couch watching TV, I began to nod off a bit. It was the middle of the day, and even though Ruth was probably also asleep, I knew I should try to stay awake since I was still on the clock. Even so, the couch was comfortable and the sounds of the TV were lulling me to sleep. Suddenly, I jolted awake. At first, I was embarrassed I'd fallen asleep at work, but soon I realized I had much bigger problems. I attempted to sit up, but my body would not listen to me. I was frozen on the couch. I tried to get up again, but to no avail. Desperately, I tried to move my legs, my toes, wiggle my fingers, anything. But once again, nothing happened. I felt heavy, stuck, like I couldn't breathe. I began to panic. I looked around the room, seeing the front door to my right, the furniture in the room, the doorway to the den, the bedrooms on my left. All of it was the same as before I had fallen asleep. It was like no time had passed, and I was just suddenly paralyzed. At that moment, I noticed Ruth's old cat walking up to me. Without warning, she began to frantically scratch at my head and face with her claws, digging in and tearing at my hair and eyes. Horrified, I tried to scream, but no sound escaped my lips. For what seemed like ages, I lay there frozen, unable to breathe, unable to scream, unable to tear this bloodthirsty cat off of me. But suddenly, I bolted upright, the first thing I did was take in a huge gulp of air. I took some deep breaths and tried to process what had just happened. I looked behind me, and the cat was nowhere to be seen. In fact, she was napping in the next room over with Ruth, who was also sleeping. I moved my arms, then my legs, never more grateful to be able to do so. 
I felt my face and hair, finding no scratches at all. Had I dreamt the whole thing? Surely not, my dreams have never been so vivid and painful. I remembered every detail of that house during the encounter in perfect order. The layout, the furniture, the time of day, it was all the same. After calming down a bit, I rationalized the whole thing as a crazy dream, and I tried to shrug it off and go on with my day. I might have lived the rest of my life thinking it was a dream if it hadn't happened to me again. A couple of weeks later, after a particularly contentious day with Ruth, I was sitting in the front living room again when my eyes began to feel heavy. I fought sleep for a short while until finally I gave in to a quick nap. At least, that's what I told myself. Just like last time, I was suddenly jolted awake to find myself paralyzed, frozen in place on that couch. I wiggled all my fingers and toes, desperately trying to snap out of it the way I had the first time, but nothing happened. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't move, couldn't scream. I was terrified. The room seemed to darken, and my eyes roamed wildly around the room, afraid of the imminent appearance of the cat. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw the front door beginning to creak open. I knew for a fact it had been locked before and deadbolted, since Ruth was very strict about these kinds of things. I watched in alarm as a dark, shadowy figure entered the living room and seemed to float in slow motion across the floor. This figure had no distinguishable features, but it had the vague impression of a tall man, perhaps with a hat, maybe even a long trench coat. Even though it was a bright summer afternoon, the figure seemed to bring a darkness with it that made it hard to see and all the more terrifying. I watched, helpless, as the shadow slowly made its way across the room, from the front door, past the end of the couch, through the door on the left, into the bedrooms. All the while, my whole body screamed at me to do something, to get up, to yell, anything. But all I could do was lie there, in fear, miraculously, a thought came into my head, and I cried, Jesus, help, Jesus me. help me. At once, I could move again. I sat up, and convinced that someone had broken into the house, I began to search the rooms for the figure I had seen. There was no one to be found, and when I checked the front door, it was locked and bolted just how I'd left it. Again, I told myself it was all just a bad dream. I promised myself never to fall asleep on the job again, and I haven't. In later years, I researched my experience, and I believe I may have had some sort of sleep paralysis. I've had a few more instances since then of waking suddenly, unable to move or speak, but I've never hallucinated nor seen anything unnatural during those times. Perhaps the thing I saw at Ruth's house was simply a hallucination, a product of my mind in the grip of sleep paralysis. Or maybe the anger and bitterness of that woman's house enticed some sort of dark energy to haunt its occupants. I may never know what truly happened those years ago, but I will certainly never forget it. My Brother and the Thing From Romeo Chick 94 There were many different creepy things that occurred around my little brother. His nickname was Time. Let's start off by first stating our mother was very cruel. If you've ever read or heard of a book called A Child Called It, that pretty much sums up how our mother treated us. She had eight kids, but for some reason, she only treated time and myself like garbage. Probably because we share the same dad, while the others had a different dad. At a very early age, time would panic every time the sun started to go down. We used to have to stay in the unfinished garage. No windows, no AC, no heat. 
we shared a bunk bed with very crappy mattresses. Time is four years younger than myself, and he was very terrified of the dark. One night, my mother had locked us in the garage for the next three or four days. She was upset because I stole food from the kitchen to feed Time and me, since she didn't allow us to eat with the rest of the family. I stole those zebra cake snack cakes. She hadn't fed us in a couple of days, and we were starving. We normally had a bucket to use the bathroom in, and a gallon jug of water, and that was it. That night, I heard Time sniffling as Mom locked the door on us. I jumped down from the top bunk to look at him. Are you okay? It's only for a couple of days. I I'm sorry. I shouldn't have taken those snack cakes, I said softly. He just shook his head. He didn't really talk much. Mostly, he spoke in broken sign language. He made the sign for a cookie, which threw me off but I hopped up into my bunk and grabbed the two Oreos I had for him every night. I'd stolen a pack a while back, and they were getting stale now, but I always made sure he had some. I handed the two to him, and he smiled. He always took his time when he ate them. I went over to hop back into bed, but I noticed him staring at the garage door. What is it? I asked. His eyes widened, and he shook his head. No, he whimpered. Then he made the sign for scared. I walked back over and hugged him. It's okay, I'm not going to let mom hurt you, I promised. I always made sure to make her more mad at me so she didn't hurt him. No, he said. Then he made the sign for monster. I blinked a few times and replied, there's no monsters, remember? No such thing. Yoshi cleared them all out. You see, Time loved Yoshi from the Mario games. Every time he got scared, I told him that Yoshi himself would protect him. It worked for almost everything. But just then, something smacked hard against the garage door, making us both jump. No, yelled Time. It's back. It was probably just a bird. Birds get confused when it gets dark out, I told him. It did happen often. Normally, it was the window in the living room, but they could easily hit the garage door as well. Time shook his head. No, it comes at night, every night. He was starting to scare me, too. What was he talking about? I lay down on the floor next to his bunk. Okay, I'll sleep right here so nothing can get you. He threw a pillow down to me which brought a smile to my face. We were always there for each other. I reached over and turned off the dying lamp that sat on the floor. It barely had light to it, but it was better than nothing at all. Pretty soon I could hear time whimpering again. I grabbed our emergency flashlight which I hid under his bunk, and I turned it on. It was dim normally, but if clicked twice, it had a bright strip of light down the side to light up the whole garage. I sat it on the floor, sitting up so the whole room glowed. A shiver ran down my spine. Why is it so cold tonight? It's July, I asked, pulling my quilt down from the top bunk. I glanced at time, who was now focused on the far corner of the garage. What is it? But I was cut off by a loud boom. Seconds later, from the direction of the door, our mother called down. Quiet down there, was basically what she said. That boom had not come from my mother's direction, so it wasn't her. Now I was frightened. There was no way it could have been a bird either. Hungry. Time said, sitting straight up in his bunk. I know, buddy. I'll get us some food once Mom takes her sleepy meds. No, he's hungry. This stopped me dead. Who? Was all that came out. Time stared at the garage door. He wants in. This panicked me. 
Never had I felt so scared before. I hopped up and shone the light over to the garage. Nothing was in the room with us, but I could see something moving around by the crack of the door. Then another boom. It tried to open the door. That's why I could see out of the door now. The metal lock had stopped it, but the door was old and the lock was old too. It was coming undone. This didn't look good. I thought it was probably a homeless man trying to get in. I looked back at my little brother and put my finger to my lips. He nodded and understanding. I pulled a little pocket knife my dad had given me out. If he stuck his fingers through the door crack, I was going to cut him. My heart pounded in my ears, but I knew if I told our mother, she would just punish us worse, calling us liars. I really didn't even think about telling her at the time. Then, I heard this weird screeching noise as I edged closer to the door. A lump stuck in my throat. What could make a sound like that? A raccoon? That idea made me feel a bit better, but something in my gut said whatever was on the other side was dangerous. I looked over to the lock. I noticed a roll of duct tape next to it. That could help. Quickly and quietly, I pulled a piece of duct tape from it. It was way louder than I expected it to be. I froze as I heard whatever was on the other side run or hop to the other end of the door. Had I scared it? I ripped more duct tape off, sticking it around the lock. I'm not sure if it would help at all, but it did make me feel a bit better. Then, what sounded like nails on a chalkboard rang out. This lasted for what felt like ages, but was probably less than a minute. Time squeaked, but buried his head in the blanket to stifle it. I ran back over to my brother and I hopped into the bunk with him. What was that? I said as softly as I could. Time grabbed the flashlight and turned it off. Monster, he said. Why'd you turn the light off? I asked, a bit alarmed. He shrugged. He don't like it, he replied. Then he signed, angry. I didn't know what to think. How do you know that? I asked. He didn't answer for a while, but soon he said to me, talks to me every night. This really freaked me out. What does he say to you? Time fumbled with the flashlight. Once in, he finally said, then he pointed to himself. At first I thought he meant inside the garage, but then it hit me. Is it a demon or a ghost? I asked, my body shaking all over. He shrugged and simply said, Monster. A monster wanted my brother. These words echoed through my head. Curiosity took hold of me. Have you seen it? What does it look like? He turned the flashlight on dim so I could see him better. He signed, Scary, Tall nasty. We really didn't know sign language entirely, so a lot of what he signed was broken. There was no way this was happening. Bang, bang, it hit the garage again. I was hoping mom had taken her sleep meds and passed out already, or we'd be in bigger trouble if we survived this. Time grabbed my arm, and I looked back at him. He whimpered. In, monster, trying... I didn't know what to do, so we just sat there, hoping it wouldn't get in. I must have passed out, because when I opened my eyes, light was starting to poke in through the garage door. Time was still asleep. I softly got out of bed and went to the door to the house. I used my pocket knife to slip the lock open and peeked out. It was still very early. Everyone was still asleep and our stepdad must already be at work. I crept out and went straight for the front door first. I held my breath as I slowly opened the door and peered out. Nothing was there. I closed the door behind me as I walked over to the garage. 
There were a bunch of dents in the door, and now I knew why. Tears ran down my face. It was real. That wasn't even the worst of it. On the ground next to the door were huge footprints. These looked like dinosaur footprints. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Four-toed, giant, dinosaur-like footprints. What even was I looking at, I wondered. I had never seen anything like it. I remembered from Jurassic Park how the T-Rex's prints were, and these reminded me of that. Not exact, but it was the closest thing I could think of. There's no way a dinosaur just tried to get into our garage, though, right? I shook my head at the idea. This wasn't possible. The strange sounds it made, how it talked to time, this was something way strange. I quickly went back inside and into the kitchen, stealing some food that wouldn't be missed like I always had to do. I would take baggies and fill them with cereal, cookies, or whatever was open that wouldn't be noticeable. Then I ran back to the garage. Putting the lock back was the trickier part, but within minutes I had gotten it. I woke up time and gave him some food. He smiled and ate happily. After a few minutes, he asked me, Monster, gone? I nodded. Yes, it went away. How many times has it been here? I asked. All those dents weren't from last night alone. There was no way. He paused a moment, swallowed his food, and held up his hand, showing me five fingers. Five times? In a row, or... He held up three fingers. Last night makes three in a row. A shiver ran down my spine. What was this thing? And why did it want my brother? The Demon That Follows Me From Anonymous I lived in a very small town in the middle of Germany when I was growing up. Since my grandmother lived just one town over, I often took the bus or my bike to go visit her. She had a dog, a Doberman, and she had an elderly neighbor who also had a dog, a Bernese mountain dog named Odin. Odin was a sweetheart and loved to be pet by anyone walking by. Unlike my grandmother's dog, who only wanted affection from the people she knew. I knew Odin's owner. The two of us were big football fans, which is pretty uncommon in those parts of Germany, since everyone there is such a country nut. He was a friendly guy and even paid me to walk Odin sometimes. One evening, I was walking up from the bus stop to my grandma's house. Since it was the middle of December, it was already dark out, and freezing, even at 6 p.m. I was walking with my head down listening to music and doing my best not to let my hand freeze off as I smoked a cigarette. Now, the road my grandmother lives on is dark, barely a streetlight in sight, but it never bothered me. Unfortunately, this also meant that when I was walking, listening to thrash metal and looking down, I was scared to death when a shadow jumped at the fence Luckily for me, it was just Odin, wanting some attention. Oh, hey boy, you scared me. Who's a good boy? I said, taking off my headphones and petting the little rascal. He was happy that night, wagging his tail back and forth as he tried to lick my hand. I stepped closer to the fence and put the cigarette into my mouth so I could pet him with both hands. I did that for a little while, enjoying the warm touch of his fluffy fur on my frozen hands but then Odin suddenly stopped wagging his tail. He began to growl and show his teeth. What's wrong, boy? I asked. Obviously, the dog did not respond. That's when I noticed he was not growling at me, but behind me. I froze in my position and stared into the mirror-like reflection of a yard decoration nearby. I watched as a darker-than-the-night figure moved closer from the other side of the street behind me. Odin then began to bark, snapping me out of my trance. Instead of running to the next house, 
I jumped over the fence to get behind Odin. That's when I saw this incredibly dark thing standing in the middle of the street. No, it was darker than dark. It had no discernible features other than the way two long arms and incredibly sharp teeth, which nearly made it look as if it was grinning. Out of nowhere, my grandmother's Doberman, Luna, came running, jumping the fence with ease and lunging at the dark figure. Odin followed suit, and they barked at the thing like crazy. I couldn't scream, though. I could do nothing but watch while grabbing the cross around my neck. I started to mumble a prayer, one for protection of everything evil, praying and asking the archangels and God and everyone for help. Right away it appeared that this thing did not like me praying. It swatted the dogs out of its way and made its way over to me in large strides. I turned and began to run, not interrupting the prayer, but just screaming louder. I was yanked back by my hair, landing on the ground, the air forced out of my lungs. I watched as the darkness stood over me, grinning. I closed my eyes, and as soon as I could breathe again, I felt two hands wrap around my throat. I just barely finished whimpering that prayer, and I kept my eyes closed. But suddenly I felt two wet noses against my face. I opened my eyes and saw the thankfully unharmed two dogs. I awkwardly hugged them both and pet them for another ten minutes. Then I just left and stayed the night at my grandma's house. I have no idea what that thing was. A demon, perhaps. A demon that wanted me dead. I'm just happy those dogs were there, trying to protect me. Sadly, Odin's owner died not long after the event. They said he just stopped breathing in his sleep. I'm not sure if I can believe that, though. I ended up adopting Odin back then. There were a couple of times where Odin would stare out the patio door. Occasionally, he would sleep in front of my door, even though he always slept in bed with me. Other times, he'd curl up next to me and would be staring at the door when I went to sleep and when I woke up. Animals are sensitive to the supernatural, more than us humans are. But I was also so freaked out by that experience that now, even five years later, I still have a cross hanging above my bedroom and entryway door. Poor Odin died about a half a year ago. It seems like he was my lucky charm all this time, because nowadays I feel watched no matter where I go. When Odin was still around, we had moved to the US two years back, and I wasn't bothered by anything creepy. Now, though, I can't stop seeing things, things that seem to hide in the dark. Plagued by a Demon Child in the Attic From Marshall Lawless About eight years ago, I moved to New Jersey from Flagler Beach, Florida. The change of pace and scenery was nice. I even met half my family that I never knew for the first 20 years of my life. It felt like a great way to find out more about myself through meeting brothers and sisters I'd never known before. Funnily enough, my oldest sister had a home, and my younger brother and sister had moved in with her the year before. So previously growing up the only boy in the family, I was happy to meet my brother and see our common interests. It was odd to say the least, moving from a beach to a small mountainside town close to Vernon called Franklin. It was an old mining town. In fact, my sister's house was a miner's home. There's still old mining equipment in the basement. They repurposed the attic into a room my brother and I could share, which was awesome. I quickly enjoyed being there. I liked the cooler weather, and hiking past waterfalls was pretty fun. Now, I would have intense dreams sometimes. I would lucid dream quite often, and sometimes I would come out of them into sleep paralysis. This was nothing new to me. But what was new was what happened one particular night. I was drifting off to sleep when I felt a hand glide over my back, and as if on cue, I felt myself leave my body. 
This was new territory for me. It felt as if I was there, but not, if that makes sense. I felt as if I was nothing more than a ball of mass. I could see my own body. The world around me seemed almost darker, like the light was being drawn into itself, and darkness was more prominent in the world I was seeing. The first few times I experienced this, I can honestly say it was cool. It felt like a lucid dream, but more difficult to control. But eventually I was able to go anywhere, and I can't tell you how amazing the feeling of flying over the world like Superman was. But everything came to a crazy end. After a few months of living there, the dreams began coming more frequently. When it started, it was once a week. Now it was almost every night. These dreams of being pulled out of my body would leave me feeling drained every morning. It felt as if I hadn't slept at all. And coming out of it was just like my lucid dreaming. I would be in a state of sleep paralysis. Now, from where I slept, I could see down the stairs. On a certain occasion, I woke up from such a dream. When I looked towards the stairs, I saw a young child crawling up the steps on all fours. He kept going until he crept up on the side of my bed. At first, I thought it was just some side effects of my body feeling drained and the waking dream sleep paralysis working in tandem. I was sure that my mind was just showing me things randomly. But there he was, the more and more I felt awake, far more real than some hallucination. He was just staring, and then he began to laugh. Eventually, I fell back to sleep. The morning after this bad experience, my brother asked me if I was doing okay. He noticed I was quiet. To be honest, it felt as if I was no longer happy. My soul felt drained, like a battery left completely empty. But I felt confident talking to him. He was my only brother. So I told him every detail of my experiences. When I was done, he looked at me like I told him I had cancer. He ran down the stairs all the way to the basement, then came back a bit later with a joint and an old book. He tells me to smoke up before we take a trip into the book. I ask him about the book. It was an old photo album from the first homeowner. He had a family, and in that family he had two sons. In the photo, I saw that freaking kid, the one I'd seen last night, creeping and crawling by my bed. Turns out, that son went to take his dad lunch, and he ended up slipping in the snow, falling down a nearby mine shaft, landing 30 feet below. He didn't die there, though. They got him home, apparently. Unfortunately, the local doctor could not help. He died in this very house in the room below us. To make matters worse, the mother killed herself in the house shortly after, and the father ended up dying in the mines. It was a big tragedy for the community back then. My brother and I had a bad idea. We grabbed a Ouija board. We tried to communicate with the spirits of the family, but we didn't have any luck at first. As night came, my brother said he would stay up and watch me. However, nothing happened. I got good rest, no astral projection or lucid dreams, and I finally felt rested when I woke up. It went on like that for a couple of weeks. Not long after that, my brother went away with his girlfriend to go skiing for the week. I had almost forgotten about the whole thing until I came home one day, laid down, and I felt that same hand gently going down my back and once again, I left my body. This time, when I looked at the world around me, it was almost completely void of light. I could barely control my senses. I felt so trapped. Then I see the boy. He's crawling up the steps as if he'd been waiting for this moment to find me alone. I hear him laughing as he starts to take these claw hands and scratching them down my back. I see those claws ripping into my body. I feel it in every way. He then speaks, his voice like a mix of a child's and some growling animal. I remember clearly what he said to this day. It's so hard to find people to play with. That's when I wake up. I'm in sleep paralysis again. I then notice that I can't see anything, and I realize that my shirt is over my head. 
I begin to fight to move again to pull it off of me, and eventually I can. But when I look around, something's not right. The world is still very dark, like I'm still in the other world. I get up and turn the light on, but it doesn't work. Then I see the light in the staircase strobing in and out, but then I see it. The child, appearing more like a horned demon in the dark, crawling upside down on the ceiling as the light flickers on then off. It's still laughing. Suddenly I'm paralyzed again, the shirt over my head. I'm lying down once more, as if I'd woke up again. I repeat this over and over. The demonic child is crawling towards me every time I see it, but it's always in different places. It felt as if this went on for hours. At one point, I hear it ask me, Do you give up? A thought then creeped into my head. My grandma had always told me about how faith and prayer was our strongest weapon. And so that's what I did. I stood up and faced that childlike demon, and I prayed in the name of Jesus Christ. His smile froze, and as I blinked, its demonic features disappeared. He was not more than a child again. I continued to repeat my prayer, and the more I did, the more scared the child looked. And then I pushed him down the stairs. As soon as I did, I immediately and actually woke up. My shirt was over my face, which scared me at first, but I pulled it off, and when I looked around, I saw that it was morning. But I also found that there were cuts all over my body. I was bleeding, but I felt whole again, as if I had beaten it. I told my family downstairs what had happened. They would be wondering what the cuts were from anyway. I was sure they'd send me to an asylum or something. But they believed me, I think. They'd been in that house for a long time, and they knew some very crazy things went on there. They even brought over a priest to bless and cleanse the home. Over time, I finally got over my fear of sleeping, and I can say I haven't seen nor heard from that child demon since. But every now and then, I still feel that hand-like sensation going along my back, and I can still see the world in a way I can't explain. I fear that one day, I may find myself in a similar situation again. It tried to hurt me. From Mountain Woman 884. You want a story? I have a good one. The type you would hear from your grandmother. The type that promotes caution towards what we don't understand. This happened two years ago. I was 20 at the time, and I was living alone in my apartment. I'd recently been promoted and could finally pay for my own place. My best and only friend at the time was a German Shepherd that I had adopted. At the time, he was a puppy. His name is Kurtz. When looking at houses, I came across this nice house in an old area. It was underpriced for its size. When I inquired as to why, the real estate agent said something along the lines of, the house was built in 1833 and it doesn't have the best history. Everyone who's lived here has had some kind of awful thing happen to them in the house. The most recent thing being someone found their cat ripped to shreds. As I entered that house, I was hit with a gut feeling that I needed to leave. I was practically raised by the woods. My mother died when I was just a month old and my dad was a hunter. He taught me to always listen to my gut. So when I was hit with this bad feeling, my mind began to second guess the entire thing. The house had two big rooms downstairs. The one that you saw when you first walked in was just empty. Through the door was the kitchen. The stench of that room was horrid. I opened the fridge and found out why. Rotten meat and food riddled the shelves. Uh, the previous owner left in a hurry, the agent said, who had been showing me around. The two rooms were divided by the staircase, which led to the second floor. We went up. At the top, there was a door which the agent unlocked. It led to a small space which had four rooms and a closet. Right across from the stairway door was the bathroom. To the left was a small bedroom. To the right was a master bedroom, and between the bathroom and master was another bedroom. 
I looked through the rooms, and when I entered the left bedroom, I got a feeling that I was being watched. I slowly walked through the room, and I came to the closet. I opened it. Nothing special in particular. The rest of the rooms carried the same feeling with them, though, and that feeling was there through the rest of the house, especially the basement. Ugh, that basement. It was a mess. To give you a reference, it looked like a house in the Chernobyl exclusion zone. There was a freaking toilet in the middle of the room, surrounded by drywall that was in patches. Despite all the bad feelings and what should have been red flags, I bought the place. Call me crazy all you want, but I swear I heard a voice in my head saying, Leave. This went on until the moment I left the property. When I looked back at the house, I swear I saw a hunched over shadow in the window. I didn't see any facial features either. It had to have been at least nine feet tall. Its arms were skinny and long, and as I looked back at it, it felt as if my brain was on fire. Later, when I moved in, my first day was awful. As I was setting up the TV in the first room, I heard that voice in my head again. Leave. I squatted down to plug it into the wall, and as I did, I felt a hand grab my hair. I clearly felt a large hand with six fingers and inhuman strength gripping into my hair. I reached for my hunting knife that I kept in my belt, and Kurtz ran into the room, barking his head off. The hand let go, and when I turned, knife in hand, there was nothing there. Kurtz was growling and barking at a spot in the corner. I calmed him down and finished setting up the TV. Night was falling soon, and I decided that I could unload the rest of the stuff the following day. I planned for the rest of the free room to be my personal gym. I cleaned out the kitchen and ordered some pizza. I sat at the table and scrolled through my phone. Across from the table was the glass door leading to the basement. I suddenly heard a small bump. Kurtz's head perked up at the door. I did the same. In the reflection of the glass, I saw that same shadow standing right behind me. My ears began to ring, a horrible ringing sound. The voice spoke again, although this time the shadow figure opened its mouth. The voice was so loud, and it seemed to make everything around me shake. Get out now. I turned around quickly, but nothing was there. Everything had already turned to normal. I convinced myself I was seeing things, and the voice, I shrugged it off. Now that I was completely unsettled, I sat in the corner of the TV room so that I could see the entire house. After about 10 minutes of this, I walked slowly to the front door. Kurtz accompanied me out to my truck. We slept in there for the night, and I kept a pistol under the seat. When the pizza guy pulled in, I got out of the truck, paid him, and he was on his way. I turned to the house, and once again I saw the shadow. I decided then and there, this thing would not control the home I just bought. I called my cousin, who was all into the paranormal, and told him the situation. As I was on the phone and looked back at the house, I swear I saw that shadow open its eyes. Two yellow slits staring into my soul. It's hard to describe, but it felt as if bullets hit me. I felt them carve their path through my lungs. Then I remembered the days in which I used to hunt with my dad. He made it a point to only shoot deer in the lungs. It was like the creature was making me feel the pain I'd put my prey through. On top of that, I felt blunt pain in every part of my body. When I picked my head up, the shadow had a wide grin across its face. It all happened so fast. You still there? My cousin asked over the phone. His words brought me back to my senses, and the pain was suddenly gone. I saw Kurt staring at the shadow from my truck. As my cousin and I talked, we came to the conclusion it was a demon. I ordered another batch of food from a local Chinese place and asked for extra salt. When I hung up with the lady on the phone, the shadow figure was gone. I heard the distinct click of the door locking. I hadn't done that, but I might as well keep them that way, I thought. 
When the delivery guy arrived, I asked him if he saw the shadow in the house as well. He nodded, visibly creeped out. I took the salt packets and opened them. I poured the salt into Kurtz's rubber bowl. I then wet my knife slightly and sprinkled it with salt, causing it to stick to the knife. I stepped out of the truck and walked up to the door, hesitating. I then entered my home. I walked into the middle of the room. Nothing happened at first. I stood there looking for that shadow. Suddenly, I felt those same six fingers wrap around my chest, sharp nails poking into me. I swung the salted blade down, aiming for where I thought the arm would be. My ears began to ring more intensely. Suddenly, I was thrown a good foot and a half away from where it had grabbed me. I wasn't skinny at the time, weighing around 180 pounds, so for something to effortlessly do that, it was, to put it simply, terrifying. The front door then slammed shut and locked. I got back to my feet and heard the basement door slam shut. I followed whatever the heck this thing was, and suddenly the smell of smoke filled my lungs. I looked down through the basement door. The entire downstairs must have been on fire. Vicious flames licked upwards towards me. Then the door swung open, and I felt two large palms on my back. I stabbed at the air behind me. I heard the most horrible screech then as I ran to the front door. It was locked. I took the pistol off my belt and shot the lock out before running to my truck. With Kurtz along with me, I drove a few houses down the street. I called the fire department and walked back to the house. The entire thing was now engulfed in flames and the sirens were closing in. The shadow showed itself once more and I heard, Stay out. After the entire ordeal, Kurtz and I moved far out of the state. I met a guy, got married, and I've got a kid on the way. My child will know not to mess with that of which they don't understand, and to trust their gut instinct. That Thing Behind the Barn From Tim Tom 123 It was just after Christmas, and we went to go see my grandpa. He lives along the United States border between Minnesota and Canada, right on the Rainy River. It's quite peaceful up there. We've never experienced anything bad. And let me remind you that I was 12, so it was a lot for my little kid mind to comprehend. It all started a day or two after Christmas. It was extremely cold that night, about 3 degrees or so. Everything was quiet at the time. No coyote howls, nothing but wind. It was just me and my grandpa staying up to watch something about the gold rush. Suddenly, the floodlight on the barn about 200 feet in front of the house flicked on. The two of us looked out the window facing the barn. We didn't see anything at first, so we shrugged it off. But all night, my grandpa's Great Dane had its tail between its legs, whimpering in the corner. Fall of the following year, my grandpa got a few deer tags. I wasn't old enough yet to hunt alone that November. It was okay weather for the time. Early one morning, we walked out to the blind and got in. Not too long after that, I see a little spike. I aim and step on a twig by accident. There was a snap, and the little buck I was looking at looked at us. I was utterly shocked when I saw the buck stand up on its hind legs. My grandpa and I gasped. That night I couldn't sleep, thinking about that dear thing's eyes locking onto us. Suddenly, light filled the window near me. The floodlight at the barn had turned on again. Gathering my courage, I looked through the window, and I saw that deer standing in the woods by the barn on two legs. It seemed to be staring at the house, at us. After looking into it more, I can't help but wonder if this might be a Wendigo. The Faceless Creature From Anonymous I've never told anyone else about this experience, 
in fear of sounding crazy. I mean, heck, it is crazy. However, I just started listening to this show to lift my spooky little spirit in time for Halloween. It was when I heard a story that sounded strikingly similar to my own that caused me to stop what I was doing. Listening to that episode gave me hope that in fact, I'm not crazy. It was a seemingly normal weekend night when my cousin M came to my house to sleep over. For context, we've always had a strong sisterly bond as we're only a year apart in age and have lived with each other multiple times. Even when we didn't live together, our houses were always five to 10 minutes away from each other. So weekly sleepovers were common. We know each other like the back of our hands. So I know when she's serious and when she's messing with me. I was about 14 years old at the time, making her 13 in 2003. Our computer was set up on the left side of our Florida room in the back of the house, while my bedroom was on the right side with a large open space in the middle. The room was connected to our dining room by a sliding glass door with a long row of windows and a bar-like counter. If you were sitting at the computer and turned around, you could see right into the kitchen as well as the dining room. The only thing separating the computer room from the Florida room was a small half wall that was in the process of being torn down. This is necessary information for the story. As you must know, there is no possible way for M to have pranked me without me seeing what she was up to. We grew up interested in the occult very young, as I had another cousin who was much older, D, who was a Wiccan. I could listen to him talk for hours about all the magical and mystical joys and challenges that came with his religion. I remember asking him about Ouija boards, because I really wanted to use one to attempt to speak to my great-grandma. I was still naive. He quickly and sternly warned me not to touch Ouija boards if I didn't know what I was doing. Yet he didn't elaborate. He just told me that if I valued my happiness and my soul, I shouldn't touch one as I can attract something much darker than grandma. Of course, I ignored this advice, thinking he was just being dramatic and secretly bought a Ouija board anyway. M and I became obsessed with that Ouija board, using it often. Extremely stupid, I know. We were being typical teenagers trolling people on forums and playing games late into the night. At some point, M said she was thirsty and headed to the kitchen for a glass of water. As she shut the sliding door quietly, I could clearly see her retrieve a cup and walk to the fridge. We looked at each other and silently giggled because she was doing everything in her power not to make any noise. We didn't care to feel my mother's wrath for waking her up at 3 a.m. I turned my attention back to the computer and continued my game. Not even five seconds later, I heard a soft scuffling noise coming from behind the half wall. My younger siblings always left toys in that area, which would randomly turn on, so I didn't think much of it. I just figured it was a family spirit or another harmless spirit that decided to once again mess with the toys. I've had so many paranormal experiences I've lost count, so I've become used to it. Although, for some reason, I felt uneasy. I felt dazed and confused. The only time I've ever experienced this feeling was when I went with my grandma to check out an old house for sale. She would always bring me house hunting with her to see if I felt any sort of negative energy, as she said I was still pure and would have stronger senses than herself. Probably not one of her best ideas when I think about it now. I still wish I'd never looked towards that wall. I glanced behind me when I saw M filling her cup in the kitchen, and it then emerged. I could see it slowly crawling from behind the wall in my peripheral vision. I froze, too terrified to rip my gaze from M, who was completely oblivious to what I was seeing. I took a deep breath and dragged my eyes to the creature in front of me. It was faceless void of eyes and a nose, with gray skin stretched tight around its head. It didn't even have indentations where the eyes were supposed to be. The only distinguishing feature this thing had 
was a mouth. A wide, human-like mouth sat low on its head, right above where an actual human's chin would be. I think the thing I found most strange about this creature was that it didn't have teeth. No sharp teeth, like other people have said, or squared human-like teeth. Just an empty black hole where faint hisses escaped. The faceless thing looked sickly skinny, visibly bony with long arms. I can't tell you what its lower half looked like. I could only see it from the waist up. And it smiled at me. If you could even call that a smile. I instantly felt a wave of nausea smack me, leaving my head throbbing. All of this happened within seconds. As soon as I looked back at M, she was looking at me curiously. I watched her walk back through the dining room, towards the sliding door to come back to me. Once she got to the door, I glanced at the wall, and in the blink of an eye, that thing was gone. I think to myself, how the heck does something just evaporate into thin air? Had I just imagined it? Did M sneak out here really quick with the mask when I wasn't looking? It didn't make any sense to me. M, what the heck is behind that wall? I whispered as she stopped right in front of me, looking confused. Mm, what do you mean? She asked, puzzled at my sudden change in behavior. Uh, just toys. Why? Would you like to play with the boppet? She teased and plopped it down next to me. Quit messing with me. I know you're trying to scare me. Well, congrats, you got me this time. I said to her, trying to ease my mind. I'm not one to scare easily, and we were currently having an ongoing prank war. You deserve a cookie for that one. I haven't been that scared since we left the old house. She then turned towards me with a somber look on her face and said, Jay, I didn't do anything. Why would I prank you this close to your mom's room at this time? I'm not trying to get whooped. I felt a chill crawl down my spine, making all my hair stand on end. Seriously, what's up with you? You're acting so weird. She scowled at me and rolled her eyes, taking the mouse from my hand. I sat there dumbfounded, staring at the floor, sneaking a few peeks towards that wall. I finally turned towards her, and in a hushed voice I said, I think we should go back to my room, like right now. And don't touch those toys no matter how often they go off tonight, okay? She was annoyed at this point and started to call me a baby, boasting about how much longer she could stay up. I got up and huffed, choking out words. Fine, you can stand here and play with that thing then. Better hope it doesn't swallow you whole. Her smile disappeared, realizing that I'm not trying to pull a fast one on her. But what are you talking about? She stammered, a look of concern now dawning on her face. Knowing that I have her full attention now, I walked towards my room and coldly told her I meant what I said, that if she wanted to play with that faceless thing, be my guest. Jumping up from her chair, she trailed behind me without another word. Once in my bedroom, we both sat on my bed as I explained what I saw. A look of horror crossed her face when she realized I was being serious. She asked, Do you think us playing with that board has anything to do with this? I responded, I wish I could tell you, but I just don't know what it was. We should get rid of that board just to be safe. She agreed, and we planned to burn it the next day. We didn't fall asleep until the sun came up, too afraid of what might be lurking in the dark. As we had agreed, we burned the board in our fire pit outside once we woke up. I stole my mom's huge container of salt and poured it around the fire pit to form a circle. As it burned, I boldly stated, You are not welcome here. Go back to where you came from and never show your face here again. This is my home. Mine. M glanced at me, kind of giggling, and asks, Do you really think that'll work? 
It's worth a shot, right? I said, with a small forced smile, completely unsure if it would or not. I haven't seen the faceless thing in my home since then, although every once in a while I'll have a dream featuring the notorious faceless creature. Every time it enters my dreams, it only hisses out one sentence that drives me crazy and always infuriates me. You're mine, mine, mine. These dreams no longer frighten me, as I can now tell the difference between my dreams and reality. I always shout at the creature, These are my dreams, you have no power here. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But a girl can try. I've come to terms that I may have my own personal demon, or cryptid, attached to me. Which is fine, as long as it leaves him and her family alone. I no longer care. Paranormal Activity Saved Our Lives From Frankie Goetz this particular story is one of my most recent paranormal experiences. This is the most profound paranormal experience I have ever had, or should I say experiences, as it was experienced on multiple dates with multiple witnesses. I am a single full-time father raising two children on my own. I have an 8-year-old son and a 17-year-old daughter. Both mothers are not really involved in the children's lives. Yes, I've got two baby mamas. Matter of fact, my daughter has helped me raise her little brother because I work full time and she'd walk him to school and watch him after school. My son's mother would come and go out of our lives. I loved her dearly, but she always wanted to be everywhere else but here with us. She lived a street life and sadly was addicted to substances and was homeless. Her lifestyle choices eventually brought her life to a demise in 2019, which broke all our hearts and my kids and I mourn her death to this day. After my son's mother passed away, paranormal activity started happening in my house. Now, I don't know if it's her or if it was some type of guardian angel, but the paranormal activity that was happening led to an event that basically saved my life and my children's lives. One morning, my kids and I woke up to a strong smell of sage in the house. The smell was very strong, as if my house had been smudged, but I never smudge my house. My son's mother was Native American, and her mother and aunt both know how to do smudge cleanses. In Native American culture, they believe the smoke from burned sage can cleanse people's bodies and people's dwellings of negative energies. I theorized that this smell could be a paranormal manifestation, a sign that her spirit was visiting. Nothing happened after that. It was bizarre, and we all smelled it. I even went outside both front and back yards to take a big whiff of air to try and see if the smell was coming from outside, but the smell could only be smelled in the house. I mentioned the event to my son's grandmother, that we smelled smudge in the house. She's the mother of my son's mother who passed away. Let's call her V. V got worried because apparently in her culture it's believed that if one smells burned sage in a house without anyone actually having burned sage, it means that the person might have a negative energy in the home. I personally did not feel any malevolent presence, but she was concerned and asked me if she can smudge the house herself. I told her she could, and a few days later she did. A month or so goes by after we smudged the house and another paranormal event happened. This one happened in my living room and my eight-year-old son and friend both bore witness to this event. My son, his friend, and I are sitting on the couch in the living room, when, unexpectedly, a picture flew off the wall and landed on the floor. When I say it flew, I mean it flew. It didn't just fall straight down. We all looked at each other stunned, and I say to my son and his friend, Did you see that? They both nodded their heads, I go pick up the picture off the floor, and it's a picture of a collage. It's a collage of words and short sentences that correlate to the word love, crisscrossing each other. I put the picture back on the nail and started trying to naturally explain away how it got flung off the nail. In my other stories, I've mentioned I'm a paranormal investigator by hobby, 
And one thing an investigator must always do is try and debunk everything and try and find a reasonable explanation. So I proceeded to do this with my son and his friend watching. I jumped really hard beside the wall it's hung on, but nothing happened. It stayed put. I blew really hard at the picture. Once again, it stayed put. I even banged at and tried to shake the wall without breaking the drywall in the process, and still it stayed put. Each new thing I tried, I started believing more and more that this thing somehow actually flew off by some unseen paranormal force. So I decided to put my finger on the bottom left of the frame and flunk it upward, towards the right, since that's how we saw it fly off in the first place. When I flung it off that way, it was almost exact to what we saw, and it even landed roughly in the same area. My investigation concluded that thing was definitely flung off of its nail by an unseen force. My son and I were not scared, but I was a little worried because I just didn't know who or what it was. Up until that point, I've only ever experienced paranormal activity outside my home at haunted locations I ventured to. I've never really experienced poltergeist activity in my own home. I obviously theorized it's my son's mother because she was the one that bought that pick, and also is the one who hung it up. But at the end of the day, I don't really know, and I'll admit I was scared to engage with it, so I ignored it, and I didn't mention it to V. Life went on and nothing happened for a bit, but then a month or so goes by after the picture was flung off the wall, and another paranormal event transpired. This one was spooky like super spooky. My son was taking a bath by himself in the washroom. He gets out, comes down, and says in a scared voice, Dad, the lid on the toilet seat opened and shut by itself a bunch of times. When he told me that, I got shivers up my spine. I felt a bit of dread and then anger. I told him, don't be scared, I'll take care of this. I know it's corny, but what else am I going to say to the kid? I marched up to the washroom, closed the door, and I started to engage in conversation with what I thought to believe was a ghost in my house. I say to it in an angry and stern voice with authority, I don't know who you are, but you don't dare pick on my son. I am a spirit operating a body and you are a disembodied spirit. I'm supposed to be here and you are not. You need to go to the light. And if you don't want to go to the light, you need to leave this house immediately. This time I got the courage to engage in conversation. I took my phone out and tried to capture an EVP. It's 2021, and I'm sure everyone knows what an EVP is. But in case you don't know, EVP stands for Electronic Voice Phenomena. There are two main scientific hypotheses of EVPs. One is that the spirit voice cannot be heard by the human ear because the sound frequency is too low. And the other, which I believe to be the accurate one, is that the spirit's voice is not manipulating the air to produce sounds like our vocal cords would, but the spirit is using electromagnetic energy, and the magnet in the recorder on recording devices picks it up. This can be demonstrated by getting copper coil wire, attaching it to an auxiliary cord, and plugging the cord into the headphone spot on your phone. When you push play, your ears can't hear the electromagnetic signal being broadcast out of the copper coil. But if one puts an audio recorder beside the copper coil, the magnet in the recorder will pick it up, and you can hear what is being played. It's pretty cool. And for the record, I've captured EVPs in the past. And once you catch one for yourself, your perception of reality changes. So I opened up the audio recorder on my phone and began to record. I ask with a more calm voice, Who are you? I stayed quiet, so that when I replayed it, maybe there would be a voice there talking back to me. But before I stopped to review, I asked more questions. Why are you here? Stay quiet. Do you need help? Stay quiet. I stopped recording and pushed play, and to my surprise, there were no responses at all, just dead quiet. Once my son saw me go confront the wind in the washroom, I could tell it really helped him. He's a tough kid. He's not afraid of that washroom and even slept by himself that night. I had no choice but to brush it off and continue my life. 
and for the record, I never actually saw the toilet seat do this, but I don't think my son would have made it up. Another month goes by, and something else happens. At this point, I'm beginning to notice a pattern. Paranormal activity would happen once a month or every other month. This event transpired around 9 p.m. I was going to bed because I have to wake up for work at 6 in the morning. My daughter and son both stay up and chill in the living room watching TV. I'm upstairs, just starting to doze off, when all of a sudden, both my daughter and my son burst into my bedroom, frightened, and say to me, There was a big bang in the kitchen. Someone's trying to break in. We do live in an area known for crime to happen, so I got scared. Immediately, I got up and ran downstairs in my boxers. The kitchen light was turned off. So I turned it on, and I proceeded to walk to my back door. It's locked. No one's outside. I looked around the kitchen, and I noticed on my stove lay a big cup that I would keep tea bags inside, and on the front of the cup you can see the word tea. This big ceramic cup or mug, I should say, was not on the stove before I went to bed. It was placed on top of this mini oven that is placed on the counter directly to the right of the stove so this thing obviously fell from the mini oven onto my stove, which caused a big bang. But how? Now that I determined we're not in any danger from criminals, my paranormal investigative brain kicks into gear. I tell my daughter and son to go sit on the couch in the living room. I put the big cup or mug back on the mini oven and I stare at it. I slowly push it off the mini oven and let it fall onto the stove. It was loud as the big ceramic cup hits the metal on the stove. I call out to the kids, Is that the noise you heard? They both respond loudly, Yes! So I tell them to come into the kitchen, and I explain, That noise you heard was this cup falling onto the stove. We all look at each other confused. We all know what the other is thinking. Is it a ghost? But we're not scared. I felt like a proud father at the moment because I got some tough kids. I say, how do you think this fell? It doesn't make sense. My daughter suggested, try blowing on it. I laugh and say, there's no way in heck me blowing on it's going to move that. I blow on it and obviously it does nothing, and we laugh together. I straight up tell both of them and show them. The only way for this to fall off from here, something would have to push it like this. Once again, I slowly pushed it off, and it makes that loud bang again. It even landed roughly in the same place as I found it. All three of us come to the conclusion that it was pushed by an unseen force. Once again, I'm worried because I don't know the intentions of this spirit. Why is this spirit doing poltergeist activity in my home? I wondered. I then went back to bed and so did the kids, and nothing happened for the rest of the night nor did anything happen in the upcoming days and weeks. The following morning after the cup fell onto the stove, I shared my experience on Facebook. Some people said I have a demon, but I swear we felt no malevolent presence. Like, honestly, we weren't even scared. Another person suggested that I might have mice and a mouse knocked it over. I said to myself, dang, that actually sounds like the most reasonable explanation to explain away how that fell. So after work, when I got home, I proceeded to do some mice hunting. I looked everywhere, under the stove, under the fridge, in all the cupboards and all the counters, and found nothing. Not one drop of mouse poo. It wasn't mice. So what is it? I say to myself, it's gotta be a ghost. To this day, I've never seen any mice in my house. Once again, another month or so goes by and something else happened. This time, I was the only one who experienced this. It happened late at night, when I got up to go to the bathroom. I was half asleep. Before I tell you what happened, I have to explain the layout of the washroom. My washroom is small. As soon as you open the door, on the left is a small sink with a mirror. To the right of the sink is a wall that holds the pipes to my bathtub and showerhead. And to the right of the wall is the bathtub and showerhead. Beside the bathtub is the toilet. If you sit on it, you can touch the bathtub. I go into my washroom, do my business, and as I'm walking out, I hear three fast consecutive knocks on the wall beside the sink, and then I hear something drop. 
You know when you drop that candy, Smarties, on the ground? Like on tiles, hardwood floor, or laminate flooring, and it bounces a bunch? That's what it sounded like. I have tiles in my washroom. After I hear this, I walk out of the washroom and towards my room because I'm tired. But I replay the three knocks and the weird noise in my head, and I say to myself, Okay, you can't just brush this off. You gotta go back in there and see what it was. I go back in the washroom and honestly felt a presence for sure. I definitely didn't feel alone. I started by looking on the ground and I saw an Advil pill on the floor. I'll be 100% honest with you, I didn't have Advil in my house at all, so this freaked me out. I explained the pill away, thinking it could have fell out of a purse of one of the many girls I hung out with back then. Either way, I'm freaked out. Not just trying to understand how it got there, but even if I can't explain it away, it's scary. Because what if my son had seen it and swallowed it? I then picked it up and dropped it on the tile floor. I freaked myself right out. That was the exact noise I'd heard, but it wasn't the same pattern of bouncing. I started dropping it from different elevations, until I repeated and synchronized the sound of me dropping it with the sound in my head that I remembered. I found out roughly what height that pill would have needed to be dropped from to make that sound. I did consider the fact that because I was tired I could have accidentally kicked the pill, or it could have gotten stuck to my foot and dropped as I was walking and not noticed. But I repeated the events in my head many times replaying it. I had finished doing my business, I had turned around, I walked towards the door, I heard three knocks and the sound of the pill dropping. I had no socks on. I would assume I'd feel the pill if my bare foot touched it, and if I kicked it, or it would have gotten stuck to my foot and fallen off, and if that was the case, it would have been flung and not just dropped. Also, the height of it being dropped was a bit higher than the strut of my foot. I distinctly remember hearing the three knocks before I even heard the pill drop, but it dropped as soon as the third knock finished. Nothing right now made sense to me, and I was spooked, but not panicked. Spooked, but not scared, if that makes sense. I don't know, I'm just trying to be tough, I guess. But let's be honest. Three knocks is super freaky, because they say the number three represents demonic activity. Christians believe it's the mocking of the Trinity. For the record, I'm not Christian. I lay in bed and tried to get to sleep, but couldn't. I was remembering what happened and also thinking of ways to deal with this from information I'd gathered over years of research in the occult with an open mind. So I start to imagine white light being created on my closet door. I try to maintain my imagination picturing this white light on my closet super bright. As I do this, I tell the spirit to go to the light and leave. Yeah, I know I sound like a whack job, but when freaky stuff happens to you, you might consider some of it to be real. After all, the word occult comes from the Latin word occultare, which translates to hidden knowledge. And they say our imaginations have an effect on the spirit realm, and we can all help spirits this way by creating light with our third eyes, through our imaginations, to help souls cross over. I don't know how much truth there is to that, but hey, I decided I'd try and in fact was my first time trying. I fell asleep and nothing else happened. From there, I was anticipating the next paranormal event. Time went on and nothing happened. I began to realize the paranormal activity was being centered around the bathroom and kitchen. At one point, my son is in the bathtub. I'm downstairs in the kitchen sitting at the kitchen table. The table is directly below the kitchen light. Both the light and table are both below the bathtub. Water starts dripping from the ceiling and around the light. This freaked me out. I didn't understand what was happening. Was my son at risk of the bathtub falling through the ceiling? As for the water pouring around the kitchen light, thank God the light was turned off, or it could have caught fire. I ran upstairs to get my son out of the tub, and I called my landlord immediately. Within one day, my landlord sent out a handyman to see what was going on. He sees on the ceiling where the water dripped from and started to investigate. He then unscrewed the entire light and unattached it from the ceiling. The diameter of the circular light fixture the light bulb sits in is probably a foot in diameter. To his and my horror, almost like a bucket of water just falls on his head on my kitchen floor. He says to me, 
holy crap, that's never happened to me before. I say, how do you think all that water got there? He answered, it must be leaking from the washroom somehow. The handyman went upstairs into the washroom. Now, remember when I told you the layout of the washroom, sink, wall, then tub, he cuts open a square on the wall in between the sink and bathtub and shower head. The pipe to my bathtub and shower had been leaking onto the light fixture. The handyman looked at me sternly. He said, I don't know how your house didn't burn down. That water had been accumulating on top of your light fixture for some time. That was super creepy, because I'd been actively turning on and off that light all the time, and that whole time there was tons of water accumulating on top of it. One little drop of water while that light is on could set the ceiling on fire and lead to burning down my house. The scarier part is we would leave that kitchen light on at night sometimes. What if it had caught fire while we were sleeping? We all could have died. Once the pipe got fixed, many months went by and no paranormal activity started happening. It's been over a year and to this day no paranormal activity happened in my house again. No poltergeist activity, nothing. My theory is, whatever or whoever that was, they were trying to warn us about the water accumulating on top of the light fixture. Think about it. A cup knocked over in the kitchen, a toilet seat slamming up and down, the three knocks I heard on the wall where the handyman had to cut through to fix the pipe. I don't know if it was my son's mother, or some type of guardian angel, but these paranormal events I just shared with you, they're the most profound experiences I had in my life. What would you do if you went through what we went through, and what do you think of my theory? It was the year 2018. My best friend and I were getting more adventurous as our senior year continued. We would stay out late smoking and walking around various neighborhoods or high riding. Two young 18 year old girls. My best friend Julia is about five foot five, brown hair, blue eyes. Then me being five foot nine, blonde hair, blue eyes. Most would think that we were absolutely stupid for doing some of the reckless things we did. Yet we did not care. We craved the adrenaline, and we were both a bit disturbed due to some trauma we experienced as individuals. Fear did not exist at this time, as we had been through enough scary situations to be numb to the idea of fear. Now at the time, it was close to the end of the school year, and honestly, our parents stopped paying attention to us most nights. I was home alone, and my best friend and I were left to do whatever we wanted most days and nights. That is when the idea of urban exploration became our new favorite thing to do. We explored all over our town in New Jersey and surrounding towns, although we could not find a building that was daring enough for us thrill seekers. After searching YouTube for a couple days, that is when I found it, the holy grail of abandoned buildings near us. Only 30 minutes from us into Pennsylvania was an old, abandoned school that was home to delinquent children. After doing some personal research on the school, I came to find out that the school was closed due to a fire. Although after visiting the school a couple of times, something told me several way more sinister things happened on the grounds of the school. There were about 25 buildings, so it took more than six times searching to really get the absolute full experience this school had to offer. On campus was a security guard who drove around in a blacked out Jeep. He never would leave his car. Only once did he catch us, although he just told us to leave. Again, never leaving his car. I still wonder if he had the same feeling about the place as we did and that he had found sanctuary never leaving his car. Since there were so many times we visited, I am only going to highlight the most terrifying moments we experienced, of course from least to most blood-curdling. To give you the ambience of what we were facing, I will tell you this. To get into the campus, you needed to cut through the trees and bushes with thorns on them. Always wear pants when exploring. After you get through the brush, hopefully unscathed, you are greeted by several decaying buildings. The smell of mold and nature kind of all hit you at once. Absolutely everything there is overgrown and seriously falling apart. 
Graffiti is pretty much plastered everywhere. Besides the physical look, the gut-wrenching feeling you get when you walk foot on this property, that alone will make you want to turn back and never set foot there again. Something about this place seriously is wrong, and you feel as though you should not be there. Something I came to personally learn about this place is every time you come back, things seem to get more and more out of place and otherworldly. Walking into these buildings, most windows are boarded up, so you can only see using the small light on your phone. Other than that, it is pitch black. The first truly terrifying moment I had on this campus had to be finding the blood-chilling room where it looked as though it was an old dentist office or something medical. I am not sure why it was there or what they really did there, but when I walked in, I got this strange feeling of death. Scattered in the pitch-black room, all I could see was open syringes covering the floor, a dentist chair that had dried red substance resembling blood all over it and everything else in the room, untouched. As my best friend and I explored this small, dark room, we began to hear footsteps coming from down the dark corridor. Trying to rationalize the noise, we automatically assumed it was the security guard and ran the opposite direction back out the small window we came from in the other room. Upon reaching outside, we hid behind some coverage and waited quite a bit of time. We did not hear the noise again, nor did anyone come out. The next time we came, we decided to try to find the building that contained an old game room in it. Since we explored most of the buildings, we figured out which one it most likely was. Searching the perimeter for any way and checking doors, we could not find a way in. Circling back, I found an old, dirty window which looked as if it opened to a dark cement basement. Being the confident kids we were, I jumped through it almost immediately. Now, the first thing we saw as we walked out of the closet window was a wide open basement. With further analysis, we realized just how scary this basement was. The only thing down here besides it being absolutely freezing in mid-May was the old worn fireplace. Written above the fireplace was something demonic or like demon worshippers had written on it. Several pentagrams were graffitied. Looking towards the middle of the floor was red paint of a pentagram, very big, smack dab in the middle of the floor. Candle wax was everywhere, and it was accompanied by a strange smell. With the scent of existential dread suffocating the room, we darted towards the steps at the back of the room. We did not step foot in that basement ever again. The second to last time visiting the campus, we decided to be even more ballsy and explore at night. It was roughly 12 at night, maybe slightly later, and again, it was simply just my friend Julia and I. Besides it being dark, approaching the school, my blood ran cold. Everything in my body was telling me to run the other way and to not set foot back at this campus. Yet again, I ignored my gut instinct and we began our journey through the woods to make it into the campus. Tonight was different. I decided to actually document our journey as if we were on Ghost Hunter or some other paranormal show. The whole time I was recording, I would go back and forth from me to see what I was seeing. As me and Julia began walking through the pitch black, using only her phone light, visibility was dim. We could only see about seven feet in front of us, the rest of this campus had been like it was not even there. Just utter blackness surrounded us. I was laughing and talking to my audience on my Instagram story, boasting about the trip as if it made me the coolest person ever to risk my life just to see some buildings filled with asbestos, mold, and possibly homeless people. Just as I turned the camera to face Julia and sort of interviewed her about her current experience is when I saw what made my heart stop and my jaw drop. I froze in the position I was in, just holding the camera pointing in Julia's direction. As Julia looked past my camera, almost questioning why I got so quiet, she saw my face. The viewers at home could only see Julia's expression. It had said more to the people at home than either of us could explain. 
seeing how absolutely horrified I was and how my face had turned the lightest shade it could. She let out a scream and grabbed my arm, pulling me into a different direction. I felt as if I was no longer present and adrenaline had taken over my body. My legs were moving, yet it felt like I was not controlling them. We jumped and hid behind a tree as Julia pleaded with me to tell her what I had seen. For a couple of minutes I just sat there, trying to process what I had just seen. I did not want to believe anything scary and paranormal could be real. It felt like a true scary movie came to life. When I regained my ability to talk again, I told her exactly what I saw. When I tell you, you most likely will not believe me, for it is so utterly insane, it's almost laughable. That image will never leave my memory, for it is burned in forever. Standing right behind Julia, just in the shot of my camera, was a black figure. With a closer look, I remember not believing what I saw and experiencing what felt like paralysis as I was stuck staring at this figure standing only three feet behind my best friend. A man on a large horse from what I could make out. No detail to him at all, like he had literally been a shadow, just a blacked out figure. The worst part was his large, broad body seemed as if it had no head. I know it sounds crazy, but trust me, it absolutely was. I had heard stories of the headless horseman as a kid, yet I never expected to see anything like that in my waking hours of the day. After telling my best friend what I had seen, we hightailed it back to Jersey and decided to do some more research and see if anyone had any similar experiences or the same one. As we searched, I found countless stories that made my bones hurt about this place and what other urban explorers had experienced. One in particular made me literally almost faint. To be brief, this guy who had been really into exploring found this place years back and decided like us he wanted to keep coming back and see everything the campus had to offer. He explained how every single time he came back, weirder and weirder things happened to him, which to my knowledge was exactly how I felt. But what he said next made my soul sink into the floor. He explained the last time he decided to go was at night. He explained how in front of the red house, he had been chased out by a headless horseman. My stomach sank. I went right back to the live video I had taken and watched it back. The part in which Julia looks at my horrified face, directly in the background, sat the old, decaying red house, half burnt down. My jaw dropped. We did not visit this place for a couple of weeks. I would love to say I learned my lesson and this is the end of the story. I would be lying. After a couple of weeks had passed, our urge to visit the campus grew to an insane level. Almost as if something was pulling us back, like we had strings attached to our bodies. Being the reckless kids we were, we decided 12 was not scary enough. Let's go at the devil's hour. 3 a.m. Now, as we walk towards the woods, we need to cut through a thick fog that appears out of nowhere. If you think that was not enough to scare us away, you are right. I led the pack and proceeded towards a gap in the trees. As I am about 10 feet ahead of my two friends, I notice some movement coming from the trees. We were not alone. Thinking who else might be out at 3 a.m., I started shifting backwards, alerting my friends as I slowly backpedaled. Just as my friends looked in my direction, a deer came running right towards us. Right before it reached me, it stopped dead in its tracks two feet away. This was like no deer I had ever seen. Again, I felt myself with short-term paralysis as I felt like I was staring directly into the devil's eyes. The mist completely surrounds the deer like an animal to the point I could not even see its feet. That's when I noticed its peculiar eyes glowing a weird yellow-red color. None of this seemed normal. That's when I noticed my friends booking it towards the street. Not wanting to be alone with this creature, I ran as fast as I could and eventually caught up with them. 
none of us wanted to admit how truly spooked we were, so we decided to try and find another entrance. Walking down the side road that followed next to the campus, we began to keep walking straight, occasionally looking for another opening. We then decided that at the end of the road, the campus had a church that sat in an open field. Thinking it was the safest way in, we kept walking down this road at 3.30 a.m. now, with absolutely no streetlights. It felt like we had been walking forever, and small talk was at the minimum, due to all of us low-key being scared out of our wits. That is when we heard it. We were almost to the church. It was about a quarter mile away from us. The sound of a chainsaw rang in all of our ears, sending chills down our spine. A chainsaw has a very distinct sound, yet in order to keep them faithful to the mission, I said, Hey, maybe it's just a generator. Assuming they agreed with me, I proceeded walking towards the strange noise. Suddenly, the sounds of speeding footsteps broke my concentration, only they were headed away from me rather than towards me. This is when the fear really hit me. My friends were so far away from me, panic began to set in. I was only brave if I had my friends there easing my anxiety. The second I noticed them running, my heart sunk. The chainsaw grew louder and more aggressive. I am downright sweating at this point. Finally, instinct kicks in and I bolt towards my friends, somehow catching up with them immediately. We all decided to go home since it felt like the campus was doing everything in its power to keep us out. To this day, I am not sure what was lurking past those trees, but I am not willing to ever go back and find out. Just remember, if you decide to go urban exploring, never go alone and always follow your gut, for you never know what your animal instincts could be protecting you from. Possible Demon or Poltergeist Haunting From Grim Hades This began in late August of 2020, right after I moved into my current place. I live in a small town in Florida. As always, it starts small, with little things disappearing or being misplaced, or odd feelings accompanied by noises. Now, the first week I was here, I never felt alone, even when I knew I specifically was, in fact, definitely alone. I have two roommates and my daughter. One roommate currently stays at his girlfriend's house, probably due to the weird things we experience here to this day. The first night, of course, nothing was really set up or unpacked yet, but I placed my important bag, consisting of my sketchbook, charger, makeup, and things like that, in my room so I could unload a few more things before dinner. Soon I got distracted, and I just ended up setting up quite a bit. Usually I listen to music when I do things like this, so my phone battery was draining fast. Naturally, I go to search for my charger through my bag, but it's nowhere in my backpack. This sets in a sort of panic given that my daughter was at her grandmother's out of town, and that was my only charger. I begin to go through anything and everything in my bedroom, then through the kitchen and living room, the only rooms I'd been in. I spent close to four hours doing this to no avail. My roommates do have cats, and at the time when we all moved in, my roommate had a dog, a loud chihuahua. At some point, probably around 10 or so, I heard something fall in the empty room down the hall from the living room. I was thinking it was either the cats or the dog, but the dog began to bark rapidly. I had to go check at that point. I didn't want him to keep barking, plus I wanted to make sure nothing happened to him. I didn't want to be blamed in any way since I was the only one at home at the time. Once in the room, I automatically see it. Several boxes had seemed to be tossed around, mainly books and action figures, from what I could tell. Then I looked closer. There was my charger, somehow in the middle of the mess, in a room that I had not been in at all. I mean, how would it get there, if I had put it in my bag before I got here? I watched my roommate bring in those boxes. He even pulled out his favorite comic for his lunch break or something. 
my charger was not in there before. The next night, my keys disappeared. I still haven't found them. It's been well over a year and a half, and I wonder if I ever will find them. For about a month, my cats just didn't act like they normally did. For instance, my cat, Philip J. Fry, would totally freak out if I left him alone in my room, ever. He would literally cry, as in meow very loudly and puff up. And often he would find the most inopportune places to hide. I'm not sure how I broke him of that, but I know it did take a while. My other cat, Jingles, just always follows me. She's a quiet black cat, likes to sleep. She's ten years old, so it's a little out of character for her to follow me around the house. Fast forward a couple of months to the end of October, basically a year ago now as of writing this. My daughter was home this time, but she was passed out. She already slept through the night when I moved in, so she was usually asleep by 8pm. I was in the living room watching TV on low volume, flipping through a few books for examples trying to sketch a drawing out. Again, both my roommates were at work. I work day shift. They both work at night. I just started to get into my drawing when I began to hear something. At first, I couldn't really tell what it was, so I paused whatever was on the TV for background noise and tried to listen harder. This heavy, intense feeling begins to set in once I actually hear what it was. It sounded like a child, talking and then laughing, but it just didn't sound right, let alone feel right. I go from the living room to my room where my daughter was. Just as I thought, she was still asleep. She hadn't moved at all. The room was, in my opinion, a scary movie, quiet. Nothing seemed to be wrong, though. The feeling in the house just seemed menacing, if I had to put it in words. Every now and then, when I'm definitely alone, I get that feeling that I'm not alone. That menacing, deeply heavy feeling. Entirely unsettling, to say the least. One thing I forgot to mention at the beginning of this. When we all first moved into this house... The maintenance man told us something that struck me as odd. He told us that in the past 10 years that he's worked for that landlord, everybody who moved into this specific house would move out before their lease was up. Some would leave as early as 6 months in too. He said he saw a lot of couples break up. People get very ill, lose their jobs, cars. Just some horrible luck, I guess. Or maybe it was the house. Demon? Ghost? I don't know. From John. This story happened when I was about four or maybe five. When I was younger, I was the only child. Both my parents worked, and I often had to go to daycare. Except for Tuesdays, when I didn't have to go. Instead, my mom would drop me off at my grandparents' house to watch me. That particular morning... My mom was late to drop me off at my grandparents' house that was only a few miles away from our house. Once there, my mom let me out, watched me walk into the house, then proceeded to drive away. Usually she'd walk in with me, but because she was running late, she just let me walk in, knowing my grandma was there every Tuesday to watch me. At that point, I went over and sat on the couch, waiting for my grandma to either come downstairs or just be in the kitchen reading a book. I waited for about five minutes until I heard my name being called from the attic. I proceeded to walk up the stairs to see what she was doing. At the bottom of the stairs of the attic, I called her name, but there was no answer. I called up again and again, and yet no answer. I suddenly heard my mom's voice coming from downstairs, calling my name. I walked back downstairs to find no one. I remember asking myself, what's going on? Then I heard my aunt calling my name from the basement. I walk over to the top of the basement stairs yelling my aunt's name in return. I tried to turn on the light to the bulb, but it wouldn't stay on. It was flickering, which creeped me out too much to go down. I then heard my grandmother calling my name again. Don't you go down there! I was shocked. Why hadn't she been answering me earlier? 
I walked away from the basement slowly. I then ran towards the stairs to get upstairs towards my grandmother. I checked everywhere upstairs, and not a single person was up there. That's when I began to hear my cousins and aunts and uncles all talking downstairs in the living room. I knew this had to be some kind of joke, right? Maybe a huge prank. But the only thing that was in the back of my mind was being told by my grandma not to go into the basement. As I slowly walked downstairs to the living room, no one was there. I crept my way to the stairs of the basement as I heard a child's voice that sounded like my best friend at the time, down there, saying to come play with him. I wondered why he was even here. That's not normal, right? Then I heard a deep, dark voice saying, Come, play. It was a voice I've never heard before. I slammed the door shut and bolted to the front door. As I'm running, I can feel this presence of something behind me, getting closer, the hair on the back of my neck standing straight up and goosebumps running through my body. I never turned to look. I swung open the front door to the street, crying my eyes out as my grandmother came walking up the stairs to the house. She hadn't been there. I'd been alone in the house. I jumped onto her, crying my eyes out. She held me tight and never let me go until I was done crying. I never told her what happened or anyone what actually happened. I was too scared of what it could have really been. I'm 22 now, still wondering what it was. Was it a ghost or was it my mind playing tricks on me? I'm open to any theories you have. And thankfully, Grandma moved out of that house a few years later. My Demonic Encounter from Justine MC I'm a happily married 28-year-old female. I've been with my husband since August of 2012, after I graduated high school. That summer, prior to meeting him, I was dabbling into some pretty dark stuff. I was studying witchcraft, reading tarot cards, and playing with Ouija boards. I even tried to cast a few spells. I'm no longer into all that. In all honesty, I'm a Christian now. But the consequences of my actions back then may have ended up sticking around for quite some time. Of course, being 19 at the time, I was a little stupid, because I knew better. But curiosity killed the cat, so to speak. I got pretty good at being a witch, so I decided the tell-all would be casting a spell. I'm not going to go into detail of what the spell was for personal reasons, but I think it worked. It was actually a little overwhelming how well it worked, but like everything in dealing with magic, there are karma effects after time. The results started off perfectly, just the way I wanted, but it ended up very bad. It backfired severely, and I was so upset that I was planning on trying it again, but that's when the paranormal disturbances began. It started off very minor and cliche. Knocks on the walls, footsteps in the middle of the night when no one was awake, and nightmares. Eventually, it happened so frequently, I managed to ignore it over time. Fast forward about two years later, when it began to take a turn for the worst. I am and have been with my boyfriend for those two years. We weren't married yet, we fell on a lot of hard times financially in the beginning, so for those reasons, we were still living at my parents' house, which was where I performed all my witchcraft spells and Ouija board uses. The first paranormal instance I can recall is a demonically induced nightmare. It was absolutely terrifying and way too realistic. I dreamt I was in my bedroom. Everything was the same. Nothing was off except a couple of things. In real life, we sleep in total pitch black darkness, but when the dream began, there was a light. It looked artificial, and it seemed to be coming from my vanity mirror, not in the actual room. I found myself sitting on my bedroom floor with my legs crossed and my boyfriend sitting on the edge of the bed. In the dream, we didn't speak to each other for what felt like an hour. It was just us sitting in the said positions when all of a sudden, my boyfriend asked me what was wrong with my face. I got up from the floor and looked in the mirror. The light was coming from the mirror, making it hard to see in it at first, 
but when my eyes adjusted to my reflection, I noticed my face began to change. It went from my own face slowly turning into a demonic, Reagan McNeil exorcist-looking face. I then lost all sense of control of my own body and my sense of self. Before I knew it, my body turned around and looked at my boyfriend, and I began to maniacally laugh. It was a dark, deep, bone-chilling, demonic laugh, and I began to levitate upright around the room, pointing and laughing at my boyfriend who sat there in pure fear. Then I woke up. When I was awake, I was covered in sweat, and before you ask, it was 3.30 a.m., right on the nose, when I checked the time. That was, to this day, the scariest nightmare I ever had. The next disturbance occurred not too long after that. I would say about six or so months later, if I had to guess. My boyfriend and I had finally gotten on our feet. We got a car and we headed to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where we stayed with some friends. We both ended up getting really good jobs. He was a collision technician at a popular body shop, and I got a job as a barista at Starbucks. While we were working and saving money, our schedules were all different. Our roommate, Kevin, worked at a nursing home, so sometimes he slept all day and worked at night, or vice versa. Cody, my boyfriend, worked a consistent 8 to 4 Monday through Friday, and my schedule was super inconsistent. Typically, I worked 8 to 4 or 9 to 5, but my days off didn't coincide with anyone else's. I tried to get as many weekends off as I could, but it wasn't always possible. I would sometimes have to work on a Saturday or a Sunday and have a random weekday off. The Starbucks I worked at was a little short-staffed, so I did a lot of overtime. One time in particular, on a Thursday specifically, I had the day off. I was home alone. My boyfriend Cody and my roommate Kevin were both at work. I was the only female living with two guys, so needless to say I had a lot of cleaning to do. I spent most of my day cleaning and tidying up, and it was around 1pm when I finished. I decided since there wasn't much else to do, I was going to take a nap. That was when I experienced my first episode of sleep paralysis. I lay there. I don't recall dreaming at all. I don't know how long I was asleep, but I lay there and heard the front door of our apartment open and close. I heard footsteps stomp on the welcome rug. It sounded like Cody was home. The sound resembled his work boots. It had to be him, I thought, because I always keep the apartment door locked, and he and Kevin were the only ones with keys. And I knew it wasn't Kevin. I kept listening as I lay there, and I heard the footsteps come closer, from the kitchen, through the living room, and coming straight to the bedroom where I was napping. I tried to wake myself up so I could greet him, but I found myself unable to move or even open my eyes. I heard the bedroom door open and close, and I felt someone sit at the edge of the bed. I felt the indentation. Then I suddenly felt like someone was grabbing my throat. I felt the pressure, and I was having trouble breathing. I freaked out, but I couldn't move, scream, or speak, so I began to pray in my head, and slowly but surely, the entity loosened its grip. I was finally able to get up. I still felt the remnants of pressure on my throat. I was absolutely terrified. I looked over at the digital clock and it was only 2.40 p.m. I had only been asleep for about an hour and a half, and Cody didn't get home until almost five. When I put together all the pieces of information in my head and realized how real that was and wasn't a dream that I was still home alone, I totally panicked. I didn't want to be home alone anymore. I didn't have the car so I couldn't leave. I immediately called Cody at work in tears, begging him to come home early. He said he would try his best, but he was in the middle of a big job and had to finish up what he was doing before he could even think about leaving. When you do body work on a car, you can't just walk away in the middle of wet sanding. So I had to sit there, alone, and just wait. I sat in the kitchen by the door until he actually called and said he was on his way. It was 4pm so he obviously wasn't able to leave as early as I wanted him to. When he got home he found me on the kitchen floor crying. I told him what happened and he comforted me and told me I was going to be okay. He believed me 
which was a relief, being he had a few paranormal experiences as a kid. He said if it ever happened again when I'm home alone, to just pray. So from that point on, that's exactly what I did. Hence how I became a Christian in the first place. I never attended a church or anything, because I'm not big on organized religion. I'm more like an independent Bible scholar, to put it simply. Praying helped, but there came to be a point in time where it wasn't enough. The next experience was one of the worst of all. By then, it was early 2017. Cody and I were married, and I found out I was pregnant with our son. It was early on in my pregnancy, first trimester, so I slept a lot. I didn't really get morning sickness much, but I did get these awful headaches at night, almost like migraines minus the nausea. They just made me sleep, because being pregnant I wasn't allowed to take any over-the-counter medication for it. It was one of those evenings where I felt a headache coming on, so I decided to just go to bed. It was around 9pm. My husband lay next to me, reading news articles on his phone, because he wasn't ready to sleep yet. He can verify that this happened being 100% aware and awake. I had a nightmare about a demon trying to possess me, I couldn't see it physically. It was just like a shadow figure with goat horns. It was unnerving, and I didn't have the strength to fight it. It told me it wanted my baby. I fought as best I could. Then I remembered to pray, but it was too late. When I began to speak in my dream, I also spoke out loud in my sleep, and my husband heard it. Not only was it not in English, but it wasn't my voice either. In fact, it was a multitude of demonic voices speaking out of my mouth, according to him. Whatever these voices said, they freaked out Cody. And I heard it myself, apparently, because I woke up from it. My eyes shot open. I sat up terrified. I tried to tell Cody what happened, but I was crying so hard by then. Anything I said was pretty incoherent. When I finally calmed down, I explained to him that even though what we both heard come out of my mouth was utterly terrifying, the demon in my dream was worse, because it wanted our child. He was angry, and he said we needed to pray together, so we did. After that experience, I was nothing but paranoid throughout my entire pregnancy. I prayed all the time, and I was so worried that a demon was going to try and steal my baby or cause some type of miscarriage or something. It was awful. In the meantime, nothing else really happened until the night I went into labor. After numerous appointments and being told my due date was October 11th, it turned out he ended up coming later. My son was born on October 30th at 3am. I'm not joking, not by any means. He was healthy, however, and the delivery went well. Everything was intact, but his birthday was troubling to me and still is, especially after having that dream. Fast forward to the summer of 2021, my son is going to be four years old this year. When he was two, we left Pittsburgh and moved back to Ohio, and we stayed with my parents. We worked until the Rona hit. We both ended up losing our jobs and applied for temporary unemployment to get the money together for an apartment in the next town over for my parents. We're renting a pretty nice apartment now. We moved in September of 2020 and we've been there ever since. When we got here, my son started hearing things coming from my bedroom closet. He sleeps with us. He started talking about noise. He said he saw noise poking his head out from the closet at night, and he was really scary. Being that he's only currently three, he can only be so descriptive. He just said that he lives in mommy and daddy's closets, and has a weird head, and that he's scary. Mind you, considering his age, since he makes noises... My son calls him Noise, just for future reference. One night I was scrolling through YouTube. My son was on my lap. I stumbled across a video by Mr. Creeps with the thumbnail photo being a goat-like demon head. My son pointed at my phone and yelled to me, Look mommy, it's Noise! My heart sank straight to my stomach and I immediately started asking him questions. I made him reassure me if that's what noise looked like, and he said yeah, and proceeded to pry with questions like, does he talk to you? And if so, what does he say? My son just replied he only talks to him in his bad dreams, but he didn't know what he said. I found this utterly alarming to say the least. 
The next day, I called my uncle, who was a pastor of a church not too far away from us. I asked him to come over and bless our home after I came clean and told him the whole story that I just told you, leading up to my son seeing this entity. He said he would stop by, but he's also a truck driver on the side, so he'd only be able to do it on his next day off, which wouldn't be until eight or so days later. As I impatiently waited for his day off, life remained the same. My son didn't really mention noise much at all, and we were doing a lot of praying. One day about four or five days later, Cody, my son, and myself were upstairs in our spare bedroom that we turned into a video game lounge. We call it the Chill Cave. We were playing Left for Dead 2 on the mini couch, and our son had his Minecraft toys he was playing with on the floor. We were so focused on the game that we didn't realize our son had gotten up and left the room. I thought maybe he was going to go pee since we potty trained him early. But the next thing we knew, we heard a super loud tumble. My heart was racing so fast, I knew the moment it happened it was my worst fear. My son had fallen down the stairs. My husband and I didn't think twice. We ran out of the room and down the stairs, where my son sat at the bottom landing crying hysterically. We made sure he was okay, checking him out, and miraculously enough, literally, he wasn't hurt, other than a big bruise on his elbow and knee. He didn't hit his head, nor did he break a bone. Thank God. When we finally got him to calm down, and we put some ice on his elbow and knee, we set him down and asked him what happened. Wondering if he tripped on something or slipped on the rug. To my surprise and fear, he said, No. Noise was hiding in the bathroom. I tried to run away and hide from him, and he pushed me down the steps. I was so full of emotion, fear, anger, just plain dismay. I had officially had enough, so I did some research on how to properly bless your home without the sage, or going all out with objects of the church, religion, and relying on God alone, and that's what we did. We walked around our home, praying, and asking Jesus Christ to remove all wicked spirits from our home. We opened our front door and forced them to use it as an exit. We haven't had anything else happen since that day. If anything else does happen, I'll be sure to keep you updated. Until then, any advice or prayers would be greatly appreciated, so this demon doesn't return into our lives. Demons in the Haunted Ranch House From When Ghosts Come Out Four years ago, we lived in the most haunted house we'd ever lived in. I've told a lot of stories about this house already, but I didn't tell all the stories that happened in my old ranch house in Langston. It was a residential ranch-style house. The home was built in 1965, and it was built in a cul-de-sac neighborhood. Everything that happened here in this home was between when I was four years old to 12 years old, and at the time my blood sister was two years old to 10 years old. So yeah, we lived there for about eight years, and in that time, we experienced one of the most horrifying hauntings anyone could experience. The following happened in 2012. While the house was located in Langston, it was originally registered through a town called Stanton, because Langston doesn't have a town hall. My older cousin used to live there in that ranch house before we did, and before we moved in, there was a lot of wallpaper inside. The bathroom was this hot pink color as well. The outside of the house was painted yellow too. But when my cousin lived there, she mentioned that she had seen a black shadow on one occasion. She explained how a chair she had would begin to rock all by itself when she was alone. And on another occasion, she heard an old man coughing in the living room, but it was just her and the kids there. Since then, the home was redone inside. The wallpaper was ripped down and replaced with drywall. The outside of the house was repainted a gray color now. She burned that weird chair after it rocked by itself, and she's since moved out. I remember when we first moved in there, when we walked through the front door, we were met with the living room, which was a red maroon color. From there was the hallway and the kitchen, which both had popcorn walls. 
After the kitchen was the dining room, a yellow color. Then down the hall was a bathroom and a bedroom on one side, and two more bedrooms on the other side of the hall. One night, my blood sister had heard the toilet flush by itself one night when she went up to use the bathroom. The place was haunted for sure. My dad would often feel watched by someone or something in the garage. Plus, the basement door was right in front of the garage door. We used to have people living with us in the basement, but they moved out a short while later, and the basement was a completely empty room for a while. So it was vacant. There wasn't supposed to be anyone down there. However, we heard something coming from the basement one day. My blood sister and I were doing homework in the kitchen. Suddenly, we hear our computer turn on with the volume at max. Startled, we turned it down, wondering what was going on, when suddenly, we heard the loudest slam coming from the basement. It sounded like a massive bang, and it echoed through and shook the entire house. The two of us were freaking out. We ran to the garage where my dad was at the time, and we screamed at him. We wanted to know what was going on. He went down into the basement, and when he did, he didn't find anyone there. But he did find one of the cabinet doors jammed shut. He had to punch it back open. As previously mentioned, we used to have people living with us in the basement. Specifically, my grandma and grandpa. We had the upstairs, basically, and they had the downstairs. They lived with us for only about two years. They had an Xbox 360 that they would play. But when they moved there with us, they noticed that the Xbox would be turned on, despite having been powered off before. It would come on while they were in bed. My grandpa asked me years later if it was me doing it, but I don't remember doing anything like that, nor does my sister. Besides, we were always too scared to go into that basement. Every time I'd gone down into that basement, I felt as if I was being watched, and the feeling was so strong, all of this made me realize, never ignore your gut feeling. I believe it's there for a reason. And when I was in that basement, the feeling in my gut was so intense. I knew something was in there. Because of that, I was scared to go into the basement. My blood sister admitted to feeling the same too. At times when I was walking up the stairs, not walking down the stairs, but only going up, I would feel like someone or something was following me up the stairs. There would just be this strong energy behind me. But when I turned to look, I would be alone no one else on the stairs. This would usually make me run up the stairs as fast as I could to get away from something that I knew was there but couldn't see. My dad also recalled hearing noises in our basement, like things moving around after my grandparents moved out. He said he would do his best to ignore them, that whatever it was didn't do no harm, so he'd let it do its thing. I also remember seeing black shadow figures peeking in at me through my bedroom door. This was around when I was five or six years old. Sometimes these shadow figures would be as little as a kid looking up at me, and other times it would be almost taller than my door, like a grown man looking down at me. I would see it pop its head through the door in the corner of my eyes, but when I'd look over, it would dash back in behind the door or wall. Imagine someone sneaking and peeking their head into the room. You see them out of the corner of your eyes, but when you look to see, they quickly dart their head back in behind the wall. This would happen some nights, but not every night. Another time, when I was really young, I would often talk to the wall, and no one would be there. I would be talking to nothing, and I barely remember it. My dad and mom caught me doing it one night. My talking had woke them up, and they came to check on me. They watched me from the next room over, and eventually I just fell down and went back to sleep. Another time, my sister was walking down the hall. She looked into the bedroom and caught me again talking to the wall. I was just standing there this time, talking to nothing. She walked away. It's crazy that I don't remember this. I wonder who I was talking to. My sister's room was only separated by a wall, the same one I talked to, and it was the same wall we would hear knocking from. 
Dad thought it was just us playing around, but it wasn't. He even separated our beds as far as he could from that wall to keep us from knocking on it. But it still happened, because it wasn't us. One night when my sister woke up, she said she felt as if she was being watched. She looked out her window, and she saw this thing standing in the middle of the road. She described it as a really old man that was so extremely skinny, he was basically a skeleton. He was also very tall, with really old clothes. He had white, long, scraggly hair, and he had green, glowing eyes. He was just standing there, staring at her through the window from the middle of the road. She popped her head down, then popped it back up, and she still saw him there. But the next time she blinked, he was gone, and she never did see him again. She told our dad that morning, but dad thought it was her just being a kid, an overactive imagination and all that. Years later, a lot more had happened. One time, my dad heard someone walking down the hallway. He was up using the bathroom, and when he went back to bed, he suddenly heard footsteps going down the hallway. No one was there when he looked. He thought it was us, because they didn't sound too heavy. He said they sounded like little kids' footsteps going down the hall. He said honestly he was pretty spooked when he heard it, and he asked us that morning, but we weren't up at that time. One time when my dad was in the basement with one of his exes, they were down there taking pictures, and at one point they took one in the basement bathroom. Not too long after they took the picture, they logged in to view the photos, and in one of the photos in the basement bathroom, they saw this little girl in a white dress with long black hair, a child, just standing next to the sink, staring right into the camera. I remember this incident well. I remember it spooked everyone in the family at the time. One time, my dad heard the sound of a radio coming from my sister's room. It woke him up. We didn't have that sort of radio in the house, and none of the TVs were on, and everyone was in bed. The following morning, he told us about it, but no one else had heard it. One night, my sister felt tugging on her blanket, and it woke her up. When she looked down, nothing was there. She went back to sleep, and suddenly she felt someone or something pulling and tugging at the blanket again. My family searched her room for whoever or whatever was causing it, but they didn't find anything out of place. They assumed, or rather hoped, it was just a rat. Years later, after the basement was empty, my older stepsister needed to move into our basement for a while, as we didn't have any room upstairs. When she was sleeping in the basement, she suddenly heard what sounded like grinding. It was like a shovel scraping against concrete. It scared her pretty bad. And that morning in the basement, we searched for what it might have been, but once again... We didn't find anything strange down there. One day when my dad and his ex were talking on the phone in the kitchen, suddenly all the photos on the living room walls and shelves flew right from their positions. He said he had heard a crashing noise in the living room. He ran in there only to find all the photos on the floor. He had to pick them all back up. A lot happened over there at that house. One of the more frequent occurrences was that my sister's old room would always start to smell like alcohol out of nowhere, like someone had been drinking really heavily in that room. Keep in mind, my sister was only seven at the time. Not to mention my old pit bull would always growl at the corners of the walls over there. Just out of nowhere, my dog would just start growling at corners, like something was there that we could not see. Me, my dad, and my sister found old scraggly hair in her room one day, no one knows where it came from. It didn't look like my sister's, mine, nor my dad's, nor anyone that was in that house before then. There was also another strange happening going on. When my dad would get into relationships with girls while living in that house, things would get more awful. Like when my dad was dating a woman after my real mom left him, things got more active. We'd see and hear the spirits more and more. One time when my dad first met my stepmom, we brought her over to the house. Keep in mind, we never said a thing to them about ghosts or weird happenings over here. 
My youngest stepsister went walking down the hall into my sister's bedroom. When she saw that same old man that my sister saw standing in the road through the window, but he was standing in my sister's room this time. The same old man. Super skinny. Old clothes. Long scraggly hair. However, this time, his eyes were glowing red. He was staring at her through the doorway, standing in the middle of my sister's room. When my stepsister blinked, the man was gone. After that, we began to hear knocking on our bedroom windows at night. It seemed to be coming from outside, and it would wake us up in our beds. It seemed to always happen between 12 a.m. and 4 a.m. We would go to see outside in the middle of the night to see who it was, but every time, there was no one there. Apparently, my oldest aunt told us that my dad had heard knocking on his bedroom windows too. When I was seven or eight years old, I began to see these dark shadow people almost all night every night. I would be watching TV, or when I'd wake up and need to use the bathroom, I would see them in the corner of my eyes, always poking their heads out at me. Sometimes I would see it pass by my door as well. I began to sometimes see them standing in the doorway from the hallway in the dark. Just as before, sometimes it was a little kid, and sometimes it was a man. It became more and more frequent, and I started to dread walking out and using the bathroom because of it. On a different occasion, my dad and my stepmom were talking to each other one night in their bedroom. It must have been around 9.30. Out of nowhere, there were these four big bangs on our big living room window that faced out into our front yard. All the dogs began to claw and bark at that window, and when my dad and stepmom went to investigate, they didn't find anyone that could have done it. All of this together makes me think there are things really out there, things we can't explain. Since then, I wonder if anything new has happened in that home since we've moved. Better yet, we noticed that the house was up for sale last time we saw it. Over the years, I swear I noticed that the house would be bought and sold frequently, as if people were moving in, then quickly moving out. Thank you for listening to Unexplained Encounters. If you enjoy this show, think about supporting us there are several ways you can. Search for EerieCast on your favorite podcast app and follow our other scary shows, especially the other two I host, Tales from the Break Room and Camping Horrors. Leave Unexplained Encounters a rating on Spotify and a review on Apple Podcasts. The more we get, the higher we climb in the charts. Get some cool merch at EerieCast.store or unlock tons of cool extras like exclusive audiobooks and music tracks, add free access to all our shows, and a huge 20% discount on all our merch, all for less than three bucks a month by signing up for EerieCast Plus at EerieCast.com plus. Thank you. Until next time, send me your scariest stories of the unexplained at darkstories.org so I can narrate them in a future episode. And follow me on X, formerly Twitter, at Dark Prevails, for plenty of screams and memes. Stay safe out there, and stay creepy, because this world is a strange one.